What's up everyone, welcome back to a brand new series. A few months back I remade one of my older scenarios, which was about Goku finding Broly after the events of Namek. And since it seemed like you guys liked that, I went back to look at some other scenarios that needed updating, and there was an obvious one that came to mind. It's one of my oldest scenarios, and my most popular by far. But despite the popularity, it's, well, the quality doesn't match my current quality. I was just starting out when I made it, and it's a pretty old story, so the editing, narration, etc., all that could use improvement. That makes it the perfect candidate for a remake. Plus, just like with all the other remakes I've done, I'm going to be telling a different story here, even though the scenario will start out the same. Of course, I'm talking about what if Gohan and Goten were twins. We'll start out with the same concept, but the story is going to diverge pretty much immediately. Let's begin this new scenario, what if Gohan had a twin? Well, kind of a new scenario. Our story begins after the 23rd World Tournament. There's only one change we're going to be making right now, and this is going to affect everything going forward. Instead of Goku and Chi-Chi just having one kid, they end up with twins. Fraternal twins too, so they don't look exactly alike. One actually looks more like Goku, if anything. It was completely unexpected, but of course they're happy about this. The kid who was born first is named Gohan, and the one born second is named Goten, with Goten being the one that looks kind of similar to Goku. That's the only change we're going to be making here. Although, there is one more thing to note, we'll say that Goten was born with a tail. Given the point of the story that he was born in, it's still something that Saiyan kids would be born with. So he and Gohan both have tails. And immediately after, not much really happens. Just like in the normal story, Goku and Chi-Chi are off on their own, with more time spent raising their kids because now they have double the kids. It's not just Gohan, but nothing's really different about how they're raised or anything, just the fact that Gohan doesn't grow up as a single child. So, let's skip forward a few years. Goku gets word that there's going to be a reunion at Kame House. That should be pretty fun. He's going to take both Gohan and Goten along. Now that he thinks about it, he doesn't think any of his friends know that he had two kids. And Goku has noticed some strange things about them too. He's never seen them fight yet, but there's just been times where they've done things that are weird. Like at some points it seemed like they moved from one spot to another instantly. Or during times that they've cried, Goku felt almost what seemed like a power increase. He kind of brushed it off though. Nothing really too concerning. Goku arrives at Kame House, and, much to everyone's surprise, he's there with two kids, one in each arm. Even one kid would have been a surprise, but this is even weirder, with Bulma and Roshi even noting that Goten looks exactly like Goku did as a kid. Which also kind of terrifies them because they see he has a tail too, and Gohan does as well, remembering that Goku also turned into a giant monkey as a kid. They ask Goku about it, and it seems like, well, they've never transformed, and Goku doesn't know anything about it either, so maybe it's good to keep it that way. The reunion starts nice at first, but then an unexpected visitor arrives. That being Raditz, with them finding out who he is, and pretty much immediately, something catches Raditz's eye there. He sees another Kakarot, Goten, the spitting image of Kakarot and Bardock. But then next to him is also a kid that shares the resemblance to him too. Not with the same hairstyle, but that face is unmistakable. So Kakarot's had kids too. Interesting. Two hybrid Saiyans. And not just that, it seems like they're twins. Them being hybrids is surprising enough, but they've never seen Saiyan twins. From what Raditz remembers, twins are incredibly rare among Saiyans. Although he doesn't pay much mind to it at this point. He congratulates Kakarot on his two kids though. He's glad to meet his two nephews. But Raditz is going to take them for the time being. Maybe he can get all three of the Saiyans to join them. But for now they're just going to be a bargaining chip, just to get Kakarot to come along. As Raditz grabs onto both of them, flying off with his two nephews. Pretty much like normal, Piccolo does show up on the island too, and he and Goku team up to go find Raditz. The fight between Raditz, Piccolo, and Goku ensues. With Gohan and Goten locked inside of Raditz's spaceship. Not much about the fight itself is going to change. Goku's of course not going to be any stronger here. There's a shot that he's slightly weaker than normal because he's busier raising two kids, but not much else changes with this fight at first. Although a few minutes into the battle, there is one big change. Right at the point where Raditz convinces Goku to let go of his tail, he's about to counterattack Goku. But right before his attack hits Goku, something on his scouter catches his attention. His scouter picks up two huge powers nearby. It's those two kids! Gohan and Goten jump out of the spaceship. In a fit of rage, they both launch at Raditz simultaneously. Raditz tries to block the attack. Goten flies around Raditz, headbutting him from the back as Gohan attacks from the front. Raditz is left barely able to stand. All the wind is knocked out of him, and he took some significant damage from that too. He then swings both his arms out to the side, knocking both Gohan and Goten away. But this gives Goku an opportunity. He's still okay because he never got a hit by Raditz that first time. He runs up to him, grabbing onto his tail, holding Raditz still as Piccolo charges another attack. But Raditz knows what's coming. At the very last second, mustering up what little strength he has left, all while his tail is being held by Goku, he then tries to launch a blast point blank at Goku's face. Piccolo launches his own beam, and this attack disorients Goku for a bit too. But he's still using all his strength to hold onto Raditz's tail. But Raditz is also able to grab onto Goku, trying to swing them both around. And the attack hits, with Raditz barely being able to move Goku in front of him. It's a direct hit on Goku. And Raditz is about to laugh, but the attack goes right through his brother, then piercing through Raditz's side. From a combination of the damage he received from Gohan and Goten, as well as the attack hitting him and then the blood loss following it, Raditz immediately collapses to the ground, unconscious with Goku also falling to the ground, near death from this attack. Piccolo's the last one standing. He walks up to them to finish Raditz off. He sticks out a hand ready to kill him, but Raditz briefly wakes up, telling them this was a big mistake. The Saiyans are going to kill them next. And now they can't get any info out of him. 
Piccolo nearly launches the blast, but Goku tells him to wait. They need to learn more about the Saiyans. If Raditz actually does have some more info about them, that could be useful. He weakly laughs, saying that didn't go to plan, but tells Piccolo it's up to him, as well as Gohan and Goten. It seems like the Saiyans are coming regardless. Goku draws his last breath, then dying. Taking the brunt of the attack, with Raditz barely clinging onto life. Reluctantly, Piccolo stops charging the blast. Goku's right, they do need some more info, and then he'll dispose of the Saiyan. But this could help them prepare. But Raditz is unconscious, and it seems like he won't be waking up anytime soon. And out in space, Vegeta and Nappa have seen this whole thing. Intrigued at the power that those two kids showed off. Could it be because they're hybrid Saiyans? Could it be because they're both twins? Maybe it's a mix of both because they've never seen either before. Especially in tandem. What kind of power do these two kids hold? And it looks like Raditz might have died too, with Vegeta just laughing this off. He deserved it if he was killed by those weaklings. They're better off without him anyways. And they also hear about the Dragon Balls too. Because not too long after, the others arrive and Piccolo talks to them about the Dragon Balls. Saying they'll bring Goku back, but they have no idea when the Saiyans are going to come, or how strong they are. Raditz went unconscious pretty quickly, and maybe it's good that they kept him alive because if he killed Raditz right away, they'd be pretty much going into this blind. Piccolo tells the others he's going to take the two kids, and he's going to train them up to be stronger. They showed some good potential, and he's probably the only one who could be capable of this. And Krillin notes that it seems like Raditz is still alive, and Piccolo knows that. He'll take Raditz along with him too. It won't be too hard to kill him anyways. Piccolo just needs to keep him alive a little bit longer to get some info out of him. And when he gets what he needs, he'll eradicate Raditz. It looks like Piccolo's got a lot on his plate though because now he's training two kids and he has to babysit Raditz too. But it's not like the others can do anything anyways because Piccolo just flies off with them. Grabbing both the twins with one hand and then holding Raditz in the other. He'll report back to them soon enough and let them know what's going on. The first thing he does is throw the twins in the wilderness, then dragging Raditz away. He grants him a little bit of key trying to wake him back up. Just to learn more about these Saiyans. Gohan and Goten wake up in the wilderness with no idea of where they are. And Piccolo hears them crying which kind of annoys him. Raditz still hasn't woke up yet, so he goes over to Gohan and Goten and tells them what's going on. He asks if they remember that power that they used against Raditz, because he's going to unlock that again. With this training, they'll be the strongest warriors ever. He then tries to bring that power out once more, quickly grabbing onto Gohan, throwing him into a mountain. As Gohan flies through the air, he then has a huge burst of anger, launching a blast that completely flattens the mountain. But at the same time, Goten gets mad. Launching at Piccolo and attacking him, Piccolo's barely able to dodge. But just the power of Goten launching at him alone knocks his arm completely off, cutting clean through it. He looks behind him and sees Goten lying on the ground, looking over at Gohan who is in the middle of a flattened area. And Goten then calms down too, realizing that everything's okay. Both of them have the same power, much to Piccolo's surprise. Piccolo tells him what he plans to get out of this training, as he flies back off to Raditz, leaving them alone in the wilderness. But once he gets back to where Raditz was, he's not there. Although he couldn't have made it far. Piccolo may have woken him up and cauterized his wounds, but Raditz is still very weak right now. And if he doesn't get any medical attention soon, he's just gonna die regardless. A blast then comes at Piccolo from behind. He quickly turns around, opening his mouth and launching his own blast back at it. The blast barely had any power in it, and he knows it's from Raditz. He sees Raditz weakly standing there with a the hand out, collapsing to the ground barely able to hold himself upright. He honestly didn't think Raditz would wake up that soon. But he's got some questions for Raditz. Raditz then holds a hand over his scouter, covering the microphone. He tells Piccolo, destroy this thing on his face, and then he'll give him the info he wants. But destroy it with a blast, and make it look like he's attacking Raditz. He then uncovers the microphone, with Piccolo unsure of what to do. But Piccolo ends up doing it. It's not like this will have any downside for him. On the other end of the scouter, Vegeta and Nappa see that Raditz was alive briefly, but it seems like now he just got killed for real. What an idiot. He got a second chance and died anyways. But Piccolo asks why he did that, and he wants to get more info out of Raditz too. Raditz is clearly very angry, and he's going to choose his next words wisely. He tells Piccolo he'll give him all the info he needs. He knows Piccolo probably plans to kill him right after anyways, but then says how he wants this to go down. He'll give Piccolo the information, then Piccolo will heal him. That's funny, why would he do that? First of all, Raditz knows that his life is valuable right now because of the info he has, but also, he's turning on the Saiyans. Obviously, Piccolo doesn't believe this right away, especially because he tried to trick Goku before too. And Raditz explains, thanks to what Piccolo just did, he faked his own death. The Saiyans think he's actually dead now. And while he was unconscious most of the time, he heard the things Vegeta and Nappa were saying over the scouter. It sounded like they were better off without Raditz, and they wanted to get rid of him anyways. They didn't even care to bring him back to life if he were dead. And in that brief moment where Piccolo was gone and Raditz woke up again, Raditz got in contact with Vegeta and Nappa once more, and they just shrugged it off, telling Raditz that he's a pathetic loser for failing his mission. They're going to come and finish the job, but don't expect any help from them. Although, if he's able to kill that Namekian, then maybe they'll bring some extra parts to help repair his spaceship, because he's stranded on Earth right now. So Raditz made it look like he was going to fight Piccolo. Although now, to Vegeta and Nappa, it looks like he died against Piccolo. Raditz is furious at them. They don't even want to help him. They don't care about him. And here's what he plans to do. When they get here, he's going to help kill them. He doesn't want to stay on this wretched planet anyways. But he also knows he can't trust them or go back with them. He'll prove to those Saiyans that he's stronger than them. And, once they're dead, he'll take their space pod and leave this planet. Also telling Piccolo that he'll leave them alone for the time being. He'll even help against the Saiyans. 
Well, this is kind of good for Piccolo. He doesn't know if Raditz is trustworthy because he already tried to trick them once and he just betrayed both of his allies too. But the story does check out. And plus, Raditz already starts giving him some more info about the Saiyans, including the time frame for their arrival. You know what? Piccolo goes along with it. And after he gets all the info out of Raditz, he doesn't kill him. Piccolo turns away and then leaves, going to tell all the others what's happening. With Raditz yelling out at him, he's forgetting to heal him. Piccolo simply sticks a hand out, lending him a little bit of key. He's not gonna heal him. Raditz should be lucky that Piccolo's letting him live. They don't know if they could trust him yet. It would be stupid to heal him, especially after that trick he pulled before. Raditz is angered, but before he's about to have an outburst, he then laughs a little bit. Very well then. Very clever too. Raditz is left there to his own devices, with Piccolo going back to Kame House. The rest of the group hears the info about the Saiyans and when they're about to arrive on Earth. And Raditz gave them even more info. Not only do they know when the Saiyans are going to arrive, but they know what both of them are like. They know about their personalities, what their powers are like, some of their special moves, things to watch out for too. It seems like it'll be a tough fought battle because, especially that Vegeta guy, he seems really powerful, way beyond where they are right now. Piccolo even got a comparison of his own power level with everybody. The power levels mean nothing to him and they've lost the scouter anyway so they can't measure it anymore. But it seems like even at their peaks, their power still wasn't enough to even eclipse Nappa. It was still multiple times weaker. But those two kids, apparently their power level shot up really high. Raditz says they nearly killed him, especially with that combined attack. Their combined power together would have been more than enough to kill Raditz easily, if they knew how to wield it. And that's exactly why Piccolo's going to focus even more on training them. And he says that he's going to keep Raditz alive too. Much to the surprise of the others, especially because he's responsible for killing Goku after all. But Piccolo reminds them, Goku was the one that told him to leave Raditz alive in the first place. It seems like Goku trusted Piccolo's judgment, so they're going to have to trust him on this too. Besides, if he acts out of line, he won't be too hard to defeat. Piccolo's letting him heal up naturally, which is going to take a while, meaning he's vulnerable. And by the time he's even able to fight back again, Piccolo would have probably surpassed him. Although little does Piccolo know, Raditz is going to get a Zenkai once he's fully healed. But Piccolo doesn't see Raditz as a threat anymore. Over the next few months, he keeps training the two other kids, being hands-off at first, but they're able to succeed really well in the wilderness. In the original story, it's obviously just Gohan alone out there. But with both of them together, they're able to thrive. There is an issue at one point though where both of them go grade 8, but thankfully Piccolo is able to blow up the moon before that becomes an issue. Raditz doesn't even notice this at first because this is right after that fight. But he takes notice eventually because he heard that this planet did have a moon and he never sees it at night. He wonders what happened but doesn't question it. Although he wonders what those kids are up to. By now Piccolo's training with Gohan and Goten is a lot more hands-on. They're growing quickly because they're out there in the wilderness together, training with each other, and now training together with Piccolo. Even though it was scary being out in the wilderness, they had each other to survive. And at one point, Piccolo even does try to separate them to see how they do, and they're still okay, making it back to each other and being fine. The two of them having each other really helps their strength grow. And now we're about nine months into the training, and this is where Raditz finally seeks out Piccolo. At one point, Raditz does find Piccolo again. He hasn't seen Raditz in a while and hasn't felt his power rise either. Raditz was able to keep a surprisingly low profile, which worried Piccolo, but Kami said that he'd alert Piccolo if Raditz was doing anything. And clearly he has been doing stuff, but not much with fighting. Piccolo hears a vehicle approaching, as a motorcycle then pulls up to where he is. He doesn't recognize the man on it at first, but once he steps off, Piccolo can immediately tell by his face, his hair, and the scar on his torso. It's Raditz, in a completely different getup. How did he even find them? Piccolo didn't think that Raditz would be able to find them out here, and he didn't really want Raditz finding them. But Raditz has that little thing they could do where they could sense powers. Yeah, he could do that now. He even opens a jacket showing the giant scar that he got. Healing from this really gave him a nice boost in power too, although he hasn't been fighting much recently. Unless you count bar fights, because that's really his only activity. Going to bars and driving motorcycles. Yep. Biker Raditz is back in the scenario. He said he wants to see his two nephews and how they're growing. They'll be really helpful in killing the other two Saiyans. He tells Piccolo he wants to lend a hand training them too. And Piccolo is surprised that Raditz is more motivated. He knew that he wanted to help kill the Saiyans, but now he's proactively joining them too. And Raditz says these last few months alone have left him thinking. He still does want to get off this planet and kill the other two Saiyans, but he was foolish to think that he could do it alone. He got defeated by these guys alone, so why would he be able to defeat the Saiyans? He needs to take a more hands-on approach. And also on top of that, he wants to be an instigator. This will really get to the Saiyans if he trains up the people that are going to kill them. He's not too sure about his own ability, especially because his wound didn't even really heal that properly, but he thinks he's back in fighting shape. And besides, what better way for those two kids to access their own rage boost by fighting their uncle, the same one who tried to kill them before. Gohan and Goten are visibly nervous about this, but again, they have each other, which calms them down. They made it through Piccolo's training, and now they're going to make it through Raditz's training. Piccolo can't believe it's gotten to this, but Raditz still hasn't done anything bad, so maybe he actually is serious about joining them. This can't be a ruse because he's really playing the long game if it is. He would have definitely done something by now if he wasn't serious. Now is the final leg of their training, with Goku in Otherworld, training with King Kai, hearing about all this too. He's still pretty pissed off at Raditz, but glad to see that he's on their side now, hoping that Gohan and Goten will be okay too. Now with their uncle training them, Gohan and Goten have a much different experience. In all honesty, Raditz isn't really the best at what he does, but he's a great person to be there because first of all, he has knowledge about the Saiyans that they wouldn't know, which could really help them in their training, and there's also the fact that he's a pretty good source for rage boosts. 
With a simple threat, he's able to send them in a fit of rage again, and Piccolo knows it's a ruse, but it's working. Since Gohan and Goten usually buy it, allowing them to tap into that rage. At some point, they realize that Raditz is just bluffing, so it loses effectiveness pretty quickly, but the fact that he was able to do it in the first place really did help, because now they have a better idea of what it's like to tap into that rage. Raditz also notices that their tails are both gone. That's weird, he knows they had tails before, and Piccolo says he had to remove them. He also had to blow up the moon. Oh, that explains what happened to that. But Piccolo should know that Saiyan tails sometimes do grow back. He has no clue why Kakarot's didn't, but at least with these two kids, they're probably going to grow back eventually. At some point, they will have to try and learn how to use that form. Becoming a great ape is pretty powerful, after all. And even though he's helping them train, of course, it's kind of hard to trust Raditz. Like, just consider who he is and the fact that Piccolo's there, too. It's not really an easy process, but Raditz lets them know pretty bluntly that he doesn't care if they trust him or not. After all, he just cares about getting back at those two other Saiyans. And you know what? Maybe after he kills those two Saiyans, Frieza could be next. Those ambitions are kind of lofty, but hey, shoot for the stars. He already feels like he's grown personally, but more notable is the growth between Gohan and Goten. Piccolo is a great teacher for them. That's how they learn their skill and how to control Ki. Raditz is good for tapping into their Saiyan side. And as mentioned in the last part, there's also the fact that they have each other. It's pretty clear that having a training partner in Dragon Ball really helps, and these two are obviously perfect for being training partners. Gohan seems to be a bit more timid, but with more explosive bursts of rage when that happens. Goten's a little bit more easygoing, sort of similar to his father, but while the two have their own differences in personality, they're still very similar. They are twins after all. They work perfectly as training partners and rivals. Also, at some point, Piccolo gives Raditz a fraction of a Senzu bean. His wounds have mostly healed, but it's clear that he's being held back in training a little bit because of his injuries. It's kind of hard for those to heal properly on their own. And now, he's fully back to normal. The scar is still there, but he doesn't mind. It looks kind of cool, too. All he's concerned about now is that his wound doesn't bother him anymore and he could fight at full capacity. He also does eventually learn that Kakarot's going to come back, too. Which does interest him. Maybe this time you'll kill him. And Piccolo thinks he's serious, but Raditz says he's joking. Or is he? Piccolo says it wouldn't be too hard to reopen that wound. So if Raditz does cause issues, he'll keep that in mind. Especially now with Gohan and Goten as strong as they are, Raditz kind of did screw himself. At least if he does want to turn against them. Finally, a year passes. The group all meets up, ready to encounter the Saiyans. They're surprised to see Gohan and Goten are so much more proactive now. It seems that training really did help. And they're not too scared to use their power. They know how to get a control in it. They know how to tap into that rage better thanks to Raditz and Piccolo. But they're even more surprised to see that Raditz is there. Kami did let them know that Piccolo wasn't going to kill him, but it's just weird for him to be there. Now, if they need to beat him a second time, they're not concerned. And it doesn't seem likely that he'll just rejoin the Saiyans because he did fake his death after all. Also, he gave them all the info he could about Vegeta and Nappa. It's a little too late for him to turn back. Although he just tells everyone he's going to watch from nearby anyways, not getting immediately involved. He wants to savor the surprise. Piccolo, Gohan, Goten, Ten Shinhan, Chaozu, Yamcha, and Krillin all stand against the Saiyans. As Vegeta and Nappa arrive on the battlefield. The humans are all at the same power level that they were in the main story, but let's cover what happened with everybody else. Raditz is at a power of 6,000, which is a huge increase from before. A lot of that is thanks to that Zenkai, but he also did do some training with Piccolo, and there was some with Gohan and Goten. Although there wasn't really much training, but that did affect Piccolo too, who's now at a power level of 4,500, which isn't too huge of an increase, but still a notable increase. As for Gohan and Goten, they're stronger than all the humans by now. Their powers hover around 2,000, but when they use their full power, such as launching a blast or having a rage boost, it can go much higher. But it's very unstable, and Piccolo's not too sure where their limits lie. Either way, though, they all feel prepared for the battle ahead. Pretty much immediately, Nappa notices that someone's watching not too far away. And he isn't recognizable at first, especially without the Saiyan armor, but they could tell by the hair. And as Nappa gets a closer look, he sees that it's Raditz. He's alive? They thought he died! They wonder why he's just watching nearby, too. Vegeta laughs at it, thinking that Raditz is just waiting for them to save him, and he's not going to get involved in this battle because he already knew he screwed up once. But Vegeta yells out at Raditz, taunting him. They have no use for him joining this fight, but they hope he at least enjoys the show. Vegeta and Nappa even joke about it, saying that Raditz is probably not going to get off this planet because they didn't bring a repair kit for the ship. They give a very sarcastic apology, but Raditz just laughs it off too, going along with the ruse. No, don't worry. He's really just here to watch them lose. Out of curiosity, Nappa pulls out his scouter and sees that Raditz is at the same power level that they usually know actually a little bit higher by only a couple hundred points. Even after those injuries, he didn't come back stronger like a Saiyan should. How pathetic. They really don't need his help. And as they scan the rest of the group, they see that their powers are pretty low too, but they don't realize that everyone's powers are suppressed right now. The Cybermen are deployed at first, and no one actually dies this time. Since two of them go for Gohan and Goten, and they're able to fight back perfectly fine. They also do outnumber the Cybermen, so thankfully for Yamcha, he makes that out okay. Nappa's up next, and he's ready to fight Piccolo. Raditz is interested to see how this will go. He feels like this fight could go either way, even if Nappa is able to somehow pull out even more power, he believes Piccolo has the edge at least in terms of strategy, if not in strength as well. Nappa's stated power level is about 4k, but judging by his fights against Piccolo and Goku, it seems like he can go a little bit higher than that, so Raditz isn't too sure where his true power lies. 
and this fight actually is really close. At first, Piccolo has an advantage in power and in pretty much everything else. But Nappa's anchor does bring out a little bit more of his power, although Piccolo is able to make up for the gap in strength. Raditz told him everything he needs to know about Nappa, and even without seeing him fight, Piccolo is able to ask the right questions to figure out how he does fight, being able to easily predict his movements and such, as well as already having a strategy to fight him too. And amidst the fight, it seems like it can go either way, at least until someone else comes in. Nappa's already taken a bit of damage from Piccolo, and then he receives a sneak attack from someone else. Raditz joins the fight, saying he'll take pleasure in killing Nappa himself. With his newfound power, it should be more than enough. He has to thank those two kids after all, as well as Kakarot and that Namekian. Without fighting them, he wouldn't have gotten to this level. Nappa, of course, is infuriated, especially at the fact that Raditz is betraying him. Piccolo even recommends that they fight together and they can make this really easy, but Raditz says he'll do this alone. So that leaves Vegeta to himself. He would just step in and kill Raditz right now, but actually, he's curious. How strong did Raditz grow, and will Nappa be enough to beat him? If not, then in his eyes, Nappa's probably just as pathetic as Raditz. But he turns to the rest of the group. In the meantime, he could at least fight them. They are still waiting for Kakarot, and he does want to entertain himself. And those two hybrid Saiyan kids, they show some great promise. He saw how they fought against the Cybermen, and while the two know how to control their power, there was a brief point where it did fully flare up. He saw in his scatter that their power went above 2000 at one point. Which is incredible. That means at their current level, they're stronger than Raditz was not too long ago. They're stronger than a lot of Saiyans actually, and they're only kids. Kids of a low class warrior no less. Maybe it's because hybrid Saiyans have great potential. Maybe it's the fact that they're twins. Maybe both. But either way, Vegeta sees an opportunity. Telling those two that he wants to see what they're made of, because he's going to bring them along with him next. Especially because at this pace, he's probably going to have to get rid of those other two losers. Raditz and Nappa. But Gohan and Goten aren't deterred. They look at each other and just nod. Of course, they are incredibly nervous. But they've already made it through a lot together and they know they're going to face more in the future. By now, the two have come to accept. They're at their best when they're fighting alongside each other. And as long as they're not separated, they're unstoppable. Piccolo stands behind them assuming a battle stance, with Krillin, Ten, Yamcha, and Shoutsu all joining as well. Ten notes how crazy their growth is. Piccolo really did a good job. He sees them emulating Goku. Goten being the spitting image of Goku really helps too. But just their demeanor and everything, it reminds him of that Goku he fought long ago. The same Goku that he still admires today. And Piccolo tells the twins, they just need to hold out for a little bit. Goku's going to be here soon. He's running late, but if they buy some time, they'll be alright. And he tells them to remember their training. Harness that rage against Vegeta. Consider what he's saying. He thinks all of them are worthless. He wants to destroy this planet and everyone on it. And he's going to take them away from their family. He wants them to use that idea to fuel their rage. The fight begins, and they keep this in mind. They're able to fight pretty well, but they are trying to tap into that rage again. The group collectively is holding their own pretty well against Vegeta. And Raditz is about to defeat Nappa too. Once he joins in, they should be able to hold off Vegeta for even longer. And then when Goku arrives, they're saved. They're confident. No matter how strong this Vegeta guy is, they'll win. And the two try tapping into that same anger that they felt before. And remember, the two of them do have different personalities. They both do have access to rage boost, but they manifest it in different ways. Their personalities are actually pretty similar to what they are in the original story anyways. As for Gohan, it's a little bit easier for him to tap into that rage because, well, he's more prone to it. For Goten, it's a little tougher, but he has the same exact amount of power locked away. With Goten's easygoing nature, he was able to motivate Gohan during their training beforehand, trying to quell that nervousness he felt, and now the shoe's on the other foot. Gohan trying to prompt Goten to unlock his rage, helping his brother in the same way. And at a brief moment in battle, they are able to unlock that rage. Vegeta's scatter suddenly explodes. For a moment, he sees it shoot beyond the five-digit rage. And that was just by looking at one of them. The two each land a simultaneous attack, dealing a significant amount of damage to Vegeta. And they keep trying to hold on to that anger. It is fleeting, but they're able to use it to deal some more damage. And this is also a perfect distraction for Nappa, who notices it during his fight. Or rather, it's a perfect distraction for Raditz. Nappa's the one distracted by it, and Raditz is the one who exploits that distraction, using it to land the killing blow on Nappa. Taking pride in the fact that he surpassed one of them, and he's about to surpass the other. And Vegeta's completely infuriated. He's being beaten by kids. That fool Nappa just lost to Raditz, the same person who betrayed him. Anger doesn't even begin to describe what Vegeta's feeling right now. And to make things worse, Raditz then knows that he senses a power nearby. He doesn't know who it is, because he only learned to sense power very recently, but he has a good guess of who it should be. And the rest of them instantly recognize it, with Raditz yelling out that Kakarot's returned. And Vegeta kind of panics hearing this, thinking that he might lose here. Quickly, he swipes his arm in front of him, trying to create an attack that distracts them all. But before he can launch it, someone grabs onto his arm. There's a bright flash of red light in front of him. And he hears someone yell, Kaioken. Within an instant, Goku appears in front of him, telling Vegeta to leave his friends and kids alone. Goku thanks Piccolo for what he's done. He sensed the fight from far away, and could tell that Gohan and Goten have grown a lot. He really did a great job. He's also surprised to see Raditz there too, looking a lot different from before. He knew that Raditz was still alive, and this isn't a surprise to him, but still, when they wanted to leave Raditz alive before, he didn't expect that Piccolo would actually keep him alive this long. As Raditz floats over, Goku reminds him that he is still mad for what he did, but he's glad that Raditz is on their side now. Besides, regardless if Raditz lived or not, the Saiyan still would have probably come anyways. But again, he's glad that Raditz is trying to make it up to him, 
Radis chuckles, though. This isn't for his brother or for his nephews. He just wants to kill those Saiyans. But he does congratulate Kakra on nearly killing him, wondering how strong his brother is now. Maybe the two of them need a rematch. Goku smirks. He's up for that. First, they should focus on this matter at hand. Krillin's really surprised to see how casual Goku is. Well, that is the same Goku he knows, but still, he remembers very well what Raditz did to all of them. The other humans feel the same way too. But hey, if Goku's being easygoing about it, maybe they don't have too much to worry about. Raditz might not be a permanent resident here anyways, although he did note that he does like this planet now. He's really interested to see what those two hybrid Saiyans are capable of. They are his flesh and blood after all, to an extent at least. And Vegeta asked them if the family reunion's done yet, with Goku saying he's about ready for the fight, telling Gohan and Goten that they did a good job fighting as well. Glad that they've grown this strong. Now they could all fight together. He didn't realize that they could learn that quickly either. Piccolo and Raditz strangely were great influences on them, at least in regards to their teachings. Goku assumes a battle stance. It's not one that Gohan and Goten know, but they emulate it anyways. They're more familiar with Piccolo's fighting style, but they try and emulate their father. Goku looks at them and nods, telling them to try and keep up. Goku launches in with Gohan and Goten not far behind, with the two trying to tap into that same rage from before. Of course, Goku does like the idea of fighting alone, but this is also a first for him too, fighting alongside Gohan and Goten. He loves this, and even though he usually prefers 1v1s, this is a rare exception. This is awesome. He might not even need to use Kaioken right here. The rest of the group provides support too, with Raditz watching proudly on the sidelines, taunting Vegeta along the way. But he does remind Piccolo about one thing. Vegeta's probably gonna get desperate soon, so they need a plan B, and Raditz is exactly right. At some point, Vegeta realizes he's about to lose and tries to make a fake moon. But they obviously know about this because Raditz told them about the fake moon before, and he just brought up the tail to Piccolo too. But right as Vegeta's about to launch this, Raditz then grabs onto Vegeta's tail, with Piccolo then quickly jumping in, slicing it clean off. In a fit of rage, Vegeta quickly swings around trying to attack them, but then feels two powerful kicks in his back as Gohan and Goten launch it. With Goku then dropping from above, slamming Vegeta into the ground, Vegeta then launches high up in the air, trying to charge a Gallic gun. This is his last resort. He'll blow up this planet and kill everyone on it. He launches the beam downwards, with Goku quickly countering with his own Kamehameha, as Gohan and Goten join in alongside him. Goku powers up in the Kaioken and tells Gohan and Goten, they're about to win here, and they just need a little bit more power. The two try their best and summon a little bit of extra strength, overpowering Vegeta's beam, defeating him as he falls down to the surface. And Goku then realizes, weren't there supposed to be two Saiyans that were arriving here? Why is Vegeta the only one? No one else says anything, but Raditz just laughs, telling his younger brother to not worry about it. Raditz also made sure there were no remains of Nappa either, completely decimating his corpse too just as one last FU. And now, he's going to do the same to Vegeta, even taunting him while he's about to do it. He charges a blast at his hand as he walks up towards him. How the mighty have fallen. Look at the prince, defeated by a family of low-class warriors, two of which being kids. It's pathetic, isn't it? Maybe Vegeta wants to die too. Especially after being embarrassed like that, Raditz might be doing him a favor. But Goku stops Raditz. They should let him go. And if anything, he knows that Raditz just wants to shatter his pride. Besides, Goku wanted to let him go for the same exact reasons as normal. Shouldn't Raditz want to let him go too? Wouldn't that be a bigger blow to his pride? Everyone else can't believe what Goku's saying either, but... They all go along with it, and he's eventually able to convince Raditz, with Raditz a little bit angered about this. He tells his brother that he's making a big mistake. And as he watches Vegeta crawl away, he tells him, next time he sees his face, he's dead. Holding himself back from killing Vegeta, but laughing. How pathetic. He needed Kakarot to let him escape. Maybe Kakarot is right. That should be a bigger blow to his pride. They watch as Vegeta flies off, and Raditz considers what to do next. He'll just find Nappa's pod and steal that, leaving this planet and going, well, wherever. He's not too sure where, but he'll go somewhere. It was fun while it lasted, and maybe he'll return someday. But Goku says that he should stay too. Besides, they need that rematch after all. And he could tell Raditz is still not the greatest guy, but maybe it's better to keep him at arm's length if anything. It seems the same goes for Piccolo too, who's definitely softened up a bit. And then Goku turns to his two sons. Do they know why Raditz is dressed like a biker? Gohan and Goten just shrug. They don't know either. Huh, weird. Goku did miss out on a lot after all. Following the events of the Saiyan Saga, we go off into space for a bit. Vegeta returns to base to heal up. And while he's in the healing pod, he's thinking to himself. He wants those Dragon Balls. Those same things that were able to bring Kakarot back. He doesn't know what he'll use them for exactly just yet, but they're definitely valuable. Having the power to wish for anything that he wants, that could be amazing. That would be his ticket to defeating Frieza. And not just that, getting revenge on Raditz too. Those Saiyans on Earth, they annoy him to no end. He'll beat Kakarot and Raditz, putting them back in their place. As for those two hybrid Saiyans, he's not too sure. But he definitely won't forget about them either. But once Vegeta's fully healed, he realizes that Frieza's army is moving on some other place. Just like normal, Frieza did learn of the Dragon Balls too, so he's going to Namek now. Pretty much unopposed as well. And with haste, Vegeta gets a spaceship and goes right for Namek. This is obviously a very bad situation for Namek. Without Goku's group there to help protect them, well, they don't really have much that they can do. A lot of the villagers are wiped out. Some of the Namekians try to depart the planet too. 
And thankfully, some are able to escape covertly. They had to escape before during that great storm many years ago. And some of these Namekians, mainly the ones who can't fight, they know that they have to leave in order for Namek to survive. But not many make it off the planet. A lot of them die on the planet. Or, in an effort to fight off Frieza's army, some of them even fuse. Of course, Vegeta gets there, and he gets into some trouble too, barely surviving. He ends up killing Kui, and he actually ends up getting stopped by Zarban and Dodoria too. Thankfully, Vegeta hasn't done too much that Frieza knows about. So, there's no basis to kill him, just the fact that he's here and he killed Kui. But they've been known to hate each other for a while, so that kind of makes sense. But Zarban easily defeats Vegeta, gravely injuring him, but keeping him alive because Frieza knows that Vegeta might have some info on the Dragon Balls. As a last resort, many of the warrior Namekians fuse together, using Nail as a host. Their combined power is actually enough to ward off a lot of Frieza's army. But once they get to the stronger ranks, Frieza himself has to step in. If only Nail had more warriors fused into him, he would have been able to defend the planet. But Frieza's army killed so many of them by now that this is all they can muster. Frieza is impressed at this Namekian's power. 300k? That is pretty great, especially for a Namekian. Although, that doesn't even come close to the full power of his first form, which is only one of four forms. Frieza hates to have to get his hands dirty, but he kills Nail on his own. Knowing that all his soldiers will be killed if he doesn't, and without those soldiers, it's going to be a lot harder to find the Dragon Balls across the planet. But thankfully, this does slow down Frieza's army a bit. They do gather all the Dragon Balls together, but then they realize that they don't have a password for the Dragon Balls. They don't know how to speak Namekian. Most of the Namekians in their way were slaughtered. Any survivors escaped the planet or just hid away. The only Namekian that they know of that's left is Guru. So some of the soldiers are sent out to get him. But by the time they get to Guru, he's dead. From all the stress that this has caused, this accelerated his death. Not only does Frieza not have the password for the Dragon Balls, but now they're dormant. They can't even be used. Namek did suffer a terrible blow, but thankfully Frieza didn't get his immortality. And thankfully for Vegeta, he ended up barely scraping by. Especially because Frieza wants more info about the Dragon Balls. He doesn't know who else will be able to tell him about them. It seems like all the Namekians are dead, and Vegeta seems to be his last shot at getting some more information. But he's healing right now, so Frieza has to wait for a bit. King Kai is watching the entire time too, saddened that Namek is completely barren now. At least some of the members of the race are still out there, and maybe they can even find a new guardian. But they're going to have to wait a while to rebuild, especially if they want to go back to that planet in general. They may need a completely new home, but at least Namekians have experience with this. The remaining Namekian survivors split up, with some sticking together, but mostly it's just small groups or individuals. Vegeta eventually does wake up again, having grown stronger from being attacked by Zarban and Dodoria. And Frieza immediately interrogates him. Do more Dragon Balls exist on that planet Vegeta was on? That's where they found out about them from anyways, so there should be something there. But Vegeta quickly comes up with a lie. Not to protect that planet, but to protect the Dragon Balls for himself because he knows that planet is the last resort for him. Frieza even says that he'll forgive him for killing Kui, knowing that the two have always hated each other. And he knows Vegeta only fought Zarban and Dodoria because they were sent to stop Vegeta anyways. But again, Frieza will forgive all of that if Vegeta just gives him the info on that planet. At some point in the battle, his scouter was destroyed. And Frieza wants to fill in the gaps. Why are Raditz and Nappa not there? What ended up happening on Earth anyways? Vegeta simply says that after his scouter was destroyed, that traitor Raditz ended up killing Nappa. Vegeta took it upon himself to eliminate Raditz as well, also lying and saying he wasn't sure why Raditz went to that planet in the first place. And unfortunately for him, it seemed that idiot killed the Namekian that made the Dragon Balls there. Raditz went on a killing spree and Vegeta was the one who stopped it. All the strong warriors on that planet were killed, and there's no Namekian there either, meaning no Dragon Balls. Frieza buys this because that adds up. He knows Raditz disappeared a while ago, and them dying like that would make sense. He doesn't think that Vegeta would kill two of the last remaining Saiyans, and if he knew about the Dragon Balls too, he wouldn't have been responsible for killing that Namekian either. Frieza's gonna keep the planet in mind just in case, but this story does add up. And as for the others on Earth besides the Namekian, Raditz, and Nappa, they're unimportant. It seems they all died anyways. And Vegeta's glad this went well. He has to plan on his next move though. Frieza's probably suspicious enough of him, and he's interested in finding those hybrid Saiyans again. Maybe they could be Super Saiyans, which could be good because he could use them against Frieza, although it's unlikely they'll join him. They also could be a threat to Vegeta, which is another reason why he might be able to just kill them right away. And besides, at their current level, Frieza's still too much. Let's actually go over to Earth now. Immediately after the battle with Vegeta, Goku decides that Gohan and Goten need some more proper training. Piccolo and Raditz did teach them some good things. With Raditz, they learn a little bit more about their Saiyan side, and as for Piccolo, he's an actual martial artist, so they did learn some good things from him. But Goku wants better training for them. He knows that Roshi and Kami might be able to really help out here, and Roshi's glad to take the two students. Although he's not sure how much they'll learn from him. He's never had to teach students this powerful before. But at least from the martial arts side, there's a lot they could learn from Roshi. The two join the turtle school and eventually do go to Kami as well. And Goku makes sure they actually climb up the tower. He knows they could fly by now, but he wants them to do it the old fashioned way. Although that's not really an issue for them. And it's not even the first time they've been at Kami's lookout. Well, it looks like all the training Goku got as a kid isn't gonna work for them. In terms of power, they've done all they could on Earth. But in terms of technique, Kami still has a lot that he could teach. So they train directly under him. And they do way better than Goku did as a kid. Obviously they would. But Kami notes something interesting that Goku might wanna take note of. They have their tails again. 
It seems during the battle with the Saiyans, they grew back and no one even acknowledged it. Thankfully, Vegeta never made the artificial moon because the two would have transformed and been unstable. Yeah, that never actually occurred to him that they're back. Goku knows now about the Great Apes and the fact that he was the one responsible for killing Grandpa Gohan, so he's not too sure how to feel about this. It didn't even occur to him that the Tails grew back. I mean, he was used to seeing the Tails all the time in the first place. Actually, he didn't even realize they were removed in general. And he knows that Kami ended up removing his tail a while ago, but as for these two kids, maybe they have a chance at actually learning to use that power. Besides, having a tail in battle is great because it's an extra appendage to use. They basically have three arms, and you know what? They could learn the four witches technique, and then they'll have five arms. Of course, he's just joking around with Kami because that would probably freak Chi-Chi out and she wouldn't like that. But at the very least for their tails, yeah, they can keep them. He just has to ask Raditz about it, and Raditz tells his brother to relax. He's actually glad their tails grew back. One of the big reasons he stayed on this planet is because he wanted to see how his nephews grew as warriors. They're such a rarity among Saiyans. They're twins. They're hybrid Saiyans. Both of those things combined together, too. It clearly is influencing their potential somehow. And Raditz says he'll take it upon themselves to teach them a great ape. Goku and that Namekian god, whoever he is, sure, they could teach Gohan and Goten some martial arts trickery or whatever. But Raditz wants them to be true Saiyan warriors. He wants to teach them how to use the great ape form. And you know, Goku doesn't agree with that, obviously, but hey, he wants them to learn that form at least, so they go along with it. Goku actually did want to bring the two kids to King Kai, but Chi-Chi didn't let him, which is especially reasonable because it's been a year since she last saw them, as well as Goku too. She wants them to stay here, but they compromise. She will let the kids train as long as they keep up with their studying, but they can't leave Earth and they can't be fully focused on training. And she wants Goku present the entire time. She doesn't want Piccolo or their creepy uncle to kidnap them again. She's honestly not sure why he left Raditz alive in the first place, but Goku assures her that they'll both soften up. He hopes at least. Besides, Raditz is too busy going on bar crawls anyways, and Piccolo's usually off on his own. Gohan and Goten eventually do learn how to control their great ape form, which will be huge in battle, both literally and figuratively. And a few months pass during this training. Goku, Raditz, and even Piccolo want to test the limit of their powers. Especially since Vegeta is still alive, they know he could probably attack again. The five of them all need to grow as strong as they can, especially those two kids who show the greatest potential of all. As for Raditz, he also wants to surpass his brother. They've had their rematch already, but Goku won without even using Kaioken, and Raditz wants to find his own way to win. Not just that, but he tells Kakarot, next time he sees Vegeta, no matter what his brother says, he's gonna kill him. Goku actually hopes he doesn't, but knowing that Raditz is pretty stubborn, he could tell his older brother is serious. Raditz is gonna also try to exploit Zenkai's with intense training, which does help for a bit, but in terms of getting power, there's more than just getting raw strength. Goku says he's too stuck training just his body. They need to train their minds as well. Maybe the two could really help each other. You know, besides the fact of them being brothers. Goku's a master martial artist, while Raditz, He's a soldier with knowledge on Saiyan warriors. The two have different areas of expertise that they can each teach each other on. Goku can learn more about how to power up as a Saiyan, or Raditz can get some martial arts experience to get better techniques. As for Gohan and Goten, it's clear that the two are actually great fighters by now. They have training from multiple different people. Piccolo and Raditz taught them a good amount of stuff, but now they have training from Goku, Roshi, Korn, and Kami. All great teachers who could teach unique things. They know how to harness their powers pretty well too. Raditz suspects that they will be the Super Saiyans that Vegeta and Nappa theorized about. Although, he still has no clue what a Super Saiyan really is. But if there is a Super Saiyan, those two are probably going to be that. Is the Super Saiyan a person? A type of power? A state of being? A transformation? He doesn't know. But his nephews will become Super Saiyans, and then he'll follow. And the idea does intrigue Goku too. What is a Super Saiyan, and how could he become one? Everyone on Earth has their own motivations going forward. But we go back out into space for a bit. After this time skip of a few months, let's see what's been happening with Vegeta. He spent this time growing more powerful, being sent on more missions, but not really for good reasons. Frieza continues to use Vegeta more and more as a soldier, giving him less freedom and scrutinizing everything he does. It's to the point where he's trying to instill fear and paranoia into Vegeta. He's always being watched. Frieza wants to make sure he's compliant, wants to make sure Vegeta knows his place. He could see that Vegeta wants to betray him. He knows that's going to happen someday. So he's going to break Vegeta physically and mentally, hoping he dies on one of his missions, or just goes insane from the paranoia and fear that he's feeling. And Frieza loves this. Vegeta is the last Saiyan out there. And look how pathetic the Saiyans are now. Just one. Just the prince. The prince of no one. He is growing stronger, but he's not going to be a threat. Especially because one day, Frieza decides that he's had his fun. He wants Vegeta gone for good, especially because he could grow stronger, and that could actually be an issue. So he's sent on a mission, one with Zarbon and Adoria, who have also grown a bit stronger too. And Vegeta is powerful, but not powerful enough to fight both of them at once, especially with their growth too. They have been training. They are Frieza's top soldiers after all, so they have to be as strong as they can. And it seems like a very normal mission at first. It's actually not that tough. The mission's complete relatively easily, and it's time to head back to base. Zarbon and Adoria turn their scouters off. With Zarbon then swiping a hand in front of Vegeta's face, grabbing his scouter and crushing it. So, the time has finally come. Vegeta knew this would happen eventually, but didn't expect it to be today. He hopes they don't expect this to be easy. Frieza's a fool for just sending the two of them out here. If they really wanted Vegeta dead, he should have done more. 
but Zarbon tells Vegeta he won't let him live this time. The two know how Vegeta fights. They know how to counter him perfectly. Individually, Vegeta does overpower them, but he's outnumbered here. Zarbon immediately transforms, annoyed that he even has to do this, but he wants to make sure the job's done right. Vegeta right now is at a solid power level of 50,000. Unfortunately for him, his tail never grew back, but he's still strong, so that's great. Zarbon's at 45k in his monster form, and Adoria's at 30k. The battle begins. At first, it seems like Vegeta has the upper hand, but he gets overwhelmed pretty quickly. If he just had one of them alone, that would have been an easy victory, but he can't split them up. They know he's going to try and do that, so they prevent that from happening. Dodoria's obviously taking a lot of damage here, but with the two of them together, it makes it tougher for Vegeta to just focus on one of them. He has to defend against Zarbon's attacks, and while he is stronger than Zarbon, it's by a relatively small amount. Zarbon is able to injure him, especially with another fighter alongside him. The battle isn't too spectacular, and it's relatively short. Zarbon does take a bit of damage, but overall is fine. Dodoria and Vegeta, though, they're both badly injured, and Zarbon can see that the battle is almost over. He tells Dodoria to sit this one out. He'll finish it off. Zarbon and Vegeta battle one-on-one, -on -one, and Vegeta's too injured to do anything. He tries to fight the best he can, but Zarbon has already claimed victory. Slowly and brutally, Vegeta's beaten even more, with Zarbon grabbing onto his face, slamming him to the ground, driving him into the dirt then stomping him further into the ground. Zarbon looks down at Vegeta with disgust, wiping blood from his face, annoyed that Vegeta made him look like this. But he takes solace in the fact that this is a pathetic end for Vegeta. They have all the info that they need about the Dragon Balls. Vegeta's barely given any more. It's not like he had much more anyways. They could tell that he's useless to them now. Actually, not just useless, a liability. He should be thankful that they gave him a few extra months of life and didn't just kill him immediately. Zarbon points a finger at him, charging a small beam in front of it, directly copying Frieza's death beam. Vegeta can't even stand up. He's fuming. The rage he feels at them, himself, everything. How did it turn out like this? Embarrassed by Raditz and his low-class family, spit on by Frieza, and now being mocked like this by Zarbon and Dodoria of all people. He's dying to them. It's so undignified. He can't die here, though. He's the prince. This, this isn't how he'll go out. There's a way out of this. Saiyans always come back. But is this actually true, or is he just coping with the inevitable? A part of him knows that this might be truly over. Zarbon simply says goodbye, launching the beam right at Vegeta's head. A direct, clean, precise hit. He didn't want to get his hands dirty after all, with Vegeta motionless and lifeless on the ground. They turn to their ship and walk away. Their scouters broke during battle, but once they get back on the ship, they have an extra that'll let them contact Frieza. Zarbon carries Dodoria towards the ship, but Zarbon sees something weird. There's a shadow that he's casting, and not from the sun, it's from some other light source. Something's glowing behind them, and Zarbon hears a voice that he's surprised to hear, asking them where they're going. It's Vegeta's voice, and he says they're not done here. He's somehow standing there, bleeding from his forehead. The laser only left a flesh wound. How did he survive that? And despite barely being able to stand, Vegeta starts glowing. His aura grows fiercer, turning golden. He then lets out a powerful scream. There's a brilliant flash of light, and suddenly, Dodoria disappears, eradicated by a blast, and Zarbon feels a sharp pain in his chest. Looking down to see Vegeta's hand has pierced right through him, but there's no confusion as to what happened. He knows exactly what killed him, especially because Vegeta wants him to see what's gonna happen. He gets a glimpse at what's about to occur. As the blinding light clears, Zarbon clearly sees Vegeta standing there, with golden hair, a twisted grin on his face. He weakly chuckles too. Frieza will be quite surprised by this, won't he? Even Vegeta himself is surprised. A blast then rockets through Zarbon's chest, killing him. And Vegeta has no doubts about what he's become. He laughs and proclaims his victory to no audience around him. He doesn't need those hybrids or anyone else to help him. He's gonna defeat Frieza. He's the Super Saiyan of legend. After claiming victory over Zarbon and Dodoria, Vegeta then boards the ship that they were about to take back. This is the one they came on and thankfully it's enough to fit all of them. They didn't come in a normal attack ball. They took one with a healing pot in it because not only was there a mission that they were going on, but Zarbon knew that one or both of them would come back injured. But this works for Vegeta because now he's the only one there, and he's able to just use the healing pod for himself. It takes a bit of time for him to heal, and he just remains on this planet. And there is an extra scouter on the ship. He turns it to only communicate locally, just so nobody else sees what's happening. And he sees that his power has jumped significantly. It goes to 200,000 from that near-death experience. And he doesn't know how powerful he is in that Super Saiyan form, because when he tries to measure it, his scouter just explodes. But obviously, we know that it's 10 million in Super Saiyan. This might not be enough to fight Frieza. He doesn't even know the true extent of his power, because he doesn't know how powerful a Super Saiyan is. He's still basing it just on numbers alone. But in Frieza's current state, that form that he always sees Frieza in, he should be able to defeat him. But Vegeta's been around long enough to hear some rumors. Apparently Frieza might have way more power locked away. And to stroke his own ego and for the sake of his pride, Vegeta wants to fight Frieza at his strongest. A sneak attack in Super Saiyan's not gonna suffice. He'll be truly satisfied when he sees Frieza's 100%, and subsequently killing him in that 100%. So he's gonna have to be safe about this. He doesn't know how much stronger he has to grow, but he knows he still has to grow stronger. Worst case scenario, he's too strong and the fight gets a little bit boring so he could give himself a handicap. But best case scenario, he's able to have a good fight with Frieza, defeating him at his fullest while in Super Saiyan. 
and this shouldn't be too tough for Vegeta. He has a ton of time on his hands now, and he's on this remote planet alone. Well, he's probably going to have to leave because he knows that if Zarbon and Doria don't go back to base, then everyone's going to track him here and realize that Vegeta might still be alive. So, he finds a random planet nearby, one where he could easily hide on and no one will suspect him. It's a pretty rough planet too, one with a harsh environment. This will make the training even better. He finds a safe spot for his ship, and that's where he'll go to heal. And now he's good to go. He's at this planet alone, with no one to bother him, and he's going to grow infinitely stronger. Now we go back to Earth. Another month passes. Training does continue for everyone on Earth too, without even realizing what's going on in space. They don't know what's happened with Vegeta, but they know he's going to come back eventually and probably try to kill them again, so they're training for that. Raditz especially is training very seriously. The next time Vegeta shows up, he wants to be the one to beat him single-handedly. By now, Gohan and Goten have completed their training with Kami, and they've actually gained control over the Great Ape form. Plus, they've all been doing gravity training too, mainly because Raditz has been pushing for it. This gravity's too weak here. And Goku does agree because he was at King Kai's planet for a bit. This helps all of them, and their training is pretty effective. Their powers are actually higher than what Vegeta's is in base. After this month passes, let's give some power levels. Goku's the strongest in base, at 500,000. Although, he could push Kaioken up to 20. So at Kaioken times 20, he goes to 10 million. Raditz is behind him in base, at 400k, but he has no way to buff himself beyond that. Then behind that is Vegeta, at 300,000. Although, he has the biggest buff of them all. With the 50 times buff of Super Saiyan, he's going to be at a power of 15 million. The most surprising growth is Gohan and Goten. We know they have great potential, and especially with them being twins, they have perfect training partners. Their training is going to be so much better. Their powers have spiked massively. They're both at 300,000 each, and in Great Ape, that goes up to 3 million. They have the exact same power, exact same skill set, everything. But of course, they're not exact clones of each other, they have different personalities and such. It's just that they're completely even as fighters. And then behind that is Piccolo at 200,000. Some of the humans have grown stronger too, but pretty much like normal, I feel like the only ones that would keep up with their training are Krillin and Ten. Yamcha, Chaozu, and Yajirobe might grow a little bit stronger, but for those two, let's just put them at a nice 75,000. And just like they expected, Vegeta eventually does arrive back on Earth one day. They sense his ominous power approaching, now recognizing that key. They had no clue that he would come back so soon, but hey, at least they're prepared. And they could tell that he could lower his energy at will too, because his power is lower than before. So he's gotten a controlling key and can probably sense them as well. That should make this battle far more interesting. Raditz flies out to a remote location, with Goku following close behind. Gohan, Goten, and Piccolo meet up there too. This feels like deja vu, except this time, Goku's actually here to fight the Saiyan off. And not coming back from the dead. Vegeta is able to locate them by key sense alone. Not recognizing their individual powers, but being able to sense them because they're so strong. He abandoned that new Saiyan armor he got and returned to the same one that he had before. And he looked the exact same as he did before, except he doesn't have a tail now. Thanks to it being cut off in the Saiyan saga. Raditz is the first one to greet him, telling Vegeta he shouldn't have come back. This time he won't be so lucky. Even though Kakarot might not want to kill him, Raditz is strong enough to the point where Kakarot can't stop him. Well, at least if he does it quickly enough. But Vegeta says he didn't make any mistake by coming back here. If anything, they made the mistake. They shouldn't have let him live. The first fight begins. It's Vegeta versus Raditz. The fight is actually pretty close. Vegeta's at 300k and Raditz is at 400k, so there's not too big of a gap there, but Raditz definitely is stronger in base, which does surprise Vegeta. He didn't realize they all grew this strong. Especially if that weakling Raditz is at this level, he assumes the others must have grown a lot too. The fight doesn't really go anywhere, but Vegeta does realize that he's losing. And Raditz asks why Vegeta isn't concerned. He definitely has a disadvantage here. Raditz alone could defeat him. And Vegeta does agree. Yeah, Raditz could defeat him. At his base power. You see, maybe Raditz shouldn't have dragged this fight out. Had he just gone for the kill right away, he would have won. And Vegeta knew that Raditz wouldn't have gone for the kill. Just like him wanting to beat Frieza at his 100%, Vegeta knew that Raditz wanted to drag this battle out. Just like any other Saiyan, he would have wanted to win the battle at his full power, getting the satisfaction of beating his opponent at 100%. And he assumes Kakarot would have been the same. He doesn't know about the others there, but he knew for those two at least, they weren't going to try a sneak attack on him. But they probably should have, because Vegeta has more power locked away, and he thanks them for prolonging this. You see, he's become something far greater than anything they could have ever imagined. He starts transforming. A golden aura creeps up around him, and they have no clue of what's going on, but they can sense his key spiking dramatically. His hair starts flowing. It doesn't necessarily change shape, but it becomes more rigid, and it starts morphing into a golden color, with his eyes also turning a bluish green. There's a powerful burst of key, with the transformation fully set in. Vegeta stands there, proclaiming that he's become a Super Saiyan. And there's no doubt about what he's saying. That has to be what the Super Saiyan is. It's a transformation. After all this time, that's all it was. And he gives a nice little monologue too, explaining what happened with him and what brought him here. Just like any Saiyan, he got stronger at the brink of death. Although, he succumbed to his anger, gaining this transformation now. And he is royalty after all, so of course he's the Super Saiyan of legend. It only makes sense. And you can see that Raditz doesn't look so cocky anymore. Exactly what he wanted. 
Raditz tries to attack Vegeta again, but none of the attacks do anything. He doesn't even flinch at all. Goku tells Raditz to get back, and Vegeta simply sweeps a hand at Raditz, knocking him far away. The four others all jump in too. And Goku tells Gohan and Goten to not hold back. This is serious. They need to use their full strength. They are a bit worried now seeing him as a Super Saiyan, but the brothers already know by now. Whenever they're fighting together, they feel unstoppable. Gohan and Goten look at each other and nod, and Gohan even notices that Goten's a bit nervous too, which is strange because usually, he seems to be a lot more confident and easygoing. That's how serious this is. But they have one ace up their sleeve that they can use right away. They each hold a hand out at each other, and in between their hands, they charge an artificial moon, splitting it up so they each lose less energy, instead of one of them losing a lot of energy. Goku goes into Kaioken as Piccolo joins him in the fight, with an injured Raditz hopping back in too. And then Vegeta notices a glow in the sky, a very familiar glow. Oh, they're gonna use their grade 8 form. Those two brats must have learned how to use it. And Raditz looks on confidently. He's glad that he taught those two how to do that. Now Vegeta must be really screwed. Gohan and Goten fully transform. Vegeta doesn't even stop the transformation. This will be a thrilling battle for him. Fighting two Saiyans, that strong Namekian, and those two hybrid Saiyans transform into great apes. With his Super Saiyan power, he could beat them all at once. Even with Gohan and Goten transforming though, it doesn't do anything. They do get a ton of strength from this, and Goku has Kaioken times 20, which buffs him significantly, although he can't use Kaioken for long. Collectively, they actually do overpower Vegeta a little bit, but it's not going to be enough. Because individually, besides Goku, they're all way weaker than Vegeta. And of course, with Goku using Kaioken, he's going to wear himself out a little bit. But Vegeta does struggle here. This isn't an easy battle for him, because like I mentioned, in terms of raw strength, they do overpower him. But it's not enough to make a significant difference, especially because the power is all split up and it's not in one person. The first thing he does is fight the Great Apes. He knows they're two kids and they should be pretty easy to beat, and their power is significantly weaker than his. Only a fraction of his Super Saiyan strength. He's able to take Piccolo out of the fight pretty easily, but doesn't kill Piccolo because he knows that he's the key to the Dragon Balls. That's one of the reasons he came back here. But all the others, they could die. He has no worries about that. And Vegeta is taking a significant amount of damage here, but he's also able to deal a lot of damage. Gohan and Goten are the biggest targets. And Vegeta is so much faster than them, and with him being small, he's even harder to hit. And now Vegeta's getting the upper hand and he's able to knock the two great apes unconscious, with them returning back to their human forms. And now he can fully focus on Goku. Raditz is pretty easy to swat away once more, and he enjoys beating Kakarot. The two of them are both bloodied, but Vegeta's getting a huge upper hand now. Goku tries to push his body to the limit, but it's not working. Nothing he does can overcome Vegeta's power. Vegeta has Goku on the ground now, still attacking him to just rub it in even further. But he keeps him alive a little longer. He knows that Nameki needs to stay alive too, but he wonders if Goku has any information regarding the Dragon Balls. Goku's surprised that he even knows about that, but he's not going to give away any of that info, obviously. Well, just like Vegeta expected, he'll be able to find out the information himself. He stands over Goku, holding a hand out, charging what he calls a Big Bang attack. But right as he launches the blast, his arms suddenly dart to the side and blast the ground in front of him, because something hits him in the arm. A precise beam of energy flies right through his shoulder. Vegeta screams in pain, turning around to see that Piccolo standing there, having just launched his own special attack. Thankfully, Vegeta gave him more than enough time to charge it, and he was standing still. He left himself wide open. Vegeta then rushes back at Piccolo, just to knock him out. Again, he can't kill Piccolo, which kind of pisses him off. But he could at least stop the Namekian once and for all. And as he rushes towards Piccolo, someone else then jumps back into the battle too. It's Raditz, also heavily injured. He has one last shot, and he's going to make the most use of it that he can. He attacks Vegeta right in the spot where Piccolo hit him. And it's a pretty gruesome sight, sticking it right through the hole in Vegeta's shoulder charging key around his arm, and then launching a blast right through it, just to widen the wound even more. And this does work. While he couldn't injure Vegeta before, exploiting this weak spot was a good idea. And it does injure Vegeta a little bit further. But that was the last attack that Raditz is going to land on him. Vegeta quickly turns around. Again, he has no worries about killing Raditz. He simply draws a hand back, puncturing it right through Raditz's torso, reopening the scar that Piccolo gave him. He falls to the ground and starts bleeding out. And just like with Goku, he's going to rub some salt in the wound, starting to beat on Raditz too. Goku crawls over, trying to help, but Vegeta kicks him away, telling him to wait his turn. He's gonna get that next. Once these two are dead, he's gonna get the Dragon Balls for himself. And he'll be strong enough to fight Frieza. Actually, not even that. He'll just make himself immortal. That'll be even better. But amidst his monologue, Raditz launches a blast right into Vegeta's face as he looks away, angering him even more. When's Raditz gonna quit? When is he gonna realize that he lost here? Well, no matter. Vegeta says before Piccolo so rudely interrupted him, he had an attack that he wanted to use. Holding a hand out in front of Raditz, launching a Big Bang attack, completely destroying every bit of Raditz. Looking over to Goku too, realizing that Goku's gone unconscious from blood loss too. What a pity, he didn't even get to see his brother die. Vegeta's gonna have to wake him back up to make sure he knows what happened. But there's still one last hope of survival here. Piccolo crawls over to the two kids, trying to give them some energy. They're unconscious, but he's able to wake them up, and whatever little energy he has left, he gives to them. He's not worried about dying after all. Vegeta said that he's gonna keep him alive, but he knows those two are the best shot of winning here. 
And just as Vegeta thanked Raditz before for prolonging the battle, Piccolo thanks Vegeta for prolonging the battle. Just as Piccolo is able to wake the two kids up, they watch as Vegeta kills Raditz. Standing over Goku next, ready to kill him as well. And the two of them know that they'll be next as well. Vegeta lifts Goku up, slapping him to try to wake him up. Oh well, Vegeta doesn't have enough time to waste here. If Kakarot's not going to wake up, he's just going to have to kill him while he's unconscious. But Vegeta feels a strange sensation. The ground begins shaking, and he senses two powers nearby. It's those kids again. Piccolo's on the ground next to them, and the two weakly stand up. They yell out to Vegeta to leave their dad alone. Anger to watch this happening to Goku. Anger to see that everyone around them is being hurt. To see that Raditz has died. It's so strange too. They never thought they'd even grow fond of Raditz, but here they are. But they're not going to let anyone else die. Especially not Goku, who's next. Their hair starts standing up, and Vegeta sees what's happening. No, it can't be. There's no way that they could be the same as him. He drops Goku quickly and then jumps back, quickly charging a blast and launching at them. The blast makes contact. He thinks he's fine. He's probably stopped them, but no, that's not what happened. As the blast dissipates, the two kids are standing there. Now both with the same golden hair as him and with the same golden aura. They've also become Super Saiyans. The two barely have any strength left, but with Super Saiyan, it gives them a second wind. They launch in at Vegeta, wasting no time in attacking him with all their might. He's already been weakened too, so that makes this a lot easier. Piccolo's the only one conscious and laughs while watching on. He knew they had it in them. And even funnier, even if Vegeta did kill them all, he wouldn't even get the Dragon Balls. It hasn't even been a full year since they revived Goku yet. No matter what happens, Vegeta's not winning here, especially not now. The two kids are barely able to control their rage. They know how to control their anger in their base form, but this is different. With Super Saiyan, the rage is consuming them. But there's one thing keeping them calm. It's Goku nearby. He's unconscious and they know they need to protect him. But he actually woke up now, and he realized what happened, and he tries to calm them down. While he was unconscious, he can assume what happened, seeing that Raditz is nowhere to be found and there's just a crater nearby. But he's honestly not too worried. He communicates with the two kids mentally, telling them not to worry about him or Raditz. Goku's gonna be fine. All he needs is a Senzu beam. And as for Raditz, they could bring him back with the Dragon Balls. They're just gonna have to wait a bit for them to recover, but they'll be able to bring him back perfectly okay. And he tells them to not let that rage consume them. Don't become like Vegeta. And this does help calm the two kids down, seeing that Goku's okay and knowing that they'll make it out of this fine. The two fight with all their might. Vegeta can't do anything against them. And finally, Vegeta falls to the ground, unconscious, with Gohan and Goten having claimed victory. The two of them then collapse as well, out of energy, returning back to their base form, but smiling. No one around them could stand up, and Goku and Piccolo are the only ones who are barely conscious. Vegeta slowly reawakens from being unconscious, and he looks around him seeing the same people that he was fighting before. Well, besides Raditz. Gohan and Goten are on the ground, still unconscious themselves. Goku and Piccolo have healed up though. Thankfully, Goku even did get a Senzu beam. And as for Piccolo, he was probably the least injured of everybody because, get, yeah, Vegeta did have to keep him alive for the Dragon Balls. Although, it's not like Vegeta's gonna get a chance to use them now. And he realizes that everything that happened, it wasn't just a bad dream. It actually did occur. Those two hybrid Saiyan children, they were able to become Super Saiyans as well and defeat him. It's such a blow to his ego. He can't believe that. And that's on top of the fact that he was defeated in general. Even as a Super Saiyan, he couldn't win here. How is he gonna defeat Frieza if that's the case? Goku and Piccolo are now deciding what to do next. Piccolo thinks they should just kill Vegeta. Honestly, they should have killed him before when they had the chance. And now they have an even better reason and opportunity too. Clearly Vegeta's gonna keep coming back and keep being a threat. He even killed one of them already. But Goku's surprisingly casual about this. And it's not because he doesn't care about Raditz. It's because first of all, he knows that Raditz is gonna be revived. Vegeta's not gonna get the Dragon Balls and he couldn't even get them right now anyways. He's gonna have to wait a few weeks. And once those Dragon Balls are active again, they're gonna bring Raditz back. But besides that, the main reason Goku's not too concerned is because they defeated Vegeta twice and now they have two Super Saiyans on their side. Vegeta's not going to be a problem any longer, and even if he continues coming back and forth, yeah, they're not going to worry about that. Besides, Goku says it's better to keep his enemies at arm's length. Wait, is he implying that he wants Vegeta to stay here? Well, yeah, Vegeta clearly has a lot to teach about Super Saiyan. And they definitely have a way to benefit him too. He still wants to defeat Frieza, right? So why not help him defeat Frieza? Frieza's probably going to track him down eventually anyways, and clearly he's not ready to fight him yet if he can't fight just two kids. Now, Goku doesn't know how strong this Frieza guy is, but he would like to fight him himself too. Now Vegeta's disgusted by this idea. First of all, he's not staying on this planet. And second of all, if they even do fight Frieza, he's gonna fight Frieza alone. He's the only one capable of it, and he wants the glory. He wants to be the one who kills Frieza. They're idiots for letting him live again. They're such weaklings for that too. Does Kakarot just not have the stomach to kill him? And on top of that too, it's just embarrassing. The fact that Vegeta's being spared twice in a row. He tries to go over to where the ship is, but he sees nothing there. It seems amidst all the chaos, especially with Gohan and Goten becoming great apes, that amazing spaceship that Vegeta came here on, yeah, it was destroyed. Vegeta doesn't even have a way to leave this planet even if he wanted to. At least, not any that he knows of. Piccolo and Goku continue discussing what to do next, with Goku trying to convince Piccolo that, yeah, they should just keep Vegeta here. Piccolo really doesn't agree with it at first, but he realizes that Goku is right. Defeating Vegeta a third time won't be that hard. 
and Vegeta can't believe what he's hearing either. It's so embarrassing. But it looks like he doesn't have a choice. And maybe he can train here a bit. Clearly they've grown strong in their own right. Even in their base forms, they surpassed his base. The only reason Vegeta had an advantage was because he had Super Saiyan, but Kakarot and even Raditz, how did they grow so strong? Vegeta's been doing such intense training out in space, even abusing Zenkais. At least to the best of his ability, it's not like he could do that to himself. But here it seems like they're living peaceful lives and somehow growing stronger, so maybe Vegeta does have something to learn from them. And again, it's not like he has a choice anyways. It looks like he's stuck on this planet. A few more weeks pass. Vegeta's kept under watch and eventually does heal up too. Maybe even being slipped as Senzu beaten by Goku. Eventually the Dragon Balls do reappear, and Goku works quickly to get them all. He doesn't want Vegeta to even have a chance at getting them. It's not like Vegeta would know how to use them anyways, but still. They get the Dragon Balls, and they summon Shenron, asking for Raditz to be revived. Raditz reappears on Earth and is pretty surprised to be back here. He didn't think that they would want to revive him. Although, the circumstances here are a lot better for Goku and Raditz. Obviously this Raditz is inspired by the one from the What If Raditz Survived scenario, and the circumstances here are way better for him. Because in that scenario, there was tension between Raditz and everyone, but there's a lot more working in Raditz's favor here. He's kind of embarrassed to see that Kakarot's caring for him, but you know, he also appreciates his brother bringing him back to life. Gohan was born with a twin and has a brother alongside him at all times, and now, it seems like Goku's gonna also have a brother alongside him at all times too. Although, Raditz is pretty pissed off at Vegeta. He even agrees with Piccolo, they should have killed Vegeta while they had the chance. But Goku reminds him that they defeated Vegeta twice, wouldn't it be better to embarrass Vegeta again if he causes any issues? And you know what, yeah, Raditz kinda likes that idea. Taunting Vegeta about this, with Vegeta going Super Saiyan in response, threatening to kill Raditz right on the spot. And when he does this, Gohan and Goten go Super Saiyan on the spot, threatening to beat Vegeta once more. Look at that, the prince of all Saiyans is scared by two low-class children. On second thought, yeah, Raditz does like this a lot. The next step though is for Goku and Raditz to get Super Saiyan for themselves. Although, Vegeta's definitely not going to be the one to help them with that. But Vegeta realizes, from that battle, he grew even further. Obviously this goes for everyone in that battle besides Piccolo. All the Saiyans benefited from Zenkais, but Vegeta thinks that maybe with this push, they'll be able to defeat Frieza. Or rather, he can at the very least. He even tries to make use of the gravity training facilities around them, which is the first time he gets to meet Bulma too. Although, he pushes her away because he wants to be alone right now. He's very angsty at the moment. So from this point on, a few more months pass. Everyone tries to do their own sorts of training, with Goku trying to get Super Saiyan for himself, as well as trying to train the two kids. Because, yeah, while he doesn't have Super Saiyan, that doesn't mean he can't teach them. They're even confused by this too because wouldn't they be the ones teaching him? Well, he could teach them at least some sort of skills behind Super Saiyan. He's sure if they get a better grasp on Ki and such that that'll help with Super Saiyan. And he can learn from them too. Plus, Piccolo also tries to help here too. He was the one who watched them turn Super Saiyan. And he can see that it was unlocked their anger. It seems like that was the case with Vegeta as well. Piccolo's gonna try and help control and moderate their anger. Because while they were able to access that rage beforehand, now in Super Saiyan it's a different story. And Raditz is there to help them too. They're getting three different types of training. Piccolo's helping them with their rage, Raditz is helping them with their Saiyan instincts, and Goku's helping them as martial artists and key users. Of course with Vegeta on his own during this entire time. But eventually Frieza does actually come to Earth just like they thought, finally locating Vegeta's ship, or at least his remains. They were able to track down where the ship was last seen. It took a while since Vegeta tried to jam the communications, but now they have it, and Frieza brings in everyone. He knows that Vegeta was going to betray him before, and he wanted to kill Vegeta in the first place. That's why he sent Zarbon and Doria with him alone. He doesn't know how Vegeta killed them, but he did kill them. And even though they were trying to kill him in the first place, Frieza considers this a betrayal, a direct threat. So he calls in everyone. First, the Ginyu Force descends on Earth with all of Frieza's army. And they're not playing around. They're going to wipe out this entire planet until they find Vegeta. But thankfully he doesn't make it too hard. He comes out right away and simply blasts down the entire army. The Ginyu Force has a much better chance. But Vegeta says he doesn't even need to transform. This might be a fun test of his base power at least. As he wards off the entire Ginyu Force on his own. Eventually, everyone else does sense what's going on and decides to come over there to see what's happening with Frieza. But by the time they get over there, all they see is Vegeta in a wasteland, surrounded by dozens of corpses. At least the corpses of the people who were lucky enough to not get decimated completely by him. Just to anger Frieza even more, Vegeta decides to show off his transformation, going Super Saiyan right in front of the Emperor. And out of complete fear, Frieza transforms, showing off his full strength too, realizing that he's not going to be able to fight a Super Saiyan in his current state. He's also kind of terrified of this. He knew Vegeta was betraying him, but he didn't realize that this is what happened. Gohan and Goten fly in alongside him, going Super Saiyan as well, and Vegeta tells him to get out of the way, with Frieza even more shocked. There's two Saiyan kids here, and they're also Super Saiyans? And he looks around and sees that there's another Saiyan, one that looks exactly like the one who stood up against him a long time ago, and Raditz is there too, looking completely different. What's been happening under his nose this entire time? He didn't even realize. And the fight with Frieza isn't really anything spectacular. By now, Vegeta does have enough strength to defeat Frieza on his own. 
Plus, Gohan and Goten are helping even though Vegeta doesn't want to. But Vegeta does get the kill, defeating Frieza in cold blood. And likely at some point, King Cold will show up too, but he's not going to be an issue either. But luckily, it seems like Earth is finally at peace. Vegeta is no longer an issue, Frieza and King Cold aren't a threat anymore, and everything that started from Raditz arriving on Earth has now been solved. Piccolo and Raditz have definitely cooled down and aren't really villains anymore. They definitely aren't great people still, but they've been shaped into better people thanks to Goku, Gohan, and Goten being around them the entire time. Hopefully the same will happen with Vegeta. Especially because after being embarrassed so many times, he secludes himself. He is on Earth, but he never really associates with anyone, which will come into play later on. Because not too long after all of this, a new person shows up on Earth, or rather, in this timeline. There's a time traveler that appears. It's some kid wearing a Capsule Corp shirt, and they don't recognize who this guy is, and he doesn't give away his identity. Although, he does meet with Goku secretly, with Piccolo nearby eavesdropping it. This kid says he's not from this timeline. He's from the future, and his name is Trunks. And what's more, he shows off that he can become a Super Saiyan, transforming right in front of Goku. This amazes Goku because he's only just on the cusp of Super Saiyan. He doesn't have access to it fully yet. There's another Super Saiyan? That's amazing! But who is he and why is he here? So he explains. Trunks was born a bit later than normal, also because Bulma met Vegeta later than normal too. Especially with Vegeta being so secluded right now, Trunks is younger, but yes, they do get together. Which is also why he needs his identity secret right now, because otherwise he won't be born here. He, Gohan, and Goten were the last survivors. The last survivors of what? And he begins explaining the androids and the threat that they posed. Goku ended up dying from the heart virus like normal, and then three androids appeared attacking everybody. After years of fighting them off, and with Gohan and Goten being so powerful and having Super Saiyan right off the bat, it still wasn't enough. Their first encounter with the androids didn't go well. Everyone died. Piccolo, Krillin, Ten, Yamcha, Chiaotzu, Vegeta, Raditz, everybody. The only fighters that lived were Gohan and Goten. And after years of growing even more powerful and getting stronger in Super Saiyan, it still wasn't enough. Now, if it were just 17 and 18, they actually would have won here. But there's one really big issue here. There's not just two androids. There's three. Jiro had more, stronger fighters to deal with. So, reluctantly, he activated an extra android when he did. Of course, 17 and 18 still did kill him. So, it wasn't Jiro that was there attacking. It was actually Android 16. He did have some issues, but Jiro didn't really have any other options. 16 is solely focused on killing Goku, Gohan, and Goten. And with Goku gone, he's only really focused on the other two. And for the rest of the battles, he just stands there. He didn't even attack anyone in the first encounter. It's so weird because it seems like 16 is not a threat, but when Gohan and Goten are involved, he directly fights against them. And Trunks warns Goku about when they're going to show up and what the androids are like. He also does give Goku his heart virus medicine. And Trunks doesn't really want to meet the others right now because then he's going to have to explain himself. And he doesn't want to mess up the timeline or anything. But he does note that it's weird to see Gohan and Goten this young. They're only a few years younger than him right now. He's so used to them being like big brothers. But he's glad to see that they're thriving in this timeline and he hopes that's going to remain. Trunks will return in a few years to make sure everything went okay. But before he leaves, Goku does ask something. Vegeta ended up with Bulma, but did Raditz ever end up with anyone? And Trunks actually never knew Raditz well. But from what Bulma told him, he was always just a flirt and loved his motorcycle and fighting more than he loved women. The only other thing that Bulma mentioned was that he got very angry when he saw that Goku died. But she never really knew Raditz that well either. He was only ever really close with Goku, and that makes Goku kind of happy, realizing that Raditz is going to only grow closer to them. Weird considering how he first introduced himself. But also Goku was just wondering if Raditz would have had a kid, and you know, he guesses he's better off as a bachelor anyways. Looks like he's not going to change much in that regard. They decide to leave the androids alive, and the group trains rigorously over the three years. Another big thing here is that Goku takes his heart virus medicine. He eventually does unlock Super Saiyan over this time period, as does Raditz. But with him unlocking it, it happens later on so he doesn't really have a good control in it. It strains his body a lot more, which means the heart virus symptoms actually do appear a bit sooner because of it. Thankfully, Gohan and Goten are attentive enough to notice that, so he's cured of the heart virus right before the androids actually do show up. And by the time they show up, they see three androids in the city just like Trunks told them. But what they don't realize is that two of the androids are some that they don't know about. The three androids in the city are 16, 19, and 20. Jiro did need extra manpower, but didn't want to resort to the other two yet. 16 has issues with being too passive, but it's better than the issues that 17 and 18 have, where they don't even obey him. And just like he thought, this does draw Goku out, as well as the rest of his family. He doesn't want to just eliminate Goku. He wants to eliminate Goku's entire lineage. He's thriving. He has two kids that are just as strong as him, probably even stronger at this point. Which they are, they're even beyond that. So he sees those two kids as threats as well. But it's almost as if Goku knew he was going to be here because he comes to the city with all these other fighters. Goku, Raditz, Vegeta, Gohan, and Goten are all there, all in Super Saiyan. Plus, Piccolo, Krillin, Ten, and Yamcha came along too. Trunks isn't born right now, so thankfully Bulma's not in danger. So, when Trunks comes back, he still is going to have to hide his identity a bit. But that's besides the point, because now they're fighting the androids. Android 19 is destroyed, and Jiro is also nearly killed. But thanks to 16 being there to help, he acts as a bodyguard and helps escort Jiro away. 16 did show a lot of power, but again, he was only really fighting Gohan, Goku, and Goten. 
and the rest of the fighters realize how big of a threat the androids would be, especially since they got away here. They escape into a wasteland, and Raditz is the one to follow. They can't sense the androids, but simply put, he could just eliminate this entire area and that might get rid of them. Raditz charges as much energy as possible in Super Saiyan, ready to test the full power of this transformation since he's never really had an opportunity. He actually remembers Nappa in this moment, realizing that that oaf was useful for one thing, and that's the technique he's about to steal, as he uses Nappa's giant storm. Wiping out the entire area, although the androids are nowhere in sight and it doesn't seem like that he did any damage to them. At least from what they can see, Raditz did actually severely injure Jero, but since the androids can't be sensed, they're able to make it out of there too. And thankfully with that attack, Jero couldn't absorb any of the key because most of the damage came from the ground exploding rather than the key behind him. Trunks eventually does show up too, now looking like his normal self because he's aged a bit. And when they describe the androids that they were fighting, he says that only one of them is the one that he fought, Android 16. The other two? He's never seen them before. Yeah, they might have easily defeated one of the androids and almost defeated another, but still, it looks like two others are about to appear. Something went wrong here. Something's different. They need to find Jero right now, and this does concern the group, especially Piccolo, realizing that there's going to be other androids here and they might be even stronger. He might need more power for this, and the rest of the group might need some more power as well. Not too long after escaping, Sixteen is successfully able to escort Jero back to his lab. This is perfect for him. He can repair himself. He's heavily injured right now, but he'll waken the other two androids, and in the meantime, he'll restore his own android body. But that's not going to happen. As soon as he awakens 17 and 18, they end up killing Jero. They almost try and kill 16 too, but they realize that first of all, 16 is stronger than them, and second of all, 16's like them, as in he's one of Jero's creations. They're different types of androids, but still, maybe it would be better to join forces with 16, although he's pretty strange to the two of them. The group eventually arrives at Jero's lab, seeing that Jero's nowhere in sight, with Trunks astonished to see that the other two androids have awoken. These are the ones he was fighting in his timeline. But the group isn't too worried, they already defeated 20 and 19, so these two shouldn't really be too big of an issue. Android 16 was tough, but there's no way they're tougher than him. And they're right, they're not tougher than Android 16, but they're much stronger than Jero and Android 19. They give the androids a better battle too. Most of the group is stronger than normal, and you have two extra fighters here, Raditz and Goten, who weren't there originally. Plus, Gohan has Super Saiyan, which he didn't have originally. And Goku's there, who wasn't there originally. But clearly it's not enough. 17 and 18 are pretty tough to fight, and with Goku, Gohan, and Goten being there, as well as Raditz, 16 decides to attack them. His directive is to kill Goku's entire family, so while he doesn't focus on anyone else, he's focused on everyone directly related to Goku, and Goku himself of course. But thanks to the battle being way closer than it should have been, this gives the group a chance to escape. They're not completely defeated. And thanks to some smart thinking by Krillin, he's able to blind the androids, telling everyone to rush out of there. It doesn't seem like the androids can sense key, which is great, which makes their escape even easier. They need to regroup and figure out what to do next and they decide to go to the lookout. Raditz notes something pretty interesting. Those two kids showed a great amount of power during that battle, that rage that they've shown before. It almost resurfaced once again, especially when they were seeing Goku get hurt. They've harnessed it in their base form, but now they need to harness it as Super Saiyans. Who knows, maybe it could let them go beyond Super Saiyan, which Vegeta finds kind of ridiculous. He doesn't even know why he's on the lookout in the first place. He's gonna do his own methods of training, so angrily he leaves. But now that they think about it, why did they go up here? Goku was the one to suggest it, and Goku has two reasons. For one, this is a good place to hide. The androids aren't going to be able to find them up here. Also, they have the perfect place to train here, the Room of Spirit and Time. And maybe Raditz is right about going beyond Super Saiyan. There's only one way to find out though. They're going to need to train, and they're going to need to get a lot of training in within a day. With Piccolo also on the lookout, he contemplates his next move. He also has an idea of his own that might work. And reluctantly, he decides to murder the Kami in front of everybody on there. And the second he does, he senses a fearsome power. The group can't believe how strong Piccolo grew from this fusion. He didn't even do this because he realized it's Namekian fusion. He was just trying to join with Kami again because they were two halves of one whole. If they split apart before, they can combine their powers. And that's exactly what they did here. This merged Piccolo might be a bit weaker than normal though because he doesn't have nail fused within him, but most of that power came from Kami anyways. But that power that he sensed down below, it can't be any of the androids because they don't have a key. He decides to go check it out, telling everyone he'll report back in as to what he sees. Goku decides to go in the room of spirit and time with Gohan and Goten first. For the Room of Spirit and Time, there's enough food in there for two people to train for 12 months. So, if we don't change anything, that means they have enough there to train three people for eight months instead. Which is actually more than enough time because originally, Goku and Gohan left the time chamber early anyways. And here, Gohan and Goten already have Super Saiyan. They don't need to waste time trying to teach those kids Super Saiyan because they actually became Super Saiyans before Goku. So they're not going to be in there a full year, and even if they want to go in a full year, they could just replenish the food. But that leaves everyone else in a weird spot. Vegeta's just gone, well, wherever, they don't know where he went. So the humans, Trunks, and Raditz wait up here. And Trunks is a bit disappointed that he didn't get to know Vegeta a bit more. Going in the time chamber would have been a perfect opportunity to know him, but Trunks would rather be shunned here than not be born at all. And Goku hopes that once they come out of the room of spirit and time, Vegeta will see how strong they've grown and decide to go in on his own. Hopefully with Trunks, but probably not because he still doesn't know who Trunks is. Although Raditz is a bit suspicious. This kid is a Saiyan from the future. 
and that hair color too. He's surprised the others haven't theorized this yet, but he could be Bulma's child, which would mean he's half Saiyan, so who could this kid's father be? It's definitely not him because Raditz has no interest in Bulma. But then Raditz immediately realizes what's going on and decides to keep it to himself not to cause a paradox. But he gives Trunks a look trying to silently let him know that he knows who Trunks is, although it just comes off as Raditz giving him a creepy smile. This is a weird situation for Trunks, but thankfully, it seems like he hasn't prevented his own birth. He should be born less than a year from now anyway. Piccolo eventually does come back up to the lookout, having nearly defeated Cell, but at least he got all the info about Cell that he needed, telling everyone of this new threat. He wants to fight the other android now, especially because if Cell gets to them first, that'll mean he gets even stronger. But thankfully, they might have some time. As for the androids, he's had Popo watch from the lookout. They knew where the androids were before, and Popo's been tracking them this entire time. And Piccolo could see that they're very far away from Cell. Cell's not gonna have a way to track them either. Piccolo could go to fight 17 and 18, because it seems like they're the only ones needed. He doesn't know if he's gonna be able to fight 16. And since they've already seen 16 fight, that makes Piccolo stay back here. He doesn't want to go down there and die instantly, since he doesn't realize that 16 won't even fight him. Also, they don't have Dragon Balls now and no way of getting other Dragon Balls. They need to be very cautious here. Goku's not going to be able to teleport to Namek because first of all, they've never been to Namek, and second of all, Goku can't teleport. They're going to have to worry about the Dragon Balls later on, which means they're going to need to be really careful right now. But Piccolo says he'll intervene if the androids get anywhere close to Cell. And thankfully that doesn't happen. Goku, Gohan, and Goten exit the Room of Spirit in time. Strangely enough, Goten looks younger than Gohan. Is this because they're aging differently? Or is it because I want to acknowledge how weird it is that Goten looks like this in Super despite being older than Gohan here in Z? Mostly the latter, but it's also weird for them to see. I know the reason behind it, but still, like, this is him in Super? And this is a younger Gohan during the Cell games. Just a thing to reference. But more importantly, they notice that all three of them are in Super Saiyan. And they don't even seem to notice. Goku says that eight months of training was more than enough. Actually, they probably didn't even need the full eight months. Not only have they grown a lot stronger, but they've completely mastered Super Saiyan. And now this should be more than enough to fight the androids. But Piccolo warns them about Cell. The three of them have one big meal, and decide to go back down to the surface to fight Cell. But just before they leave, Vegeta comes back up to the lookout and sees how strong they've grown. Leaving him wondering what his next move should be. Goku, Gohan, and Goten go to the surface. And locating Cell isn't too hard, since he actually has key that they can sense. He's the main threat now. Thankfully, Cell's gonna be underestimating them here, because he doesn't realize that they've been training, and that they've mastered Super Saiyan. It's surprising for him to see that Goku's still alive here. Well, it does make sense after all. That's the whole reason Trunks went back in the first place. But Trunks' success in saving the timeline is gonna stop here. Of course, by now they know that this won't change Trunks' timeline, but at least he's gonna save this one. And thankfully, Cell's grown strong enough to fight these three. He feels that he's absorbed more than enough people to do so. But Goku tells Cell that they already know who he is and what he's up to. Piccolo, or Kami, or whatever he is now, he warned everyone of Cell, so Goku realizes that they need to stop him right now. And he decides that he's gonna fight Cell first, just to see how strong this guy truly is. He already knows that Gohan and Goten have surpassed him, so he at least wants to have some fun here. Goku fights Cell, and it's not really too big of a deal. Goku's way beyond where Cell is at the moment. And since they realize how big of a threat Cell is, Goku's able to kill him pretty easily too. And there's such a big power gap that he just accidentally destroys all of Cell without even realizing that he can regenerate. So Cell is permanently gone, and they don't need to worry about him anymore. Now it's time to face the androids. It takes a bit to track the androids down, but they eventually find the three. And this is perfect. They have three versus three. Honestly, Goku thinks this might be overkill, but he hasn't seen the full extent of the android's power, so who knows? Although as the battle begins, they realize that it actually is overkill. Goku fights 16, Gohan fights 17, and Goten fights 8. And the battle is pretty short-lived, but they are able to win here. Although, unlike Cell, they're not going to kill these three. First of all, at 16, Goku realized he's a robot, and he actually had a pretty good idea in the time chamber. Maybe Bulma could reprogram this guy. He does seem powerful, too. Imagine having a fully artificial android on their side to train with. That could be awesome. But as for the other two by now, they know what these two androids are. Because while Goku took his kids into the time chamber, everyone else went back to the lab and got all the info on the androids, as well as destroying present Cell. Trunks, Raditz, and the humans are to thank for that. 17 and 18 didn't become androids willingly, and unlike Cell, they didn't just kill thousands of people just to grow stronger. The androids actually haven't really killed anyone yet. They've just been going around robbing and destroying places, but they haven't killed people. They've only attacked the group here. And unlike Cell, who was genetically engineered to kill them, 17 and 18 were only just reprogrammed, basically. They are still human, and Goku gives them an offer. He knows they probably don't want to hear it, but they already know that these two didn't want to be androids. He says clearly they've lost here, but if they like, he has a friend who could turn them back to regular humans again. As for 16, he's been defeated and injured so badly that he can't fight anymore, but the other two are still standing. He says they're going to reprogram 16. At least, he hopes Bulma's able to do that. But as for those two, the offer stays open. He doesn't feel right just killing them in cold blood, nor do Gohan and Goten. And he also tells the two androids about Cell, too. They knew Jiro was using them, but they didn't know the extent of how much he was trying to use them. They were basically going to be parts for this other android. The two androids don't accept Goku's offer. They actually don't say much of anything, 
they just simply turn around and leave. Which confuses Goku a bit, but he guesses they're not a threat anymore. It seems like they gave up on fighting. And he's not too concerned anyways. He knows if they do cause issues again, the three of them will be able to defeat 17 and 18 pretty easily. They arrive back on the lookout and let everyone know that things are okay now. Although, there's two people missing. Raditz and Vegeta are gone. Vegeta wanted to go into the room of spirit and time because after seeing how strong Goku got, he decided he needed to train a lot further. And Raditz decided to go in with him. Vegeta was against it at first, but Raditz says he needs to let go of that grudge that he has for Raditz. They're both behind right now. And besides, without a training partner, neither of them will grow. This will be beneficial for both of them. And Raditz confidently says that he has the knowledge of his brother, and they could build off of each other too. Wouldn't that be useful for Vegeta, if both of them can master Super Saiyan as well? He doubts they'll have a chance to fight the androids because with how strong Goku and his kids are now, they're probably going to win. But it doesn't hurt to train. So, the two of them are in the time chamber right now. Unfortunately for Trunks, he didn't really get to see Vegeta too much. Nor did he grow stronger because he didn't have a chance to train in the time chamber. He didn't really need to in the first place. But luckily for him, he has the remote to deactivate the androids in his timeline. And now that they know 16 was only programmed to kill Goku and his family, maybe once he's deactivated, Trunks can have Bulma reprogram him too. Although the button he has is a bomb that blows up the androids. He'll just have to find a way to spare 16. He's glad to hear that the androids in this timeline don't seem as bad as the ones in his timeline. He's a bit worried that Goku let them go, but he trusts Goku's judgment. Trunks thanks everyone for their help, and they thank him because without him, they wouldn't have known about these threats. Everyone would have been dead, Goku would have died from the heart virus, and everyone else would have died from the androids. The only major loss here was Kami. But it's not like he died technically, he just lives on through Piccolo. And Trunks says goodbye to everyone. He hopes he could see them again one day. Realizing that this timeline is going to thrive, and of course he wants to actually talk to Vegeta once he knows who Trunks is. It's unfortunate they couldn't bond now, but hopefully they'll meet again on good terms. And Trunks returns to his timeline. Vegeta and Raditz eventually exit the time chamber, both successfully mastering Super Saiyan as well. And it seems like the two of them are on better terms, but there definitely is a fierce rivalry there. As for the two kids, Goku wants to see them go past Super Saiyan. He knows that they're above him right now, and in the time chamber, he actually saw that they were on the cusp of getting something else. But they needed a little bit more of a push. They need something to push them overboard and to actually transform beyond Super Saiyan. He doesn't know what, but he knows that they can't achieve it. And thankfully, there is something to help them here. 16 has been reprogrammed and upgraded, as well as repaired too. For Bulma, it wasn't actually too hard. She just had to remove all the Kill Goku stuff, and, and that was that. He already seems surprisingly gentle. Also, she removed the bomb inside of him too, because he doesn't really need that anymore. But now he's stronger, and he's actually good. And Goku thinks that this guy will be a good training partner for them, especially because he has infinite energy. And with his upgrades, he might even be stronger than them right now. That's one of the reasons Goku wanted this guy reprogrammed. He seemed like a pretty cool opponent, but unlike people such as Piccolo, Vegeta, and Raditz who actually can just change normally, this guy is literally hardwired to hate Goku. Training begins to push the two twins beyond Super Saiyan. And as this goes on, Piccolo realizes that they need a new set of Dragon Balls. But he has a plan for this. Thanks to some help from Popo and Bulma, as well as finding one of the old Saiyan space pods, they're able to build a ship that actually goes to Namek. With King Kai of course helping direct Piccolo, they don't have anyone else in mind for the Guardian of Earth because they've never been to Namek. So, it looks like Piccolo's gonna be Guardian and he has direct contact with King Kai. And also, King Kai gets a good ending here because he doesn't die either. That aside though, Piccolo eventually is able to make it to Namek. Wanting to see if there's any other Dragon Balls there, or if there's a way for him to actually make Dragon Balls for himself. This is the only way that he can learn. By now, Guru is dead, but Mori has taken over as the new Elder. And he's interested to see this other Namekian come here. Clearly, he's very strong, and is very different from the other Namekians. Mori explains that they barely escaped Frieza's wrath. It took a while, but they were able to rebuild, especially because Mori was able to make his own set of Dragon Balls after Guru died. The only reason Piccolo found Namek is because King Kai knew where new Namek was. And Piccolo didn't know any of this. He didn't realize that Frieza did this to this planet. And they also realized that Piccolo's friends were the ones to actually fight against Frieza. So, they're more than willing to actually help Piccolo here. Not only is he a Namekian like them, but when Mori reads his mind and goes through Earth's history, he can see that this guy is a clear ally and helped them. Even though he didn't even realize that he was helping. And since they don't know anyone on Namek, Dende won't become the new Guardian on Earth. It still is going to be Piccolo. They use the Dragon Balls here on Namek to grant Piccolo the ability to create Dragon Balls for himself. And he didn't realize it would be that easy. He thought he was just going to have to learn here. But Mori says there actually is more for him to learn. He sees that Piccolo has a bunch of latent power locked away. And besides just creating Dragon Balls, Mori tells Piccolo there's a lot that he could learn here. And if Piccolo would like, Mori could try to unlock some of his latent potential. Although, he's kind of new to doing this so he can't unlock the full extent of it, but it's at least worth a shot. Mori tries to awaken Piccolo's power, and he's astonished to see how strong Piccolo is. He only barely taps into it, but Piccolo sees a huge boost in strength. And Piccolo didn't realize he had all this locked away, and that's why Mori wants him to stay. If he stays just for a little bit, he can learn not only about his past, but he could also grow stronger. He can grow smarter. There's so much he could do here. Besides, it's a good chance to learn about his people, too. And curious about this, Piccolo ends up staying on Namek temporarily. 
as he's growing stronger on Namek, back on Earth, Gohan and Goten have finally broken through in their training. Thanks to guidance from Goku and training with Android 16, they finally were pushed beyond Super Saiyan, unlocking a new power beyond that, which they simply call Super Saiyan 2, now finally using it for the first time. There's a seven year passage of time as we go up to the Buu Saga, although there's a lot that happens over this time scheme. For one, Piccolo eventually does come back from Namek, much stronger and much smarter. Of course he originally went to find out a way to make the Dragon Balls for himself, but he learned a lot more while he was there. And of course he does make a new, stronger Shenron. Not only does he have three wishes, but he's linked to a more powerful Piccolo, so by default, the Shenron is better. But besides that, Piccolo got way more out of this. Besides all the knowledge he gained, not just about Namek, but the universe as a whole, he did grow a lot stronger too. Now, it's not like he memorized the entire Namekian Book of Legends, but he does know about it and knows that there's a lot of info in there. So if he ever did want to look up some specific info one day, he would know about it. He wasn't there permanently studying it. Because if so, he'd know about the Super Saiyan God by now, and we'd probably be able to create one right at the moment. But most of his time there was focused on trying to unlock his true potential. Mori did try to draw out more of his power again, but he could never draw out the full amount of power that Piccolo had. He knows that there's still some locked away in there. But with the amount that was taken out, plus all the training that he's gotten, Piccolo's definitely going to be keeping up with the Super Saiyans. And the Super Saiyan 2s for that matter. Since Gohan and Goten have recently discovered that. And speaking of hybrid Saiyans, Trunks is born in the present, a little bit later than normal. Although everyone finally realizes, this whole time, they didn't know who Trunks was. They thought he was just some random time traveler and that Bulma just named this kid Trunks, basically as a sign of respect for him. But when he is born, well, they can clearly see that this is a baby version of that time traveler. That whole time, they were around Vegeta and Bulma's son and they didn't even realize. Well, Raditz laughs. He realized. And Goku did. Also, I guess Piccolo did too because he was eavesdropping. Raditz wonders why they never caught on. And while Vegeta has a family now, that's not gonna happen with Raditz. He never does settle down. He's a playboy. And pretty successful at that. He's a tall, muscular man with luscious hair and a cool scar. He kinda smells bad, but otherwise, people power through the sink and they love him. He lives the life of a bachelor, and he's a happy bachelor. But as for his warrior side and everyone else, they all master Super Saiyan at some point. The training Vegeta had with Raditz was actually pretty good. They were able to master it together, and thankfully it seems like they might have put aside the bad blood, although maybe some of it is still there. But over this time skip too, they go beyond Super Saiyan, eventually getting Super Saiyan 2. Goku's the next one to get it after Gohan and Goten do, then Raditz and Vegeta. Raditz and Vegeta are on equal footing, with Goku being stronger than both them, and Gohan and Goten being at the top. Of course, with them growing stronger on their own too, because like normal, they're still going to be training, especially because Goku and Raditz encourage it. They're able to find a nice balance between training and school, because by now they're going to be sent into a city for school. And finally, at some point they do hit growth spurts, but it doesn't mean they're done growing. Trunks is basically like a younger brother to the two of them, especially because now they know who Trunks was, but also because Vegeta lets Trunks hang around them to gauge their power, and hopefully he can grow stronger from them. And Trunks would probably still get Super Saiyan pretty early on, but he doesn't have the experience of everyone else here. And unlike Gohan and Goten, he doesn't have a tail. But how do they live their normal lives with tails though, because now they're going to school, isn't that going to look weird? It probably won't actually look too weird. They live in a society with, well, furries. Like the purest form of it, there's actually animal people here. Now this might seem kind of weird because it might spark some rumors about them being half animal person. Which has some weird implications about their parents, but no, they're just half alien. Although they're not going to let anybody know. What about the nighttime? Does this mean they just can't go outside at night? Actually, they can. They've now worked with Great Ape so much that they could willingly transform. As long as they're focused and don't have some sort of weird rage boost or whatever, they can consciously avoid transforming into a Great Ape, even one under the moon. So this allows them to blend in with society and live basically normal lives. And another small thing to mention, just because I haven't done this a lot in my scenarios, we're going to give Krillin and 18 a better ending and say they do meet by chance and get married by the end of the time skip. I at least owe it to them to have that happen in a few what ifs, since the circumstances of some scenarios mean that it's void. But here, it's chill. Another small side note here, they're in Satan City, but it's not going to be called Satan City. The Cell games never happened and Mr. Satan never became a hero like he once was, but he's still pretty well respected and a pretty famous guy. It's just that he's not going to be renowned as a world savior but he's still pretty much the closest thing that someone can get to that. This also plays into some of the stuff that happens while Gohan and Goten are at high school. They attempt to do the same and stuff at some point because they both think it's a cool idea. They notice that there's some crime in the city and they basically stop it by chance by transforming into Super Saiyan. Although hiding their identity is a bit hard, mainly because of their tails. They do have Saiyan outfits at one point and removing their tails isn't an option. They don't really have a need to just to hide their identity. Plus, their uncle is adamant against it. He says their tails represents their heritage and their pride as Saiyans, while Goku, he tells them it's cool because they have basically a fifth limb. So even if they wanted to remove their tails, Goku and Raditz would convince them not to. Goten bails on being the same man pretty quickly, especially because someone's trying to figure out who they are, and that's Fidel. The second she's on their trail, Goten stops it because he doesn't want to be found out. But Gohan continues, and he's found out pretty easily, especially with the whole tail thing. She is still a vigilante here, because despite Mr. Satan never becoming a world hero, 
he's still widely loved and she's still gonna be prominent. Gohan is a bit bummed out because this means he's probably gonna be pretty obvious as Saiyaman unless he figures something else out. And also, his brother bailed on it. It was nice having a Saiyaman do it. This also leads to Gohan training with Dell because she wants to learn how to fly. And Goten's not gonna help it either because first of all, he still doesn't want to be found out as the Saiyaman. She'll probably put two and two together soon enough, but if he's seen near her, then she'll be able to quickly figure out who the second one was. Although she already suspects it's Goten, it was pretty obvious. Also, Goten thinks she's insane because she was stalking them, basically. Gohan tells him she's not that bad, but Goten mentions the fact that she was chasing them down every day and basically attacked them to get their identity. She kind of scares him, so Goten isn't involved in their training at all and that gives them alone time. And as for Goten, since we did this in the original version of this story, we'll say maybe he has a thing for Eraser. In the actual main story too, she was probably even flirting with Gohan, so she probably would try the same with Goten. And unlike Gohan and Videl, the relationship starting between Goten and Eraser is a lot more normal, whereas Gohan and Videl are basically fighting each other and flying. Weird, but Gohan likes it. And that finally brings us to the end of the time skip. With the World Tournament coming up, of course Gohan and Goten are going to enter. Videl encourages Gohan to, and of course Goku's going to do the same. While Eraser says Goten should join to try to win the prize, but Goten never really needed convincing. He thinks it's a cool opportunity for him to show off. Imagine getting the glory of someone like Mr. Satan. That could be pretty cool. And also, the prize money. Gohan honestly doesn't care about either of those. Although, Chi-Chi makes him care about the prize money. He just thinks it'll be a fun opportunity. In preparation for the tournament, Vegeta does his own intense training because he's going to join too. He's not even training with Trunks because there's someone else at Capsule Corp that's going to do a good job at training him. That's Android 16, who's basically a guard at Capsule Corp at this point. Him working with Gohan and Goten went well, so he's going to be a nice way for Trunks to grow stronger too. Not like he really needs it though, because he's going to be in the junior division, and obviously he's going to win with ease. And of course, Rat is going to join the tournament too. It basically sounds like a fun party if anything. They're going to be cheering on people beating each other up. That's basically what he does at his bar crawls every night. But this time, it's socially acceptable to beat those people up. And of course, there's the fact that him being a Saiyan means that he doesn't want to fight in general. And it sounds like a perfect thing for him. He's also glad to see that his nephews have girlfriends too. And he says if one of the kids ends up fighting him, he'll throw the match so they can impress their girlfriends. Even though they all know Raditz wouldn't have won anyways. But of course, this isn't going to be a normal tournament. And the matchups are different too. The first one is actually Krillin versus Yamu. Now, this isn't going to be a hard fight for Krillin at all, but he can easily see something strange about this guy. Yamu even also has Spopovich try to take his energy, but they don't do it. They're going to wait for a bigger prize. Yamu's a little angered that he's fighting this early on in the tournament, because it would be better if he was fighting someone that they could steal more energy from. Krillin could be a good target, but Spopovich tells him to wait. There's bigger ones coming up. But Krillin's immediately suspicious of these two, especially with those weird tattoos on their head. These two just seem kind of off. The next fight is Piccolo versus Shin, but it's kind of unfair to call that a fight because that goes pretty much like normal where Piccolo just bails. And obviously with Piccolo merging with Kami and having a bunch of new knowledge from Namek, he's very easily able to tell who Shin and Kibito are. And he tells the others too. The third fight is equally strange. It's Spopovich versus Raditz, and Raditz is ready for a pretty easy fight. It's kind of a shame that he's up against a regular human in the first match, but that means he's gonna get an easy ticket to the next round too. And with the way the tournament's set up, Gohan's fighting Kibito next, so Raditz will probably fight Gohan soon enough. He's pretty hyped up and takes this pretty casually. Even though he did promise Gohan he'd throw the match against him, Raditz tries to hold back his power because he is fighting a regular person after all. But he comes to see that Spobovich is a lot faster and stronger than a normal person. Now, he's not as strong as any of the humans that they work alongside, not by a long shot. But then he could also see this guy could fly too. So this guy actually knows how to use ki. That's pretty rare for a normal Earthling. But Spobovich tells Raditz to not hold back. He doesn't know what power he is holding back, but he wants Raditz to show off his full strength, basically taunting him and trying to make him angry. And you know, just for fun, Raditz should try to scare this guy. So for a brief moment, he transforms, just to make him quake in fear. And Spobovich didn't know what he was expecting. Raditz shows off his full power as a Super Saiyan too. He says he could tell that this guy could probably sense Ki as well, so he should sense the great increase in power here. This should be enough for Spobovich to realize who he's dealing with and to stop being so cocky. Raditz lifts a single finger up, ready to knock Spobovich out just with that. But as he lifts up his hand, it's frozen, and the rest of him's frozen too. He's just stuck there midair. What is this? Is this some sort of ability that Spopovich is using? Shin and Kibito are using their powers to paralyze him. Both combine because it's kind of hard to hold him back. Spopovich yells out to Yamu, who jumps in and tries to steal energy from Raditz. Raditz powers up even more just to try and escape this, but nothing works. His energy is drained, and he falls to the ground with Spopovich and Yamu escaping. Goku immediately goes over to Raditz, telling him he'll get a Senzu. He just has to go to the lookout first, but tells Raditz to hang on. But Kibito actually steps up and heals him. And before the Kais can even say what they're up to, Raditz immediately launches up into the sky, powers up into Super Saiyan 2, and flies off to chase them. The Kais tell the others to follow. And they have to explain kind of quickly. And when they hear the Kais' plan, Goten turns over to Gohan and whispers. He thinks their plan's kind of stupid. And yeah, Gohan kind of agrees. Apparently Piccolo said these gods are so far above anything they can even comprehend. But that was their plan? And Gohan wonders how Raditz is going to react to this. Won't he be pretty pissed when he finds out what happened? Eh, Goten says it's not their problem. 
but they're gonna probably have to stop Raditz from manhandling the Kais. Far away from the rest of the group, Raditz has already caught up to Spopovich and Yamu, and immediately when he's behind them, he grabs onto one of them with each hand, rocketing into the ground below with them. He asks them what they are doing and who they are, and how they even paralyzed him, and why. He's fuming. He's so angry that he transformed into Super Saiyan 2 on accident. He didn't even mean to do this. The two don't talk, but Raditz tries to make them talk. Although he finds out that they weren't the ones to paralyze him, someone else did. That means it was someone at the tournament doing so. And then suddenly, Spopovich starts inflating and then explodes, knocking Raditz back, leaving him confused and a bit disgusted because he was holding on to Spopovich when that happened. And that thing Yamu was holding in his hands is taken by someone else who was teleported over there. There's a tall pink man in blue standing there. Deborah was teleported over by Bobbity. They expected the others to come to the ship instead, but Bobbity was watching Spopovich and Yamu, and he saw that they were attacked by Raditz. So Deborah now has to go over there and retrieve the energy that they took. Bobbity then quickly teleports in too, taking the energy for himself and then going back to his ship, leaving Deborah alone to fight Raditz. Raditz has no clue who this guy is or why he's fighting him, but he's gonna kill him too. He can tell by this guy's presence alone. He's bad news. And he actually does stand a good chance against Deborah here, but unfortunately he doesn't know about Deborah's spit. So he's turned into stone, but right as this happens, the others arrive. And thankfully with Deborah being so preoccupied with Raditz, he didn't even realize they were there. Piccolo immediately launches in, knowing to avoid a spit, but it looks like Raditz of course didn't know. But with the new powers Piccolo's gained, he should be more than enough to fight Deborah as well. And unlike Raditz, he actually knows about the spit. Piccolo tells the others to go find Bobbity. He should be close by. But Shin warns Piccolo, don't use too much energy here. Whatever he uses against Deborah will probably be sent back to Bobbity. And Piccolo tells them not to worry. He could finish this off quickly. The rest of the group does end up finding Bobbity's ship. And by the time they do so, they sense a small power spike nearby that then disappears. And right as they're about to enter, Piccolo rejoins the group. Like he said, Deborah wasn't too big of an issue and Raditz flies in alongside them. He tries to warn everyone too, saying that there might have been someone at the tournament working with Bobbity. Piccolo caught him up to speed, but he mentioned that someone at the tournament paralyzed him to steal his energy. Shouldn't someone go back there and make sure the others are safe? Also, on top of that, that would mean that someone's probably there trying to steal more energy. They should really go back and figure that out. But Raditz then learns of who was actually the one to paralyze him. It was the Supreme Kai's that did it? What a ridiculous plan. So, they basically used him as bait. Used him to just find Bobbity. Besides him thinking the plan's really stupid, he's also angered that they just used him in this way. He doesn't really like the Kais too much, and this anger sticks with Raditz. Thankfully he doesn't act on it right now, especially because Goku tries to calm him down. But Gohan and Goten know that this might lead to something worse. Of course, Raditz is way more chill than he was when he first got on Earth, but when he gets angry, he gets really angry and he does hold grudges. The group at Bobbity's ship right now is as follows. It's obviously Goku, Gohan, and Goten, with Raditz, Piccolo, Vegeta, and Krillin. And it doesn't seem like there's too many other people inside the ship. Bobbity's pretty happy because he got a lot of energy from Raditz. It's over half the amount that he needed. But it still might not be enough. Raditz was a great target for the energy, but he wonders if they could have waited for someone stronger. He doesn't know the full extent of everyone else's power, but as he's looking around and observing the people there, he can see that Goku, Gohan, and Goten might have even more power locked away. Maybe even that Namekian too. Those idiots were too hasty. If they got energy from one of those other people, he probably would be really close to reviving Boo. Because with the extra energy he got from Deborah, now he's at about 70% of the power that he needs for Boo but he still does need a little bit more. And it's not like Pui Pui or Yakon are gonna get enough because they're easily defeated too. But he just needs a little bit more energy and he has a really good idea. As he looks at the rest of the group too, he sees that there's two targets there that could become minions for him, which is even better because he just needed one. But now that he looks around, he sees Vegeta might be corruptible. He might be able to make him a minion, but also there's Raditz. Bobbity could sense the anger within him and that puts him in a fragile state. Now for Vegeta, it might be a bit tougher because he's gonna need Vegeta to willingly surrender. And for Raditz, that would make it easier too, but since Raditz is so angry right now, all Bobbity needs to do is add fuel to the fire, and Raditz will easily turn to him. As the group gets closer and closer to Bobbity, he starts working his magic, trying to take over the minds of Vegeta and of Raditz. Bobbity's able to make a breakthrough, and he has the perfect plan. If he's able to execute this quickly enough, he'll be able to win here. He'll get more than enough energy for Boo, and of course he avoids being immediately killed by everyone. The minds of Vegeta and Raditz seem corruptible, so first, he works on a Vegeta, who's definitely going to be the easier of the two. Raditz will be a little bit tougher, but seeing Vegeta transform, that might be just enough to make Raditz more vulnerable. Vegeta's the first to go Majin, shocking everyone and even angering Raditz a little bit more, which leads a perfect opening for Bobbity, who then possesses Raditz as well. Whereas Vegeta might have gave in kind of willingly, Raditz on the other hand was vulnerable. He was angered at the Kais and Vegeta. He normally wouldn't do this, but given the circumstances, Bobbity was actually able to take over his mind, and it wasn't really willingly. Although there is a little bit of that willingness in there, but it's not to the extent of Vegeta's. And Bobbity is ecstatic. This worked exactly how he wanted it. This helps him twofold. For one, this means more energy for Boo. But also, it's a perfect distraction. Having two Majin servants fighting each other, he can collect energy and keep everyone occupied. Vegeta and Raditz both want to fight each other. 
Vegeta still holds a huge grudge against Raditz. While he has a cool down, it's been there in the background. There's always been tension and animosity between the two. And as for Raditz, he's volatile right now, mainly thanks to his temper becoming more prevalent here. There's been a lot of things to piss him off today, and some of them are rightfully so. Vegeta will settle the score with Kakarot too later. First, he's gonna beat Raditz. The two begin fighting each other. Of course, Goku immediately jumps in to try and stop it, knowing that's probably gonna go too far, and because Shin mentioned it's only gonna lend Bobbity more energy. But also, Shin's kind of in danger here, mainly because of Raditz. Same for Kibito too. Goku says he's gonna try and protect those two. He tells Piccolo he should go to find Bobbity. He'll be able to actually stop him. Piccolo has more than enough power, and he has knowledge of magic too. Piccolo, of course, is concerned, but he decides to go. And while Goku's busy making sure Shin and Kibito don't die, Gohan and Goten are actually gonna be the ones fighting. He knows they're stronger than him, and actually stronger than anyone here. Vegeta and Raditz got a boost in power, but Goku still believes that they'll be able to defeat them individually. Even with that boost in power that they've gotten, the twins can stop these two. Gohan goes to fight Raditz, and Goten goes to fight Vegeta. Although the first thing is actually splitting the two of them up, because right now it's more of a 2v1v1. They need it to just be two 1v1s. For Gohan, it's a little bit of an easier battle. He and Goten are equal in strength, but it's easier because Raditz is actually kind of holding himself back here, trying to break free from Bobbity's spell. And also, he doesn't want to hurt Gohan. But at the same time, Vegeta's antagonizing everyone, so he has to try and fight him too. And Goten's giving his everything to stop Vegeta. Unlike Raditz, Vegeta isn't holding anything back. And he's going to do anything to stop fighting Goten and kill Raditz instead. And Goten's kind of annoying him too, especially because he sees no way to defeat him. Although, he has one idea to get him off his back. Now, this isn't a weak point necessarily, but Vegeta could go after this and probably take Goten out of the battle for a bit. Amidst the fight, he's able to grab onto Goten's tail, charging all of his energy into it, and Goten thinks that Vegeta's trying to paralyze him. But he's trained his tail, so that's not going to work. But to his surprise, Vegeta then yanks the tail clean off. And while that's not a weak point anymore, ripping it off definitely is going to hurt. It's dismembering a limb. Goten didn't expect him to do that, and this actually does cause a lot of pain. And immediately as he hears Goten yell out, Gohan looks over and realizes what happened. Angered beyond belief at seeing Goten hurt like that, his key flares up and he launches over at Vegeta. And in a blind fit of rage, he attacks with all his power, hitting Vegeta clean in the face with a full power punch, knocking him out with no effort. Goten was just about to hop back in the fight and do the same thing, but Gohan already accomplished it. And Goku's pretty surprised. He hasn't seen that in a while, but at least they were in their right to do so. Vegeta obviously went too far. And Goten's pretty bummed because now his tail might not grow back at all. But at least it was that and not his arms or legs. Meanwhile, Piccolo continues his search for Bobbity. He makes his way through and once he's at the bottom, he sees that Bobbity's not there anymore. He's teleported himself out, alongside Buzek, but he can't be too far. He's hiding somewhere. Piccolo launches out of the ship, destroying it in the process. He looks around from where he is, but decides to get a better view, teleporting up to the lookout. As Kami here, it's a nice little ability to have. So he gets up there instantly, getting a perfect view and immediately locating Bobbity, then teleporting right to him. Of course, the second he shows up, Bobbity cowers in fear, putting himself in a bubble and then trying to take over Piccolo's mind too. And Piccolo simply punches right through Bobbity's barrier. He's a lot stronger than Bobbity realizes. And not just physically, mentally too. Bobbity must be mistaking him for the Demon King. He's not that same person anymore. Unlike those two Saiyans, Bobbity's gonna have no shot at taking over Piccolo's mind. His mind is still far too calm and fortified for that. And Piccolo's able to kill Bobbity. It seems like this is all over. But back at the battlefield, Shin is kinda worried. That power that they all used in that battle, it might have actually been enough to revive Boo. Raditz falls to the ground and then grabs his head, going back into base, and as he gets up, that M on his head is gone. Vegeta's nearby and unconscious, and that M on his forehead disappears too. Raditz says that he feels normal again, and he apologizes, but thankfully, he wasn't the one causing the most issues. Well, that's good. This means Bobbity's dead then, right? So they shouldn't have to worry anymore. But Piccolo then teleports over to everybody, with a serious look on his face. He killed Bobbity, but while he was over there, he saw Buzek. I wanted to get as far away as possible. The meter on it was just about to tip over to full. The ground starts rumbling around them. They all immediately feel a dark presence. In the distance, there's a pillar of steam, and they could see something materializing in the air. It's Majin Buu, aimless without Bobbity. And not sure of where to go, he just goes over to where he could sense people. Darting across the wasteland, plowing through anything in his way, and he arrives where the rest of the group is. A fight breaks out between them and Boo, and thankfully with all the people here, they actually might be able to push him back a bit. Now they're not going to be able to outright defeat him. There's four Super Saiyan 2s here, there's Piccolo who's stronger than normal, and once Vegeta wakes up again too, there's going to be a fifth Super Saiyan 2. Kibito has also healed everyone too. But the thing is, they don't know who they're dealing with. They are able to destroy Boo at first, actually a couple times because he keeps regenerating. They have the power to defeat Boo collectively, but they don't know how to defeat Boo is the issue. So they come close to winning here, but they don't win. It's not close enough. By around the third time Boo is completely destroyed, he starts to get a bit hungry too. And surprisingly, he just leaves the battle. He tried to turn some of them into candies, but couldn't. So he wants to go to a nearby city and get some food, or turn the people there into food. He's already a bit annoyed at these people destroying him, but this will calm him down. Although, they don't let him leave. The group continuously tries to fight Boo, which keeps him away from his food. 
Boo progressively gets more annoyed and more hungry, and he's starting to get agitated. The group thinks that with one final push, they could actually defeat Boo here and now. They're just about ready to. But a strange thing happens during the battle. Boo tries to unleash all his power for an attack, basically blowing himself up, which does an incredible amount of damage, but everyone's able to survive it, barely being able to avoid the attack. Now, of course, Boo does regenerate from this, but after exploding, he doesn't look as mad anymore. That attack he just did was out of anger, but it wasn't just a normal attack. Amidst this blast, he also accidentally expelled all the evil out of himself. Being somewhat angry at everyone before, and by drawing out all this power in this attack, that anger did boil over a bit. Standing before them are two Boos. Now this seems good for the group because that means Boo's power has to be split. They could just defeat these two Boos and they'll be done with it. Although, while they did avoid that blast, they still were hurt a bit by it. It was pretty massive and they couldn't get out of the way in time completely. So that slows them down a bit, and on top of that, pretty much immediately after splitting, Evil and Good Boo start fighting. And much to everyone's surprise, this quickly leads to Evil Boo absorbing Good Boo, giving birth to Super Boo. Great, he's transformed again? Well, again, now they know how to fight this guy. Plus, with how long this battle has gone on, maybe there's a way to channel all their power together. Goku even thinks that if Gohan and Goten show that same rage boost that they had before, that will significantly turn the tides. Obviously by now, the twins have learned to control their anger and channel it into their power too. But there are rare moments where it goes out of control. Like for example, what happened with Gohan when he saw Goten was hurt. And they are still able to control themselves, but in those moments of rage, they get more power than they usually have. Boo then suddenly splits himself into multiple pieces, each forming into their own Boo. They glare at the group, and then one of the Boos teleports near them, grabbing right onto Shin and Kibito. And without hesitation, Boo kills the two Kais. Another Boo grabs onto Goku, launching a powerful attack, which isn't enough to kill Goku, but it does severely injure him. And another one aims his attack at Gohan. He basically did choose his other two targets at random, but he wanted to go after the Supreme Kais. By now, he's obviously noticed that the Kais were healing everybody, and he couldn't let that continue happening. Goku and Gohan say they're fine. Piccolo says he'll get some Senzu beans. He teleports away to the lookout. As Vegeta, Raditz, and Goten have to fight together, Gohan and Goku do try to get back up, but they did take a lot of damage from Boo. He seems more intelligent than he was before. They didn't expect that. As Gohan and Goku lay there, they look over at the crater where the Kais are once standing. There's no trace of Shin, but Kibito's still there. Shin was unfortunately completely wiped away. But Kibito's body is there. And Goku can't really tell, but he feels a slight presence from where Kibito's body is. Is there a chance he's still alive? While the others are holding Boo off, of course there's not really too much they can do, but Boo is getting kind of bored. And he still does want his food, so he wants to wrap this up pretty quickly. But now that he's easily fending everyone off, it shouldn't be too hard to get some food. And even better, he has some perfect targets lying right there. He sticks out a hand and with one blast, he knocks Goten, Raditz, and Vegeta away, launching them miles over the horizon. Boo turns over to Gohan and Goku, giving them a sinister glare followed by a grin. Boo's antenna then darts forward, a candy bean. It's aimed at Gohan, but Goku's barely able to put enough power into a blast to launch himself in front of it, with Goku turning into a cookie as Boo walks over, simply stretching a hand out and with one bite, eating Goku. Gohan's paralyzed with fear and anger for a second, and despite his injuries, a fierce golden aura surrounds him. He powers back up into Super Saiyan 2, even stronger than before, standing back up, fueled by his rage. And in one final stand, being pushed solely by that anger, he tries to fight back against Boo. And Boo knows that he has grown stronger. It's impressive to see this. Had he showcased this before, maybe Boo would have lost. But Boo tells him it's unfortunately too late, charging Ki around his hand and piercing it right through Gohan, just to stop him in his tracks. He needs Gohan to stand still before he turns him into candy. Gohan falls back to the ground, trying to get back up to fight again. He has one last moment to make a choice here so he uses this time wisely. He locates Goten's energy, and tries to speak with him telepathically. He tells Goten, get off this planet, it's their only shot at surviving. He tells Goten that Boo killed Goku, and likely, he's next. But he warns Goten, don't attack Boo. He needs to play it safe for now and wait. What is he saying? He just wants him to leave Earth? How is that even possible? But he tells Goten it'll be fine. He knows that Goten can do it, especially with the help of Raditz and Vegeta, they might be able to win here. Plus, they still have Piccolo, and maybe even Kibito. Shin and Kibito got here somehow, so they must have a spaceship or something, or maybe they could even teleport to different planets. Plus, with Piccolo still alive, they have Dragon Balls. So as long as Piccolo and Raditz don't die, everyone can be revived here, since Raditz has already been revived once. But he needs to do everything in his power to stop this. He's trying to give Goten some sort of hope, and also keep him calm despite knowing that his father and brother just died. But Goten tells Gohan to not say that, just hold out for a bit longer. He'll save Gohan too, but this time, there's no response. Gohan goes completely unconscious, then turned into food by Boo, eaten by him as well. Goten asks if the other two could sense his ki, but Vegeta and Raditz don't sense anything. Piccolo then teleports over to the area, looking deeply concerned. He did get Senzu beans, but it seems like it was too late. He even could have used some of his power to heal Goku and Gohan, but it would have taken far too long compared to the Kais. He isn't too practiced with healing yet, despite having that ability. And besides, he knew he needed to survive to keep the Dragon Balls intact. He saw everything from up there. And as much as he wanted to save Gohan and Goku, he knew he couldn't be rash and go in and save them. 
he would have died and the entire Earth would have been gone. As Guardian, his priorities have to be different here. But with the other three around him, he thinks they could stop this. Plus, they have the Senzus now. Although, he knows that nothing they could do at the moment will stop Boo. He just hopes Goten and Raditz can keep a clear head right now. Raditz does try to keep a cool exterior, making himself look confident. He even pulls out a cigar from his pocket, trying to save face for the sake of Goten. But Piccolo can easily tell that Raditz is faking it. And looking into his mind, he could feel intense anger and regret from Raditz. Anger at himself for becoming a Majin. Anger at his brother and nephew dying. And regret for not being able to save them. Goten also says nothing, but has a serious look on his face. Surprisingly looking calm. Honestly, right now, he feels anything but calm. Although he tells Piccolo, teleport them back over to where Boo is. They're not going to fight. They're going to get Kibito. What does he mean? The Kai's died. But no, Goten explains what Gohan told him. Piccolo tells them to wait here a second. As quickly as he can, he teleports there, immediately grabbing Kibito and teleporting away. Boo senses Piccolo arrive for a second, but can't attack in time. And Piccolo could see. Yeah, he still does seem alive. He tries to use his own healing power just to save the Senzus, because they don't know if they'll need them in an actual battle. And surprisingly, he is able to revive Kibito. Piccolo quickly teleports all of them up to the lookout. He says they have no choice. They're gonna have to leave the planet somehow, and he hopes Kibito can get them off here. And Kibito says he can, but are they sure they want to do this? There's no other choice. Goten doesn't like it either. He's gonna have to leave his friends, his family, his girlfriend behind. Vegeta has to leave his family behind too. But it's just like Piccolo was saying before. It's a risk. A big risk. And it's a big sacrifice too. But it's their only shot at winning this. Reluctantly, they all leave Earth. With Kibito taking them to the sacred world of Kai. He doesn't know what they're gonna do here, but maybe they can at least train a bit. Try and figure out a new way to win. And Piccolo does have one idea, although he's not sure it's going to work. He remembers Mori was able to do this, and he said the previous Elder could too. Now with the power to make Dragon Balls, Piccolo has other powers, such as the healing that he just used. So maybe he could draw out everyone's power. He's not sure if it will work, but he could at least try it. And if not, maybe Shenron could help. Sure, they don't have the Dragon Balls here, but Piccolo could try and get them. Or even create a new Shenron if need be. They're still not sure what exactly to do yet, they just needed to escape. At least they have a few options though. But Piccolo starts thinking of what to do and he might have some ideas, as does Kibito. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Boo begins his rampage, turning everyone he can into candy. But while on this rampage, he feels something strange within him, and he starts morphing into something else. Unknowingly, when he ate Goku and Gohan, he didn't just turn them into food. They weren't just helping his appetite. He begins manifesting their power, and turning into something else completely. Back on Earth, Boo fully manifests the power of Goku and Gohan. He could feel it coursing through him. He's so much stronger than he could have ever expected, and he didn't realize this would happen anyways. Plus, he has the combined intelligence of both of them too. He knows those other warriors will probably return soon enough. He can't destroy Earth just yet. But that doesn't mean he can't go around eating people. On the sacred world of Kai's, Piccolo tries something out that he hasn't really done before. He remembers Mori tried to do this to him, and Piccolo should have the same ability. Given the differences in his powers now, he may have the ability to draw up potential from people. Even if it's only minimal, he could try that here and that should give them enough power, especially with someone like Goten. Vegeta and Raditz sit there in silence. Raditz is ashamed that he let this happen too, with Vegeta also realizing it's mostly his fault, although he wonders if Raditz willingly surrendered too. But that doesn't matter now. What matters is actually stopping Boo. Goten's the one who should be mad at them, but he's the one who tells them to focus. They're the last strong warriors left. I may have forgot to mention that Krillin's with them too. And he of course is going to try to strategize a plan too. He asks Piccolo if he can unlock everyone's potential because if everyone grows stronger, then they should be more than enough to defeat Boo. But Piccolo doesn't even know if he can do it yet. Mori could barely do it, and he was an actual elder. Apparently, it's an ability that older Namekians manifest. He tries unlocking Goten's power first, but nothing actually works. He is able to draw out a little bit of power, but that's really it. This is all that he's capable of right now. But as he tries focusing, he feels a change within himself and in Goten. He's able to draw out a little bit more power. And Goten does feel an increase in strength, but clearly this isn't going to be enough to defeat Boo. He tries the same on Raditz, Vegeta, and Krillin. And while Piccolo tries to unlock their potential, Kibito says there's one thing that they could try and do, but it's a long shot. Pointing out the Z-Sword, although he doesn't take this lightly at all. Goten goes to try and pull the Z-Sword out, and pretty much in one try, he's actually able to. Even without Piccolo unlocking some of his potential, he might have been able to do so regardless. But surprisingly enough, he pulls the Z-Sword from the stone. It's pretty heavy and he tries swinging it. Kibito claims that this will be able to defeat Boo. Thankfully on Earth, Boo isn't making haste with anything. It seems like he's just traveling the globe, trying out different kinds of foods from everywhere on Earth. And immediately after trying them, everyone near him gets turned into food. It's a bad situation, but thankfully he's preoccupied, and they still do have the Dragon Balls back on Earth. With Piccolo still alive too, they'll be able to revive everyone. As long as Boo doesn't destroy Earth or kill Piccolo, this could be reversed. Piccolo hates watching this though. He is Kami after all. He can't stand to watch Earth be destroyed like this, even though he knows it's just a temporary setback. As Piccolo's busy watching over Earth, he hears a powerful crack behind him, and he barely dodges in time as part of the Z-Sword flies past his head. He looks back to see Goten, Raditz, and Vegeta looking over the Z-Sword, now broken in half. 
with a block of Kachin on the ground as well. Kabito didn't think that would happen. And there goes their last chance to defeating Boo. That was supposed to work, but it couldn't even cut through some Kachin. But then Piccolo notices an odd presence nearby. Seemingly out of nowhere, another Kai appears on the planet. It's Elder Kai, and he makes his introduction to everybody. He does say this group is powerful, but doesn't know if they could defeat Boo as is right now. And Piccolo says it's like he thought. Even after trying to awaken everyone's potential, it's still not enough. Awaken potential, huh? Elder Kai says he could do the exact same thing. And no offense to Piccolo, but it's probably more effective than whatever technique he used. Although, it is going to take some time. About a day or so. Piccolo's not sure if they have that kind of time, though. Boo is quickly making his way around Earth. Only a few hours have passed, and pretty much half of Earth's population is gone. By the time that ritual is done for one of these people, Earth will probably be gone already. But Vegeta steps in. He has a good idea. He has Piccolo. Can he see if the lookout is still intact? And as Piccolo looks down on Earth, he sees that, yeah, it is. Vegeta says it's simple then. Elder Kai can awaken the potential of everybody. They just need to go into the room of spirit and time. That's right. Piccolo didn't even think about that. That way they'd have more than enough time to do so. Elder Kai's not really too fond of going to Earth right now, especially with it being a war zone, and he shouldn't really be getting involved in this regardless. But the fate of the entire universe is at stake, so he goes along. They teleport to the lookout, and all of them enter the Room of Spirit and Time. But of course, right as they enter the Room of Spirit and Time, Boo senses that they're back on Earth. So, he decides to go to the lookout too. And pretty quickly, he's able to get up there. But weirdly enough, he can't sense anyone anymore. Did they come here for a second and just leave? No, they have to be here somewhere. And then it hits him. He knows where they are. He has the knowledge of Goku and Gohan after all, so he knows of the Room of Spirit and Time. They're probably in there. They're probably trying to get some training in to fight him. And they're being sneaky about it. He honestly doesn't know how to feel about that. Part of him wants to fight them at their strongest, but also at the same time, he knows that's way too risky. He stands in front of the door to the time chamber, charging a blast, ready to blow up the door so they're trapped in there. But right when he tries to launch the blast, someone kicks him in the face, and then a powerful blast hits him from above, driving him right through the lookout. It doesn't hurt him a lot, but he is a bit angered at the sneak attack, and as he flies back up there, he sees two people waiting for him. A large man with orange hair, and a small nervous looking kid. Trunk sends Piccolo and Goten up here for a brief moment, and he doesn't know where they went, but he put two and two together and quickly realized that they're in the room that Boo tried to destroy. And Android 16's with him. That explains why Boo couldn't sense them. Trunks' power was too low to sense, and Android 16 had no power to sense. Thankfully, Trunks and 16 were able to protect a lot of their friends. They have no clue where everyone else went. But in their eyes, they're the last defense force for Earth. But Boo kind of laughs this off. There's no way that robot's going to be able to beat him. And Android 16 says that's not the plan. He just needs to buy enough time for them so they could do whatever they're planning. Trunks powers up in his Super Saiyan, ready to fight as well. He tells Boo that his mom's upgraded 16 a bunch. He's basically a completely different android. 16 rockets in towards Boo, tackling him right off the lookout as Trunks follows. Boo is actually kind of impressed. He didn't think an android would be that powerful, but now he remembers from Goku and Gohan's memories. Yeah, that's the one working with Capsule Corp. Apparently he was the one who helped train Gohan and Goten too. This android might be more than he expected, but Boo also realizes, if they're working this hard to protect the others in the Room of Spirit and Time, they must have a really good plan in mind. Of course, fighting Trunks in 16 is no big issue for him, but 16, he has infinite stamina. All of his attacks are at 100% power, he doesn't get worn out. And Boo even realizes during the fight that he has some sort of regeneration. It seems he has nanotechnology within him. As long as he's not completely destroyed, the parts within him are able to connect back together again. It's a bit slow, and it's not as good as Boo's regeneration by any means. It's also completely mechanical, but 16 says this will be enough to hold off Boo. Especially because unlike the other fighters, he doesn't feel pain. He could do this for as long as he wants. But Boo is done being played around with. If they're going to continue getting in his way, he'll just kill them on the spot. And he gets ready to do exactly that. He rips off pieces of himself, wrapping them around 16 in trunks. This is the end for them. But for some reason, Trunks looks happy. Actually, determined if anything. And then 16 can see exactly why he's feeling that way. Someone rockets over to Boo, blasting a hole right in his side that cuts through him, telling Boo to stay away from Trunks. It's Vegeta. Although, weirdly enough, it looks like he's in his base form. Why does Vegeta feel stronger than before, though? And then another attack hits him. It's from Raditz. An arm stretches out to grab him. It's Piccolo's arm. How dare he destroy the lookout like that? Raditz and Goten then fly down from the sky together, each with a leg extended, landing a simultaneous kick on Boo. That's not Boo's power that he's using. That's the power of Goku and Gohan. But he won't have their power for much longer. And as Boo looks around at everyone, they all appear to be in their base form. Piccolo looks slightly different, but not too different. And he notices something weird with Goten. His hair is black as if he were in base, but his eyes, they have a fierce yellow glow in them. Piccolo says thanks to Android 16 and Trunks, they were able to get their potentials awakened by Elder Kai. But Raditz notes, it looks like Boo pissed Goten off a little bit too much. Something about his ultimate form is different. He feels the ferocity of a great ape within him. And somehow it's manifesting through his ultimate form too. It seems like he got a greater boost than anyone else there. Boo tells him to stop being so confident. No boost in power will be able to defeat him, and even if that's the case, he can just absorb them. It's really easy. 
Radis takes out a cigar, lighting it with some key from the tip of his finger. Taking a hit from it, he smiles. This fight's gonna be pretty fun. And he retreats for a bit, charging his ultimate attack. Vegeta, Piccolo, and Goten attack together, completely overwhelming Boo. And Boo could sense the bloodlust from Goten, that anger that Gohan displayed before. He has the same thing. And Vegeta says it's quite impressive, actually. The fact that he's able to manifest great apes still. It's not something that he, Raditz, or even Kakarot could do. And from above, two powerful and sharp key blasts fly past Boo. Neither of them hit him, though. But that's not the point. Raditz is there above them all, clearly putting a lot of energy into this attack. This is his new ultimate move, also named after calendar terms just like his other ones. Fortnite Flash. He then swings his arms into the opposite direction, with each blast slicing Boo. He then swipes the arms around, continuing to do this from above, cutting Boo into more and more pieces. Piccolo and Vegeta then throw a bunch of key blasts around him, with Piccolo using a Hellzone grenade and Vegeta just following his lead. As Boo continues to be sliced apart by Raditz, the blasts all draw inward, and Goten floats nearby, quickly charging a Kamehameha. As the Hellzone grenade connects together, Goten launched his blast too, and together, they completely kill Boo. Now, they don't really know how to feel about this because they accidentally did just kill Goku and Gohan, probably. They don't know if the two of them were even still alive, but it might have been worth it to check out. They assume that they died when Boo absorbed them as candy, but maybe they were alive in there somehow. But it's fine. Piccolo was able to gather the Dragon Balls and restore all the damage done by Boo, as well as reviving everyone killed by him. Elder Kai doesn't really like this either, but he's glad he could at least help them save Earth and the universe as a whole. Goku and Gohan are told about everything when they return. They still can't believe the group was able to pull it off. Goku says they truly are amazing fighters. And Gohan wants to see the new power that Goten unlocked. Everyone got their own ultimate form. And Goten goes into it, but he doesn't have those same yellow eyes as before. Vegeta and Raditz said he was manifesting the power of Great Ape somehow, while also using this form. And he's not even sure how he did it. It seems that he was just so angry with Goku and Gohan dying, that rage overcame him and manifested itself in that way. Even if he can't do it willingly, that's pretty impressive. He's basically accessing the power of Great Ape without a tail or without a moon in the sky. So even though Goten lost his tail, that's still pretty cool. Although now that Gohan's the only one with the tail, maybe he should revisit the Great Ape form. And it's a pretty happy celebration. Shin is brought back too. Glad to see that Kibito survived the route. But near where everyone regrouped, a large pillar of light descends from the sky. And a voice calls out Shin's name. Did he seriously just die for a bit? Shin and Kibito look terrified, and for some reason, even Raditz and Vegeta look scared. Piccolo doesn't know who these two are either, but he feels a deep sense of fear, just inherent to their presence. He asks Vegeta and Raditz what's happening, and they say that's the god of destruction, Beerus. When Shin died temporarily, Beerus died too, and it's not like he didn't know this. This, of course, did wake him up from his nap. And he's extremely mad right now, not just at the fact that he died, but more so the fact that his nap was disturbed. But then he hears what happened, and sees that these Earthlings were able to defeat Majin Buu somehow. And he was the one to kill the Supreme Kai, apparently. It's interesting to see that mortals are that strong, but Beerus doesn't even care about that right now. How was Buu revived in the first place? And how did they let Buu kill the Supreme Kai? Are they all incompetent? And as Beerus looks around, he then notices Vegeta and Raditz, as well as some other Saiyan-looking people there. He sees a Namekian there too, with a godly presence. And most importantly to him, he smells some delicious food nearby. You know, maybe he's willing to forgive this transgression. He's so mad that he could just blow up this planet as it is now. But maybe they could all show him some sort of value. Not only is he going to take some of their food, but he wants to fight them. He wants to see that strength that they showed off against Boo. If they really are that powerful, prove their worth. Beerus surprisingly does get some good fights here, but none of these people are near his level at all. Obviously, Beerus is here way earlier than normal, and he doesn't even have the Super Saiyan God in his mind yet. Even Piccolo, who knows some stuff about the Namekian Book of Legends, that's not like he studied that specifically either. Beerus is simply fighting people to see how strong they are, just to entertain himself. He's more so pissed at the Supreme Kai, and now that he's cooled down a bit, he probably shouldn't kill these Earthlings for Shin's stupidity. A few of these fighters seem really powerful. Their potential was awakened to fight against Boo, but one of them specifically draws his attention. The guardian of this planet, that Namekian. Beerus could feel a godly presence within him, and also he was the one responsible for reviving everybody because he created the Dragon Balls here. As he is right now, it seems like he's the strongest of the group. Although little does Beerus know, when Goten's mad, he's actually the strongest. But for the time being, Piccolo interests him. He's definitely going to keep an eye on this planet, especially now that he's tried out some food. He sees that it is worth something, although he doesn't know if it was worth dying for. But maybe he'll come back one day. He departs, along with the Kai's departing too. From beginning to end, that was pretty hectic. And now Beerus has an eye on Earth. Sometime not too long after, Beerus contacts Piccolo again, wondering what other dormant power he has. And just because Piccolo's terrified of Beerus, he goes to Beerus' planet just to fight him. Beerus seemingly wants Piccolo to train under Whis, so just to protect Earth, Piccolo's gonna do that. He doesn't know how mad this guy will get. It doesn't seem like he really has a choice, especially because this guy is technically his superior by a lot. So this arc wraps up pretty nicely for everybody. Although Vegeta, Raditz, and Goten are a bit disappointed. Vegeta and Raditz had to rely on some stupid magic to get stronger. Yeah, they're powerful now. And they did surpass Kakarot and Gohan, but they didn't do it in their own way. 
Although, Raditz kind of likes this. Whether or not he unlocked it himself, he's one of the strongest now, and it makes him really proud. But Goten's disappointed for a different reason. He's bummed that his tail won't grow back. Piccolo healed him, Kabito tried to heal him, but nothing seemed to work. If he took a Senzu bean sooner, he might have been able to grow his tail back, but they wanted to save the Senzu. Vegeta, Raditz, and Goku can clearly see that the tail's not going to grow back. Vegeta feels pretty guilty too because he was the one to cut it off. But seeing that power manifested through his anger, he wonders if they can get Goten to use that again. He's got to make it up to Goten somehow. So he and Raditz are going to try and work on it. Meanwhile, Gohan and Goku are kind of left in the dust. Goku, of course, is going to continue training in his own way, and he'll surpass them without having to use magic or whatever. Apparently, they had some sort of ritual to unlock their power, and it makes them really strong. Goku could do that for himself, but he doesn't really want to. He actually has a choice here. As for Gohan, he wonders if using Great Ape somehow will actually give him a new power. Well, there's only really one way to find out. Goten's working on a brand new power with it too, so maybe Gohan could work on something with it. He has no idea of what he's going to work on, but there's got to be something, right? Goten continues working with his new power, with Raditz and Vegeta trying to tap into the Great Ape side of it. Gohan of course joins in the training, but he's a bit bummed. He's left behind because he doesn't have that ultimate form, which is fine because he could work for something else. But still, that really set him and Goku back. They eventually figure out that Goten has the innate ability to go Great Ape while staying in his humanoid form. It must be because he grew up with his tail and mastered the Great Ape at such a young age. Plus, with his inherent rage, that draws the power out without him even realizing it. And despite still having his tail, Gohan's able to pull off the same thing. But it's a little different for him because he does have his tail. Now on the surface, they don't immediately notice yet. As far as they could tell, it grants a similar power. Goten's able to do it without Ultimate now, and then when they both do it at the same time, it essentially looks like the same form. But little do they realize they're going to be going down different paths. As for Goten, Ultimate awakens his potential. And on top of that, this wrathful form exists at a necessity for him. He doesn't have a tail, he can't go Great Ape. As for Gohan, he could still go Great Ape, and he doesn't have his ultimate form. His tail being there is going to affect some things. Goten's able to draw this power out while in ultimate, and it doesn't make a new form or anything, it's just that ultimate is significantly powered up and his eyes look yellow now. So, Gohan gets an idea from this. Okay, if he can combine the power with something else, maybe he can combine it with a power of his own. Yeah, ultimate's a completely different thing here. But what about Super Saiyan? Is there a way to combine the power with that? And after a lot of time searching for the way to do this, one day he stumbles upon it. He actually finds out how to do this. Although it awakens a strange new power for him, inadvertently awakening some of his own potential too. This form is also completely unheard of for everybody. Well, we know what it is. But this is the first time everyone else sees it. Raditz and Vegeta are completely astounded. They're speechless. This form, it's so primal. It's so Saiyan-like. Raditz thinks it's awesome. This is definitely a great display of his Saiyan pride. And Goku? Well, he's glad Gohan was able to unlock something of his own. Especially something that powerful. Goku wonders if he could ever do it, but he never got mastery over Great Ape, so it would be kind of tough for him. Maybe he could, but it's a completely different scenario for Gohan. And as far as they know, this might be completely unique to him due to him having the tail. Goku actually has discovered something of his own, but it's not really too much of use yet. He has tapped into Super Saiyan 3. And he's kind of working on that, but doesn't know what he could do with it. He was hoping Gohan might have been able to do something with it, but now he has this form. So, naturally that form is going to be called Super Saiyan 4, even though it's kind of a different route of power. But it fits their naming scheme so far, and that's what it is. It's Super Saiyan 4. A couple years pass now. We're past the point in the series where the original Battle of Gods happened. By now, Gohan and Videl are together, and they've had Pan. As for Goten, he and Erasa got married too. Both got married around the same time and celebrated together. I don't have a design for a kid between the two of them, because let's be honest, by the time the story ends, the kid's not really going to have too much relevance unless we went to GT. Although, if we did go into GT, maybe we will see something. I also don't like including OCs for no reason, especially like this where the character's not even going to do anything that's relevant to the story, but I think it's worth mentioning that they have a kid, and we'll say they have a son named Gomen. And that name didn't come out of nowhere, this was actually something that was suggested in Dragon Ball Super, with Chi-Chi being the one mentioning it. Obviously it goes along with the name puns of Goku, Gohan, and Goten. It literally is just Goten with one letter changed. And it also originates from the word noodles. So it's an easy name to include, it fits the naming scheme really well, and this name does have an official origin, because it was a name suggested by Chi-Chi for Gohan and Videl, before everyone knew they were having a girl and not a boy. So I think it's a pretty fitting name. Over this time too, Goku has tried to get to Beerus' planet. Same for Vegeta and Raditz. Now, for a while, Piccolo was the only one there, because Beerus was only really interested in him. But Beerus does return to Earth occasionally because of all the food there. And Piccolo does because he is Guardian, after all. He tries to convince Beerus to let them come to his planet, but Beerus doesn't let them. But Piccolo might have one idea. He wonders if maybe there's some sort of ancient power the Saiyans can unlock. He remembers studying part of the Namekian Book of Legends. This not only had legends for Namekians, but pretty much every species in Universe 7. So, what if there's legends about Saiyans? Not just Super Saiyan, something beyond that. It's kind of a long shot, but he's hoping that there's something in this book that'll let them attain a power that'll impress Beerus. He doubts it's gonna work, but he goes to Namek one day, and looks through the book. And, big shocker, there actually is something there. And it sounds exactly like something that Beerus would want. Piccolo goes back to Beerus and tells him about this, 
and Beerus immediately perks up, telling everyone they're going to Earth right now. Although there is a bit of an issue. There's a ritual for this power, which they don't really know how to feel about, especially Raditz and Vegeta who already got their power unlocked by Ultimate. But they're going to need to get the form somehow, so someone's going to need to do the ritual. And you know, as much as Goku doesn't like it either, he's going to be the one to do it because at least this lets him catch up to everyone else. Besides, this evens the playing field after all. All of them had a ritual done on them besides Gohan. Goku unfortunately has some sort of disadvantage right now. And hopefully this evens everything out. Little does he know though, this is going to be completely overpowered. He gets the Super Saiyan God form and it is amazing. Beerus is pretty impressed with it too. It's actually around where Piccolo currently is, because by now, Piccolo does have godly key. Thankfully, this is basically a ticket to Beerus' planet for Goku. Although for Raditz and Vegeta, they're going to be left kind of behind. Which is good, because they don't have to use the ritual to get the power, but at the same time they're going to have to actually work for it now, and prove that they can get it, which they don't know if they can. After a lot of pestering, eventually they all end up on Beerus' planet with Piccolo. But what about Gohan and Goten? Are they going to try and get the Super Saiyan God form? Well, not really. The two of them might not need it actually, especially if it's going to take all that time to work on it. Yeah, they could get the ritual done on them, but they already have their own different powers that they're working with and towards. The two of them have more potential than the pure Saiyans, so by default they are advantaged in that regard. Plus, it's better to work on their current forms instead of juggling new ones, because that way they're not going to master anything. They can grow in their own way. The two train a lot with each other, and with Android 16. With all his upgrades, he's the perfect training partner after all. Plus, they do work with Trunks occasionally, mainly teaching him rather than the other way around. One day they're with Android 16, and he notes something strange. The Dragon Balls are moving. Wait, what? How does he even know about that? Not the fact that he knows about the Dragon Balls, but the fact that he knows they're moving. Oh yeah, 16 has a Dragon Ball radar installed within him. And the only reason this is questionable for him is because he could also track a power far away on the other side of Earth. And not long after, they hear Piccolo talking in their heads. At least Gohan and Goten do, because he can't talk to a mechanical being like that. But they tell 16 what he said. Piccolo says that someone's going after the Dragon Balls and it appears to be the Frieza Force. They've been spying on Earth for a while, trying to figure out some way to strike back, and they learn of the Dragon Balls. Although, it looks like they're not really going to get far. Gohan, Goten, and Sixteen track them down, and stop them before they could use the Dragon Balls. They're not sure what they're going to use the Dragon Balls for, but they can kind of assume. Probably to revive Frieza, which isn't going to happen here. Frieza stays stuck in hell, continuing to mauled over being dead. This eventually leads us into the Universe X Tournament. The team here is a pretty simple one to make. Actually, they have too many people. By default, Beerus says that Piccolo is going to be on the team. Same goes for Goku. The two of them are stronger thanks to a jumpstart and godly train. Next, it'll be Vegeta and Raditz because by now, they do have access to godly powers too. As for the fifth fighter, well, it could really be anyone. Despite Goten having ultimate, Gohan's also growing at a considerable rate, especially with his brand new form, which seems to have its own potential unlocking abilities. Not to the level of ultimate, but enough to make a difference. The three pure Saiyans actually go in the room of spirit in time beforehand just to get ready. And as for Gohan and Goten, the two of them do rock, paper, scissors to decide who goes to the tournament. Gohan's the one who ends up on the team. Although, it doesn't really matter because the tournament's kind of a wash. Vegeta's actually the one to go up first. He eliminates Batamo, then Frost, then Mageta, then Kappa. Although Kappa does learn Super Saiyan from him. He just wiped out four members of the team and he's still going. And he hasn't even shown off his full power yet. Versus Hit though he does, showing off the brand new form, Super Saiyan Blue. This isn't exclusive to him. Raditz and Kakarot have it too, he says. But it should be enough to defeat Hit. But it's not. They learn of Hit's time skip abilities, and Vegeta does put up a good fight, but he doesn't end up winning. The next one up is Piccolo. Obviously the others were watching and they did figure out some of Hit's moves, with Goku and Piccolo especially paying attention. Part of Goku hopes that Piccolo ends up losing so he can go up next, but also he does want Piccolo to win and wants to see what Piccolo's made of. They haven't really gotten a full display of Piccolo's power just yet. Like, yeah, they fought each other, but this is the first time Piccolo's in a real battle against someone else where there are stakes. This isn't a sparring match. They all know the extent of Piccolo's power, and this is going to be a good test for everybody else to see. And Hit can tell just from Piccolo stepping in the ring that he's pretty powerful, someone to not mess with. You see, Piccolo's got a nice advantage over everybody. He had his potential awakened in the Buu Saga. He was the first one to go to Beerus' planet and access Godly Key. No one on Earth has really seen it, but Piccolo has grown significantly. Plus, after going to Namek last time to learn of the Super Saiyan God, he looked a little bit more into different aspects about himself that he could learn. Not just trying to practice more with magic, but figuring out ways to unlock his power even further. Mori mentioned this a while ago too. He had a lot of dormant power locked away. Unfortunately, he couldn't find some sort of godly Namekian form. At least, not one that was marked down in the book. But that didn't stop him. You see, there was no legendary Namekian god that he found. At least, not just yet. Maybe that's exactly what he is, but that's not what he calls this form. Immediately against Hit, he transforms into his new strongest power. His appearance completely changes, and they expect some really cool name for it, but Piccolo just refers to it as his orange form. It's an evolution of his previous power. Plus, it's imbued with godly key due to his training. Now, even though a godly Namekian legend didn't exist, it doesn't matter. Piccolo probably is that legend. Maybe the next iteration of the book will write about him instead. This is the true power of the nameless Namekian. 
Of course, power's not all that he needs to fight Hit here. He's gonna need strategy too, and a smart mind. But Piccolo's one of the best fighters to go up against him. He's a martial arts genius and last time that he watched Hit, he was able to figure out how some of his movements work. Goku was able to notice the same thing. Although, he didn't tell Piccolo because he wanted to see if Piccolo picked up on it himself. Which he was able to. And despite his increase in size, Hit's surprised to see how fast Piccolo is. Piccolo then clones himself, with a bunch of him surrounding Hit in the ring. But these are mainly distractions, there's no power in these clones. They all attack Hit at once, basically trying to bait him, and then Piccolo sees his opening, knowing when Hit's about to use his time skip and accurately predicting his moves. Hit uses time skip, but right when it ends, his face plants right onto Piccolo's fist. And with a single punch, he's knocked clean out of the ring, hitting the barrier. It's impressive that someone with no knowledge of time control was able to do that. And with that, Universe 7 wins the tournament, and the same wish is made by Beerus. Goku and Raditz are a bit heated that they didn't get to fight. As for Gohan, he kind of wanted to test out his power, but he expected that when he realized that he was last place here. It looks like Goten didn't really miss out on too much. Of course with the tournament though, someone else is watching the clips later on, with Zamasu wondering whose body to steal here. Now the thing is, he only really saw two people fight, Vegeta and Piccolo, but as he learns more about the two of them, he makes a pretty easy decision. Now Piccolo is actually a godly figure. Him using godly powers, well it's expected, he's common. In Zamasu's eyes, Piccolo is one of them. And maybe Piccolo would even go along with his plan once he hears about it, but obviously he's not going to tell Piccolo. What he's really looking for is a vessel, and that vessel would be Vegeta, a mortal playing god, the father of someone who actually messed with time, learning about Trunks' transgressions against the gods too. Let's go over to the future timeline. After returning back, Trunks was able to restore peace here. Now, initially he didn't grow as strong as he should have, thanks to not being able to go into the time chamber. But he did learn about the time chamber and tried to find it here. And luckily the lookout still seemed to be intact, so he went in there himself too. He tried to grow stronger seeing what Goku, Gohan, and Goten did, trying to master Super Saiyan for himself, and eventually he was able to. His timeline's protected from the androids and Cell. Although, there is one android left that doesn't do anything. After the defeat of 17 and 18, Android 16's still around. And since he is still hardwired to fight Goku, he doesn't even attack Trunks at all. 16 hasn't done much of anything, he's really just followed the other two around. And Trunks actually gets an idea, especially after what happened in the past. Android 16 is deactivated, and then taken to Bulma. She isn't so sure about this, but she trusts Trunks' judgment. And she's able to reprogram Android 16, just like he was reprogramming the present. Now, he's not going to be upgraded like he was in the present, because she doesn't really have the resources right now. Maybe later on down the line she will, but for now, 16's just going to be reprogrammed, not upgraded. This is good, because Trunks is really the only one protecting this timeline. Now 16 can work alongside him. Plus, 16's a great training partner for him, too. If he's going to grow stronger, he needs someone to help him. Although, with Trunks being a little bit weaker than normal, even with Android 16's help later on, the events of the Buu Saga still go normally for him. Bobbidi and Deborah are stopped, but unfortunately, Shin does die. They stop Buu's revival, but still lost the Supreme Kai. But little does Trunks know, this entire time another villain was watching over. At one point, the timeline's attacked by a familiar face. At first, Trunks doesn't even realize it. He sees the culprit from behind in his clothes, but his hairstyle looks oddly familiar. But the man sets his Trunks behind him, turning around to greet him finally. Trunks is paralyzed with fear. He can't even fight this guy. He's looking at the spitting image of Vegeta. The person destroying everything here. It's... it's his father. But that makes no sense. Vegeta's dead in this timeline, and there's no way the one from the past could have come here either. Also, the one in the past was kind of a good guy by then. Yeah, he wasn't a great person, but he wouldn't do this. Who is this guy? Trunks' struggle against Vegeta Black begins. Thankfully, with the help of Android 16, things go a lot better here. Future Boma doesn't end up dying. And just like normal, they are able to get fuel for the time machine. But they only really have one shot at this. 16 will be sure to protect everyone while Trunks is gone. The best part is, 16 can't be sensed by this guy. He has no key to sense. Plus, his infinite energy engine is actually pretty useful for them. He could basically be used as a generator for all the survivors giving them electricity, with Bulma being able to add something extra to the engine to convert that energy. So even though Trunks has to leave for a bit, thankfully everything's safe so far. But of course, Bulma and Trunks don't know how to feel about all this. That can't actually be Vegeta, can it? Bulma never gets to see him up close, but based on what Trunks sees, and some snapshots taken by Android 16, it clearly is a Vegeta doppelganger. Hopefully going to the past will be able to stop this, and maybe they could figure out what's going on with this mystery. Hope isn't completely lost yet. Trunks boards the time machine, going back to the same timeline that he saved so many years ago. Trunks returns to the present. Thankfully, not all is lost in his timeline just yet, especially thanks to the help of Android 16 being there. Naturally, everyone's surprised to see him return. And soon enough, they hear the reason why. Also, they see the reason why, because Vegeta Black appears in the past timeline. Now, naturally, with Vegeta seeing an imposter of himself, he's going to be pretty pissed off, and he tries to kill him instantly. He doesn't play around. But Vegeta Black is also going to play it safe. He knows that it might be too dangerous to be here just right now. So, he'll wait a bit to come back, or he'll wait for Trunks to return. Whatever happens sooner. 
He nearly does die against Vegeta, but is able to escape in the nick of time. Instead of being pulled back into the future, he willingly goes back there. And this pain that he got from fighting Vegeta, this will make him stronger. So, it's not a complete loss. He could turn this into a good thing for himself. Plus, he was able to destroy Trunks' time machine when he did get back there. Which is going to create some issues for everyone in the present timeline. So, that was pretty chaotic for everybody, but at least now they have a moment to breathe. This is especially weird for Vegeta. He came face to face with an imposter of himself, who clearly isn't him. There's no doubt about it. That guy looks like him, but it isn't him. Vegeta knows he was a bad guy in the past too, but that's not how he would act. That's not an evil Vegeta, that's someone completely different. He knows what an evil Vegeta looks like. But also, this is an interesting opportunity for Vegeta. Last time Trunks was here, he never even knew who Trunks was. He didn't realize until after the fact. And Raditz was kind of right to call him an idiot for not realizing earlier on. But now this is a good chance for him to actually get to know Trunks, the future version. Of course, he has his own version of Trunks too. But it puts their last encounter into perspective. He treated Trunks just as an ally, barely even that. He was an acquaintance at best, not realizing that that was his son. Despite things seeming bad right now, this might be a good opportunity for Vegeta to make amends with that and actually get to know Trunks more. And although he doesn't show it on the surface, he does want to make it up to Trunks. As for Trunks too, he's glad to see Vegeta again. And by now it's obvious that Vegeta would know who he is, especially because Trunks sees the past version of himself here too. It's a pretty emotional encounter for him, especially because he also gets to see Gohan and Goten, the people that he grew up with and knew the longest. They look different from their future selves, but there's no doubt about it, it clearly is them, and they're thriving. This is a timeline where they actually get to live their lives normally, they don't have to fight constantly, and be faced with turmoil. That's not to say their life is completely peaceful, but they're able to live here, both in the sense of having a fulfilling life, and actually still being alive. It's bittersweet, it reminds him of future Gohan and Goten, but also, it makes him happy for this present version. Even if the future ones didn't get to have that sort of life, these two are able to accomplish what they want. They even have their own families now. And you can also clearly see that the present version of Trunks, that Trunks looks up to Gohan and Goten just like this Trunks does. Despite the differences in timelines, it seems their relationship still remains the same, which makes him happy. It seems even in peaceful life, they're good mentors for Trunks. Not just that, older brother figures too. Of course, with that imposter showing up, everybody does want to help, but it's kind of tough to do so because the time machine isn't going to be able to fit everyone. Sure, Bulma might be able to expand it a bit, but it can only fit so many people. She can't create a giant time machine, especially because it's going to take more fuel to bring that. It already takes long enough to make fuel as is, and they don't really want to waste too much time here. So she is able to expand it a little bit, but right now it's not like it's going to fit the entire cast in there. Everyone wants to do something. Gohan, Goten, Vegeta, Raditz, Goku, Piccolo. Anyone who can help does want to but they can't just squish everyone in there because it needs to be controlled somehow. So for the time being, they have to decide who goes. Vegeta says he's going regardless. This is his battle, especially because it's his imposter. And it's his son. Gohan and Goten would be a good fit too because they're two of the strongest people here. And Trunks says they also have Android 16 in the future. Once the time machine is refueled, they go to the future. And all the while, Beerus and Whis want to look into who Vegeta Black truly is. Since Goku and Raditz are left behind, they go along. With Piccolo also following too. The three of them will try and solve that mystery, while the four others will go to the future. Trunks' time machine arrives back in his timeline. And this is a strange encounter for Vegeta. Future Bulma's actually alive here, which is obviously a good thing. And she can't believe what she's seeing. It's been so long since she last saw Vegeta. And for Vegeta, it's him seeing his wife, but it's not actually his wife. She's glad to see him, even though it's not her Vegeta. But it gives her comfort knowing that this is how Vegeta would have turned out. He was a good guy. And thankfully, she's not going to smother him, because she really didn't get to get too close to Vegeta. At least not nearly compared to how close they are in the main timeline. But for Vegeta, it is strange because it's the woman he loves, in a sense, but not really. He really doesn't know how to feel here. Especially because he's more so focused on his imposter, too. Fuming at the fact that someone's impersonating him and attacking this timeline. Attacking his son. Attacking his wife. Destroying all the people and things here. He's not going to stand for it. Bulma also thinks the same of Gohan and Goten. Those two she actually knew for a while. She has the same view on them as Trunks does. Once again, these two are back to help them, even if it's not the same Gohan and Goten she knew. Thankfully, the group doesn't have to wait too long for Vegeta Black to appear, also with an ally on his side, Zamasu. Vegeta Black's not only healed, but he's grown stronger, and he thanks Vegeta for the fight. Even though he might have lost there, he got something way greater from it. Showcasing his newest power, Super Saiyan Rose. Great, another hair color. Not that Vegeta really cares. He showcases his own form, Super Saiyan Blue. He doesn't know what that pink-haired one is, but this form is definitely superior especially because Vegeta is an actual Saiyan. He owns this body. He knows how to use it properly. Vegeta does have a tough battle at first, but Piccolo eventually joins in too using his orange form. Wait, Piccolo? Where the hell did he come from? Well, since they've had a few days now, and so many people working on figuring out who Vegeta Black truly is, Piccolo came to the future to see himself what's going on. They see Shin nearby as well, responsible for transporting him here. 
This surprises Vegeta Black as well, and Piccolo tells Shin he can go back to get the others. Now that he gets to see the future timeline with his own eyes, he can confirm that it was Zamasu that they were thinking of. Now they know the identity of Vegeta Black, and know that another Zamasu is involved somehow. Piccolo, Beers, and Whis were able to deduce this pretty easily. So, Shin goes back to get Raditz and Goku and tell them what's happening, and Piccolo helps Vegeta out in the battle. Funny enough, the two of them do have some experience fighting together. Vegeta was hoping he'd be able to handle this alone, but he does thank Piccolo for the help. For his own sake, he would have loved to defeat Vegeta Black single-handedly. But the most important thing is that they get to destroy him, and if he needs Piccolo to do that, so be it. With the two of them working together, Vegeta Black's completely overwhelmed and does have to retreat to heal a bit. With that strange Kai next to him also retreating, they don't really have a clue of who he is yet, but they could tell he's probably going to heal Vegeta Black. But Piccolo says it's not really a big deal. He holds a hand out to Vegeta, doing the same thing and healing Vegeta. While they were fighting Vegeta Black, the hybrid Saiyans were all fighting Zamasu together. This seemed like overkill at first, especially because Trunks alone could have handled him, but somehow, he was able to survive. It seems like he's immortal somehow. Plus, with what those two told them, it seems like it's all making sense now. Vegeta Black is Zamasu from another timeline. And Zamasu, he's the one from this timeline, but immortal. So, it shouldn't be too hard to defeat them. All they'll have to do is seal Zamasu, which Piccolo could pull off pretty easily. Just used him a Fuva, maybe. And as for Vegeta Black, well, he's going to be a little bit stronger when he returns, but they're also going to have more people helping. Shin and even Gowasu arrive in the future now. This time with Goku and Raditz. Beerus and Whis didn't come along because they're not going to mess with this. With the Saiyan brothers being caught up to speed as well. Goku's also brought some Senzus along with him. Plus, they have the Kais here, and Piccolo has his own healing powers too. They have more than what they need. Plus, even though the time machine's not going to fit everybody, they have two people that could use time rings. Goku, Raditz, and Piccolo temporarily have their own as well, allowing them to travel with those two Kais. They just hope these rings don't do anything weird to them. Especially because technically they're not even supposed to be using them. Or even really capable of it, but temporarily they can. But all at once, everyone senses something pretty ominous. And in the distance, there's a brilliant pillar of light. They don't sense Vegeta Black and Zamasu anymore. They just sense one power. And materializing in front of them, a new warrior teleports in, floating above them. It's a fusion of Vegeta Black and Zamasu. They could sense everyone arriving in this timeline, and no matter what the cost, they're going to win this battle. So they pull out their trump card and fuse together. The immense power of Vegeta Black combined with the immortal body of Zamasu. This is the ultimate fusion. And no matter how many people they bring in, they won't win. First, he attacks Piccolo and Vegeta, the two people responsible for attacking him last time, who he knows has a lot of power. Bolts of lightning rain down from the sky on the two of them. Piccolo's barely able to defend at the last second, but it does a lot of damage to him still. And Vegeta takes even more damage. Both of them are completely out of the fight now. That power is unlike anything they could have expected. Goku and Raditz each power up too, both showcasing their own Super Saiyan Blue. Raditz of course still does have ultimate and everything, but he's going to use this for now. And as for Goku, he's able to keep up on his own. So despite Raditz having an advantage in power before, now the two of them are about even again. And he's glad to have an opportunity to fight with Raditz once more. The Kais go to heal Piccolo and Vegeta. With Gohan, Goten, Trunks, and Sixteen trying to help as well. But no matter what they do, no matter what powers they combine together, it's not working. Nothing they could do against Zamasu works. He just regenerates from it, completely unaffected. And as the two others are being healed by the Kais, Piccolo asks them something. How did those two fuse? What did they do for that? And Goasu explains it has to do with the Batara earrings. Well, Shin and Goasu both have their own sets of Batara earrings right now, so can't they use that and do the same thing? Well, they could, but their fusions aren't going to last as long. Fusions between Kais are permanent, but with mortals it's only going to be an hour, and maybe even less if they use too much strength. But Piccolo says they don't even need that much time. They just need that power in a pinch to kill Zamasu. Or at least contain him somehow because they might need to do that instead. Piccolo and Vegeta are fully healed, with Piccolo getting two sets of Batara earrings. He has a good idea of who he thinks should fuse. But before they go into fight, he asks Vegeta if he'd like to fuse with anyone. He's not going to fuse with Kakarot, nor is he going to fuse with Raditz. If anything, he'd prefer to fuse with the Trunks, but he's not saying this because he's too prideful, but rather, he thinks the two of them would work better together. Possibly even those twins fusing too. Goasu did mention, some fusions are more compatible than others. So, what about two brothers fusing? Both fusions would be that, and Gohan and Goten fusing? That might be even better, they're twins. Piccolo teleports both of them over, with Piccolo mentally communicating with the other four, telling them his plan. They need to back off for now, and Vegeta and Piccolo will try and just distract Zamasu. Piccolo covertly gives them the earrings, teleporting them away quickly and then teleporting back in. Zamasu has no clue what they're planning, but it's not going to work. Although, the four of them are still kind of lost. Piccolo told them what they're supposed to be doing here, but they still don't really get it. They're going to be doing the same sort of fusion as Zamasu? Well, hopefully it works. It does sound kind of cool, though. Without hesitation, Goku puts an earring on, and then holds out the other for Raditz. Fusing with Kakarot, huh? That does sound interesting. Gohan and Goten are a bit concerned about this, but they both think the same thing at the same time. It sounds crazy, but awesome. 
Raditz does hesitate a bit, but Gohan and Goten put the earrings on without any hesitation. And seeing his nephews do that, he says, what the hell, and puts on his own earring. And both these fusions know that they only have an hour to work, and to keep the fusion stable, they should pace themselves, not using too much strength. As two new fusions are born, the first one that appears is a fusion between Gohan and Goten. He'll name himself Goten. Wait, how about, no, Gohan. Actually, still, that doesn't work. You know what, how about just calling himself Hanten? Yeah, that name works. Hanten rushes over as the other fusion completes, immediately powering up into Ultimate, his most stable and strongest form. The other fusion fully forms and cracks his knuckles, taking a look at himself in a window nearby. So this is what Raditz and Kakarot look like fused together, huh? It even fused their outfits together, cool. In What If Raditz Survived, I named the fusion dance version of this Goditz. This design is actually an unused one from that What If, so we'll be sticking with the same name that I used for this fusion, that being Radaran. Pretty radical name. He immediately powers up into Super Saiyan Blue, flying over to join Han Ten in the fight. Piccolo and Vegeta can sense the two of them arriving, with Trunks and Sixteen also following suit. They each witness the fusions being made, and they can't believe it still. Trunks first flies in at Zamasu, flinging his sword right through him, which doesn't do anything, but it acts as a distraction, getting Zamasu to look right at Trunks as he performs a solar flare, blinding him. Then simultaneously, the two fusions attack Zamasu together. Piccolo also falls back, preparing to seal Zamasu. They just need to all hold him off at once. And Hanten's glad to see his uncle, or his father, his father uncle joining in. He doesn't know what the relation is there. But this should be a fun battle. Hanten's also pretty happy, or at least the Goten side of him is, because his tail's back. He wasn't sure if this fusion would have a tail. The Goten part of him really missed that feeling. And Radarat's a bit jealous because it's been a while since either of them had a tail. The two fusions completely overwhelm Zamasu together, but they still do pace themselves, that's not defuse right away. And since they're fusions, they might as well use fused moves too, right? Well, as for Gohan and Goten, they basically have the same moveset, but how about fusing two other moves together? The Masenko and the Kamehameha. And as for Radarot, it's pretty simple for him to fuse two ultimate moves together. Raditz's Fortnite Flash and Goku's Kamehameha. So together, the two of them charge their ultimate moves, easily holding Zamasu off, with Vegeta, Trunks, and Sixteen also doing their part. Vegeta tells them whatever the cost, that imposter's gonna go. And Trunks will protect his timeline by any means necessary. You know, Vegeta kinda regrets not fusing. Maybe he and Trunks should have fused together. But all that matters now is that they win here. Hanten shouts, Masenko Hameha. As Radarot shouts, Fortnite Kamehameha. <laughs> Sorry. I should have stuck with Sabbatical as the name for that move because Fortnite Kamehameha just sounds funny. Their ultimate moves strike together. Now Zamasu's body's already been long destroyed, but this destroys it even further, trying to regenerate, but it can't fully regenerate. If they push any further, his essence will be completely disembodied and just merge with the universe, but thankfully it doesn't get to that point because the second these attacks hit, it weakens him and stuns him just enough for Piccolo to unleash his move, the Mafuba. It takes a lot of power, especially with how strong Fuse Zamasu is at this point. But he's been weakened enough to seal, and Piccolo's able to create something strong enough, having to use the Mafuba in his orange form to accomplish this. With Shin and Gowasu also joining in trying to add power to the seal, using all their combined strength and magic. And immediately after launching their ultimate attacks, the two Fuse fighters defuse. Raditz and Goku had a lot of fun with that, and as for Gohan and Goten, they enjoyed it too. Although, Goten's a bit bummed that he doesn't have his tail, and Gohan did like using the ultimate form for a bit, and he's bummed that he doesn't have it for himself right now. It feels like when using that form, the fusion kind of unlocks some of his own power with ultimate. Weird, he'll have to remember that. Fusing was pretty fun. The two Kais are going to handle this Zamasu, taking him away and making sure that he won't come back. The timeline did take significant damage, but thankfully, it could still be restored. And not everyone died. There's still a lot of people left on Earth, even though most of them perished. But it seems like for now, Trunks' timeline is at least safe. He wishes he could have done more, and he doesn't like the fact that he had to rely on everyone else to help him. But Vegeta tells him he did the right thing. He's not disappointed in Trunks. Actually, he's impressed, especially after watching him fight. Despite Trunks knowing that he was completely outmatched, he still fought with everything he had and didn't give up, just how he'd want his son to act. And most importantly for Vegeta, they're able to get rid of that imposter. Clearly, he didn't deserve Vegeta's body. How pitiful. He talked about trying to destroy mortals and how weak they were. But in the end, he was destroyed by mortals. Fusing with godly power, no less. Trunks, Bulma, Sixteen, and Mai thank everyone for their help, bidding them all farewell. Shin and Gawasu take trips to get everyone back home so they can leave the time machine here just in case. Even though they really shouldn't be leaving the time machine. And as they all go home, Vegeta does wonder to himself, what would it be like to fuse with someone? Mainly Trunks. It's not like he'd ever fuse with Kakarot. Not in any timeline. Right? The Pure Saiyans continue their training with Whis, trying to go beyond Super Saiyan Blue somehow, if there even is a way to go beyond it. Vegeta and Raditz wonder if they could do something with their ultimate form in combination with this, but they're not necessarily too sure. As for Goku, he tries to use Kaioken with it more, which he hasn't really touched in a while. Maybe he can work this with Super Saiyan Blue. But they need to find a true way to ascend Super Saiyan Blue, 
not just this. Or maybe it's not even something beyond Super Saiyan Blue at all. Maybe it's something completely separate. As for Gohan and Goten, they stay on Earth still and work on their evolutions together. When they fuse, Hanten tried to use his ultimate form, and it really just drew out the power from both of their separate forms, Super Saiyan 4 and Ultimate. Whatever that was, it's something that they're not going to be able to achieve on their own because that was something the fusion had due to its weird circumstances. But what it does show them is that they're going down the right path. Whatever they're working with now, they need to continue working with that. Because when they transformed, they were just trying to draw out as much power as possible, and that's what it was. It drew out from both of those forms. So individually, they're going to have to continue working on those things. And maybe they can go back to basics too, working on their anger and seeing if they can access something with that somehow. Or mainly just focusing on the power that's derived from their tails, even though only one of them has a tail. And after fighting while fused, both of them realized what the other powers felt like. Goten got to feel what the power of Super Saiyan 4 coursing through his veins was like, and as for Gohan, he felt that for Ultimate, or at least Goten's version of Ultimate. So despite these two forms being exclusive to each other, they both got somewhat of an experience with it, and the memories of it by fusing. After some time passes, we get to the Tournament of Power. This time around, the team is going to be a little bit different, but it's going to have a lot of people that you probably expect. Obviously, there's Goku, Vegeta, Goten, Gohan, Piccolo, and Raditz. So right there, they already have six people. Another great choice would be Android 16, especially if Bulma was able to upgrade him a bit. He already has been upgraded a bit, so he should be good to go. But that gets the rest of the group thinking too. If Android 16's on the team, why not try getting the other androids? Obviously, they can get Krillin on the team, and with Krillin there, they might try and get Android 18 as well. What about Android 17? He's got to be out there somewhere too. They're able to find him, and he actually does join the team after some convincing from Goku. And with that, we have a full team. Now they have all the 10 people they need. No need to revive an old villain either. In terms of a leader though, they decide the best leader would probably be Gohan or Goten, and they let the two of them decide, which they do by a game of rock, paper, scissors. And Goten ends up being the leader, which is only fair because Gohan got to join the Universe X tournament over him, so it's right that he gets a shot at this. Well, that is true, but Gohan's a little bit bummed because he didn't even get to fight in that tournament. But whatever. They're both going to be fighting here, so even though Goten's leader, it's not like he's really missing out on anything. Especially because right when the tournament begins, half the team doesn't even listen to Goten. Goku, Vegeta, 18, and 17 go off on their own. Surprisingly, Raditz doesn't leave immediately, and he tells Goten that their strategy's good right there, but they should know by now that Saiyans don't really work like that. Which also includes his uncle, with Raditz also leaving too. Well, as the leader of the team, Goten decides he has a better idea. Why don't they all split up? All the androids and Saiyans went off on their own, and Krillin even joined Android 18 by now. With 16 being directed by Vegeta to fight everyone else on his own too. Listening to him because technically, Vegeta is the husband of his boss. But with the group in the center, people try and attack them, but they lose really quickly. Because even with just Gohan, Goten, and Piccolo together, they pretty much overpower everybody in the ring at the moment, besides a select few fighters. So they split off on their own. They each individually have more than enough power, and if they need to join up, they could do so pretty quickly. As everyone continues fighting, this eventually leads to Goku facing off against Jiren. But he doesn't do that alone. Raditz ends up trying to join him. And Goku would rather fight this alone, but Raditz can tell just by the guy's presence, Goku's going to need some help. Well, it's fine. He likes fighting alongside Raditz, and he just tells Raditz to keep up. If they're going to fight together, he hopes Raditz can keep up with the speed. But Raditz can more than do so. They are both around the same level of power right now, after all. They fight Jiren together, cycling through all their forms. The two of them eventually make it to Super Saiyan Blue, then showing off a new level of their power. As Goku goes into Blue Kaioken, and Raditz follows suit too. It did take a little bit of time to learn this, but after seeing Goku use it, Raditz wanted to get it for himself too. Goku showed him some of it, and he even traveled to King Kai's planet for a bit, with King Kai surprised to see Raditz here because he was the one who sent Goku here in the first place, and the whole reason that Goku learned it in general. Raditz in Blue is slightly above Goku in Blue just because of him having ultimate. However, Goku's Kaioken is way higher than Raditz's, so when in Blue Kaioken, he does outpace Raditz a little bit, which amazes Raditz because even without having his potential unlocked, Goku is still ahead of him in Vegeta, at least at his maximum output. But the two still aren't able to do anything against Jiren together, until Goku jumps back and tries to charge a spirit bomb, with Raditz fighting off Jiren the entire time. Although it's not really necessary because Jiren could fight Raditz off easily if he uses a little bit more power. He just wants to see how strong Goku's spirit bomb can get, so he basically lets him charge it. Goku finally charges it up, launching the spirit bomb right at Jiren. And despite being much more powerful than the one that we saw in canon, it's still not really going to do anything against Jiren. Goku almost even falls into it, but Raditz is able to save him in the nick of time, telling Kakarot he's got to be more careful. It would have been terrible for him to fall in the spirit bomb, right? But this also gives everyone else the opportunity to see how strong Jiren is, or at least a fraction of his strength. Vegeta ends up getting to face Kaba again, with 16 alongside Vegeta, trying to make sure no one interferes with their battle. Speaking of androids, 17 and 18 are actually fighting off some of the pride troopers right now alongside Krillin. After facing Jiren, Raditz and Goku actually need some time to recover, so they actually end up facing the other universe six Saiyans. Interested to see Saiyans from another universe, even though it's not the first time they've seen it, of course. Gohan and Goten are still fighting really cautiously, not just in terms of trying to conserve their strength, but also trying not to get knocked out. They fight a lot of the weaker fighters. 
Basically, they want to save as much power as possible, and when the time comes, they're going to fight the strongest opponents there. Coming across some other pride troopers as well alongside the androids. Excited to see some other superheroes. It reminds Gohan of the good old days of being Saiyaman. And you know, even though Goten kind of gave up on that, he still does admire it. Universe 6 also gets eliminated fairly quickly. Jiren eliminates Hit. The Namekians fight against Piccolo and see his amazing power and his evolution, with them ending up losing that battle too. Kaba eventually falls out of the ring too after his fight with Vegeta, with Vegeta not being the one to knock him out, but helping him unlock a level above Super Saiyan. Kale and Kalifa eventually fuse into Kefla, and Vegeta even considers using fusion here because if they could use the Patara, now is his chance to actually try it out. He still does kind of regret not doing it in the last arc. It seems like it could be an interesting experience, but instead he ends up joining Goku and Raditz, with Vegeta unlocking his own evolution of blue, Super Saiyan Blue Evolution, with the three pure Saiyans fighting together against the pure Saiyan fusion. And the three of them combines a little bit overkill, actually. Vegeta also ends up eventually fighting Topo, fighting alongside 16, 17, and 18. And Vegeta could see that Topo actually has more strength locked away, trying to egg him on so he can unleash it. He doesn't know what reason Topo has for holding it back, but he tells him the alternative is letting his universe perish, so he might as well fight with everything he's got. The androids are actually kind of surprised to see Vegeta egging him on, especially because it works, and he unleashes his God of Destruction mode. But in a 4v1, they're actually able to defeat Topo relatively quickly, with Vegeta being the main powerhouse there. Once again, regretting not fusing because if they fuse there, Topo probably would have been a relatively easy opponent to fight against, but that would make it a lot less fun too. Goku does end up facing Jiren again, this time alongside Raditz and Vegeta. Although Vegeta's pretty worn out after his fight with Topo, and Goku's pretty worn out too. Raditz is definitely the best off of the three of them so far, having lost the least amount of stamina. And much later on in the tournament, Goku gets the catalyst he needs to finally go into Ultra Instinct, being pushed to his brink by Jiren. Raditz and Vegeta are both astounded. Vegeta's gotten his own evolution, and Raditz finally got to try out Blue Cow Ken, but Goku, he's gotten something completely different. They have no clue what this is, and all the other remaining gods, they look completely amazed. They wonder if they'd be able to pull this off too, especially after seeing it in action. It seems to be really helpful here, and really powerful. However, it also gets Jiren to show off more of his strength. He already has shown more power so far, but Goku's getting worn out pretty quickly by Ultra Instinct, and Jiren's getting more serious. This is a bad combination together, because surprisingly enough, it leads to Goku getting knocked out. Despite showcasing that awesome power, he was still surpassed by Jiren. Right then and there, Goku was the strongest on the team by far, and he was defeated just like that. Jiren's still not at his full strength. Raditz and Vegeta don't know what they're going to be able to do here, but at the very least, they're not going to give up. It looks like Gohan and Goten have to stop holding back. This is what they were conserving their energy for. They do actually have something that might work here, but they were saving it just in case they needed it. These two as well as Piccolo joined Vegeta and Raditz in their battle with Jiren. And Raditz wonders if they could truly keep up. Yes, they have amazing strength, but these two are gods right now. And at their current peak, they should be above the twins, especially with Goku being defeated, and him being the strongest here by far, the twins would need to surpass that even. And if they were able to do so, that still doesn't guarantee a victory against Jiren because Goku's still lost. But Gohan tells Vegeta and Raditz to trust them. Raditz knows what they're capable of after all. And that's right, he wouldn't be surprised if they found some other way to surpass their limits. Or find one right now if they haven't already. And Jiren wonders what these two warriors will be capable of. Apparently they're the sons of Goku, the warrior that he just defeated. And he was pretty impressive, possibly the strongest that he's ever faced. And the two start powering up. They tell Jiren, this isn't their peak. They know they could still go beyond this. And the only reason they held us back is because they weren't sure if they could tap into it again during the tournament. And even if they were able to, they'd burn themselves out pretty quickly, which is why they saved it until now. Their two auras combine, overflowing and filling the entire arena. Goku watches from the stands. He can't believe it. He didn't know they had that much power locked away, but he smiles, laughing to himself. Those two kids really never cease to amaze him. Vegeta and Raditz shield themselves from the aura with Raditz laughing the entire time. Their transformation completes, showing off a new terrifying white-haired form, each using the same exact power. This is Beast Gohan and Beast Goten. The two of them vanish, with Jiren even being surprised at their speed. He couldn't even keep track of that. Quickly, he throws both of his arms up, blocking a kick from either side, but he struggles to hold it back. The two of them aren't wasting any time, because if they do waste time, they're gonna run out of energy. And Jiren can't believe warriors that strong were in this ring the entire time, being pushed to show his own full power. Gohan and Goten know they're basically on a time limit right now, until they learn to better control this form, it's gonna run out pretty quick. So, they should finish this as quickly as possible too, and they should try a combo move. They actually don't have one plan, but maybe they can come up with something on the fly. Gohan tells Goten he'll act as the bait, and they can improvise the rest. Gohan rushes in to attack Jiren, then moving around quickly and creating clones. Jiren's easily able to tell which ones are the clones, but it gives Goten the opportunity to slip away onto a rock above them. Goku enjoys all this while watching from the stands. He recognizes that move that Gohan's using. He's copying him. His sons are using everything they learned. As Gohan's clones distract Jiren, Goten jumps up in the air, launching a barrage of key blasts down, destroying the ring around Jiren as Gohan jumps back. But Jiren's able to keep himself in, jumping off the small pieces of it. Although, Gohan continues to try to beat him downwards. Jiren lets out a massive burst of key, trying to launch Gohan backwards. 
And as Gohan's flung back by Jiren's power, he smiles to himself. He could use a bit more power. He could finally test out this form to its fullest. Jiren really is that strong. Jiren rockets upwards trying to attack Gohan as he's launched up, but Goten then rockets down past him, hitting Jiren directly with a kick, launching a blast from his feet right in front of Jiren's face, propelling himself upwards. In midair, he grabs onto Gohan, swinging him downwards too, with him launching the same kick at Jiren, then propelling himself upwards just like Goten did. They continue repeating this, swinging each other back and forth, doing this dozens of times within a fraction of a second. The two fight so well together that they improvise this technique pretty much on a whim, and simultaneously, they each come up with the same exact name for this technique. They'll call this their ping pong technique. They continue launching each other back and forth, and each time they do so, it gets faster and faster. And even without flight here, this happens so quickly that they keep up with the momentum and neither of them falls down while up in the air. And Jiren's completely stunned by it. But at some point the technique ends, and the two of them link together up in the air, going back to back with each locking an arm together. They then each stick their free arm up into the sky, simultaneously launching a blast up to act as a thruster. At speeds so fast that no one can even comprehend it, they then simply appear on the ground, or at least what remains of the ground, followed by a powerful shockwave right after, with Jiren also appearing in the stands. The ring has been completely pulverized into dust, and there's only a few small sections of rock left behind. And inadvertently, they even knocked out some of the allies that were still in the ring. Whoops, that was a little bit too much power. With all the power they were using, they kicked downwards and knocked Jiren right through the ring. But it was so quick that no one could even see it. It looked like they all just teleported. And immediately after this too, they drop out of the form going back into their base. With Universe 7 taking victory and winning the tournament. And Goten's the one who gets the wish here. Since he's the leader and is still in the ring. And he makes the right wish, wishing for all the other universes to come back. And the Universe 7 takes a lot away from this tournament. Vegeta has his own evolution and wants to continue with this. As for Raditz, he knows he has further to go. Not just with Blue Kaioken, but maybe he could even do something else. Especially after seeing Ultra Instinct. As for Goku, of course he's going to try Ultra Instinct again too. Raditz really wants to see it, but Goku can't do it again willingly. As for Gohan and Goten, they need to continue working with these beast forms. And Goku wants to see more of that as well. Although, he tells them, don't show it to Chi Chi because she'll probably freak out. Actually, they probably shouldn't show it to their wives either because they might have the same reaction. The form is kind of terrifying. Even Piccolo agrees. He knew these two had some crazy reserves of power, but not like that. And it leaves Raditz wondering, what would he look like with that same form? It would probably be terrifying because his hair would stand up an extra six feet, probably. But there's no point focusing on that because it seems like it's something unique to them. Possibly tied to their innate rage, as well as the fact that each of them had their potentials unlocked somehow. Goten's from Ultimate, and Gohan from fusing with Goten, as well as Super Saiyan 4 drawing out some of that potential. But even without that, they probably would have gotten this regardless. It's definitely something that fits them, and something that they should have expected. And Raditz agrees with this theory. He saw these two as kids, and even trained them. He knows how they were back then. It's definitely from that. Goku and Piccolo concur too. Goku's been on Beerus' planet for so long that he didn't realize what they've gotten here on Earth. Obviously, he knew the twins were strong, but not like this. He didn't know they surpassed their limits that quickly, and that explosively. It looks like he has a long way to go. He's going to get Ultra Instinct and surpass them. They act as a great motivator. What better rival to have than his own sons, his own students? Following the Tournament of Power, as you'd probably expect here, there's not going to be any Broly. Without Frieza in the story, there's going to be no need for anyone to even try and find him. And none of the people on Earth have a desire to look for other Saiyans too. So naturally next up, we'd go into the Moro arc. With Buu defeated, the seal on Moro ends up breaking. And after some years, he's finally able to escape the Galactic Patrol prison, regaining some of his magic too. Just to see if there's any chance that Buu is actually alive still. Maris and some Galactic Patrolmen go to Earth. But not just for that, but also because they might need some help from there. Earth does have some pretty powerful warriors, and even with Moro's magic, at least with their strength, they might be able to counter that. Maris actually knows of this because his brother's training three of the Saiyans there. And he's able to recruit Goku, Vegeta, and Raditz. Gohan and Goten didn't even get the memo, but it's fine. They'll stay here on Earth. Immediately, there's going to be a pretty big change here, besides the fact that Raditz is in the crew. The big change is Goku doesn't have instant transmission, which means they can't go right to Namek just now. So it takes a bit longer for them to get to Namek, and by the time they actually do get there, not only has Moro already arrived on the planet, but he nearly has all the Dragon Balls. Goku, Vegeta, and Raditz immediately try and fight him, but midway through the battle, Moro gets a huge boost in power, as he regains his youth. The battle barely even got to start before this happened. And now, Moro seems almost unstoppable. They don't even know how they would have fought him before, especially with his magic, but now he has the power to back that up too, not just his magical abilities. Of course, this also means he's going to wish for the prisoners to be free as well. And after a tough fought battle, which is even tougher because they don't have the Grand Supreme Kai there to help, the Saiyans have to retreat with the Galactic Patrol as Namek is destroyed. With the three Saiyans critically injured. The Galactic Patrol of course does heal them, but now they need to figure out their next course of action. The problem isn't Moro's strength, it's his magic. They don't really know how to counter it, especially because they didn't really get to fight against it like normal. It's going to be a completely different situation here. And on top of that, the methods for training are going to be very different. Of course, Goku might still try and go for Ultra Instinct, with Mayor's helping him for that. But as for Raditz and Vegeta, 
Vegeta doesn't end up going to Yard right here because he doesn't even think of that. But they have their own ideas too. Why not go back to training with Beerus? If this guy absorbs energy, why don't they just give him energy that he can't absorb? What about using the power of a god of destruction? Hakai's in general would be pretty helpful here as an attack, but even more so against an opponent like this. If they use energy of the spent to erase people, how will he eat it? So the two of them go back to Beerus' planet to train under him instead of Whis, with Goku staying with Mayris training with him in his time chamber. All the while, Moro continues his conquest, which eventually leads some of the prisoners to Earth. Although, when they show up on Earth, it's not really that much of a battle. First, they encounter Piccolo, who's way stronger than them. Like, it's not even a contest. Right now, Piccolo's actually in the middle of training Trunks, and he even fights alongside Piccolo. Gohan and Goten even show up after sensing this, but they're already too late because Piccolo basically defeated everyone, except for 7-3. The only reason he's not defeated yet is because he was actually able to steal some of Piccolo's power, gaining his strength too. But with Gohan and Goten here, he's going to have a pretty tough time. Amidst the battle, he is able to grab onto Goten's neck too, stealing his power. This gives him a far better chance, especially because now he'll be equal with Gohan, but he's still fighting four people, two of which are actually equal to him right now. This nearly leads to his defeat and destruction, but he's able to escape in the nick of time, not even using Moro's power here, saving it instead and wanting to preserve himself to go back to Moro, especially with the power that he's just gained. He's able to barely make it out of there in time. And pretty much like normal, this leads to the two months of training that Moro gives Earth. Thankfully, Earth already has some pretty strong defenses, and once they're warned about Moro too, they know exactly what to look for and what to counter. So, Gohan and Goten are pretty strong as is, but they're probably the biggest risk too because more strength means more power for Moro to absorb. Same goes for Piccolo too. The other prisoners won't be an issue at all, especially because they're training up some of the other fighters around them. And for someone like Android 16 who's going to be joining the battle too, he doesn't even have energy to take, which also leads to them recruiting 17 and 18 as well. But even with that, Moro might still be an issue, especially because they don't know how strong he is at the moment. His strength has definitely increased from what it was on Namek by now, which is obviously going to be a pretty big issue once he does show up. And while everyone trains on Earth, Vegeta and Raditz are on Beerus' planet still. Beerus doesn't really directly teach them, at least not like Whis does, but they are able to learn some stuff by just watching him. They start by practicing very small Hakai's, and eventually working up to actually making real ones. As it is now, they think this power might actually be enough to defeat Moro, if they could just land one Hakai that should be good. And if they just use that throughout the entire fight, there's no way he can counter it, he can't eat that energy. But even better, they feel like they might be able to unlock a brand new power, something beyond where they currently are, and something unique to them. Well, they'd probably be using the same power as each other, but it would at least be different from Kakarot's, and it would still be a huge power-up like Ultra Instinct. Speaking of Ultra Instinct, Goku of course is continuing his training with Maris, and eventually unlocks Ultra Instinct Omen for himself, being able to use it at will now. But during the tournament, he never actually perfected Ultra Instinct. He only used Omen, and it was only at one point of the tournament. Which leaves him in a weird situation because he is stronger in base than he is in the normal story. But he's kind of behind on his training in terms of Ultra Instinct, so he does have more raw power, but he doesn't have the same technique here. At least, not just yet. But having Omen is still good enough. Even if he doesn't know what the power of the complete Ultra Instinct feels like or how to access it, he still is on the track to getting it. And Omen will be good enough in the meantime. Two months pass, and Moro's crew eventually arrives on Earth, with the prisoners swarming the planet first. Gohan and Goten actually do have a new power to show off, but they don't really know if this is the best case to show it in. During their training with Piccolo, they were able to get a better control in their beast form, and they're trying to work on getting something even beyond that. Beast was never the final step for them. It was actually a stepping stone. They even mentioned it to others in the Tournament of Power. Now at least they have control over the form, but it still might not be too useful here because they're going up against someone that could steal power. Having too much strength might actually be kind of a downside, unless they're able to finish the fight really quickly. But also another area of concern is 7-3. Since he's dealing with stronger opponents this time, he's actually been upgraded a bit by Moro's crew. Primarily so he could steal everyone's powers again. He aims for Piccolo first, trying to take his abilities. It's been kinda long since the last time he stole Piccolo's power, so he needs a little bit of an update here. Giving him the regeneration and stretchy limbs of Piccolo. His next targets are Gohan and Goten. And since Piccolo's far stronger in the scenario too, this means 7 is gonna get a really nice boost. Plus, with Piccolo actually being Kami in the scenario, he does have the ability to teleport around different places on Earth which is really helpful in a battle like this because 7-3 simply teleports behind one of the twins, grabbing onto Gohan this time. They didn't realize he'd be able to copy those abilities too, but it doesn't matter. When 7-3 grabs Gohan's neck, he actually looks pretty surprised at the power he gained. He didn't expect it to be this explosive. But Gohan, Goten, and Piccolo get ready to fight him together. Even with 7-3 stealing that power, he's still defeated here. Partially because he's overpowered by his opponents, but also because he kind of overloaded himself with power. When trying to use Gohan's full strength, it basically short-circuited him. There's a reason Gohan wasn't using it just yet either. It could run out too quickly, and on top of it giving more energy, that's not really worth the risk. So it kind of backfired on 
the rest of Moro's crew is defeated relatively easily, which leads Moro himself to go down to Earth. Facing off against the people there, Vegeta, Raditz, and Goku still haven't arrived back yet. But the group here still has a backup plan. It's not perfect, especially because they didn't really have enough time for this. But during the training, Piccolo revisited some of the magic he was trying to learn. He is Kami after all, and did need to learn some different techniques, including magic of course. Maybe the counter to Moro's magic is just more magic. Piccolo doesn't have a perfect mastery over this. He doesn't even really know how to use it against Moro in this case because they didn't really know what to expect. But he has practiced. Moro's magical prowess is way too much for Piccolo to handle, but he is able to mitigate it somewhat, slowing down Moro's energy drain and completely stopping it at some points too, allowing Gohan and Goten to fight him together. Moro is pretty impressed with their strength too. At the moment, they're just fighting in Beast. And he compliments their strength. If he wasn't stealing power right now, well, he'd be defeated. They would simply overpower him if he didn't have his magic. But he could tell they're holding back. They're not using their full power because they're scared Moro would take some of it, which is very true. And it's very smart to fight that way but it also means they're not going to be able to defeat Moro. It's a huge risk, but they will have to use their full power if they want to get rid of him. Even with Piccolo using his magic to try to mitigate Moro's magic, it's not going to be enough. But at the very least, this means everyone on Earth can actually hold Moro off for the time being, and it stalls him just enough, finding the perfect amount of time for Whis to arrive on Earth with Vegeta and Raditz in tow. Seeing Whis, Moro immediately tries to attack him and take his power. Although he's completely unsuccessful, Whis disappears the second he tries to, and he would have dodged that attack easily anyways. But on top of that, the second he's about to land an attack, Vegeta and Raditz counter with their own. Moro then tries to take their energy, but notices a strange presence coming from them, as they're surrounded by a purple aura. They didn't expect to jump into a fight right away, but that might be even better. It'll allow them to gain some power more quickly. Wasting no time, they reveal exactly what they've been training for. A new purple-haired form, the complete antithesis to Ultra Instinct. This is Ultra Ego. With both of them using the same destructive power, Moro can't steal their energy. He has no way to fight them. And on top of that, they're strong. Of course, Moro has a lot of strength for himself right now, but when he attacks them, they just grow stronger. It seems like their battle spirit heats up whenever they get attacked, and they just gain more power on top of that. This form is actually a really great counter to Moro's power. Their energy can't be absorbed, their attacks can't be absorbed, and they grow stronger as they fight. They actually completely beat Moro, overwhelming him, but Moro does have one final trump card. Thankfully, he still has a strength left because it wasn't really drained here. Vegeta's not using spirit control after all, so he still has all of his power. So Moro easily is able to escape and go over to where 7-3 is. He's not dead, he's just short-circuited. And Moro's gonna make that power his own. Piccolo teleports everyone over there, but by the time they get there, it's already too late. Moro has absorbed 7-3, transforming himself too. It seems 7-3 collected a lot of power, so he'll have to be a little bit careful with it. But it would be fun to use some of it. Why not use one of Gohan or Goten's powers? And he tries to summon their strength. Even if he can't steal energy from Raditz and Vegeta, it's not an issue. With this power, he should be unstoppable. Although just as the fight's about to resume, someone else enters the battlefield, apologizing for showing up a little bit late. He did get kinda lost flying a ship back here. It's Goku. He's not sure what happened with Moro, but he could tell that he's grown a lot stronger somehow. The rest of them warn him that they need to avoid the gems on his hand because it seems he got those from 7-3 as well. He was able to steal the power of Gohan and Piccolo. So on top of his magic, he's far stronger now and has way more abilities than before. And Goku can see Raditz and Vegeta are using a new power. He'd love to test that out in a battle later. But for now, they're going to have to fight together. He feels like with the three of them teaming up, it should be more than enough. Gohan and Goten wish they had some Batara on hand. Not for them, but for Vegeta and Goku. Or Raditz and Goku. Any combination of those three. But for now, that doesn't matter. Goku powers up into Ultra Instinct Omen. He can't be hit this way, and he can attack without having his energy stolen. Vegeta and Raditz are also healed by Piccolo, growing stronger on top of the strength they've already gained. Piccolo's going to try to assist by negating Moro's magic. Meanwhile, the three Saiyans are going to fight together with everything they've learned, using it to stop Moro in his tracks. Gohan and Goten watch on the sidelines with Piccolo. They really want to help out, but they know it's still risky, especially because Moro has their power now. But Piccolo says it might not be too bad. He's preoccupied with the other three, and he can't steal energy from them. And if he tries to steal energy from one of them, couldn't Raditz or Vegeta just counter that? Actually, yeah, that's a perfect plan. This means Gohan and Goten can actually fight here. And if they try and use an attack, well, Vegeta or Raditz could just help. And Raditz even calls them into the battle, mentally communicating with them. He actually had the same exact idea. And not just that, but he could lend them some of his destructive power. They can imbue that within their attacks, which will make it so Moro can't absorb them. Gohan and Goten conserve their strength just in case, but they power up into their beast forms. They do have their own unique evolution on top of this that they're working towards, but they don't want to burn out too quickly or risk giving Moro too much energy, even with the changes in this battle right now. With the five Saiyans all fighting together, Moro's actually struggling. He tries to summon more power, but if he tries to use too much strength at once, he might overload himself just like 7-3 did. He already doesn't feel right. Is this really the power that those hybrid Saiyans have? 
But on top of that, even if he did have the capacity to steal more energy, he can't right now. Piccolo's kind of negating it, and at the same time, if he tries to, he might accidentally eat a Hakai. They know to counter him. But he might need to try it. It might be his only option. Goku then suddenly performs a weird technique on Moro, using a God Bind, telling Piccolo to hold Moro in place too. Don't focus his magic on negating Moro's magic. The two of them use their combined powers to try and hold Moro in place. And Moro acts scared, but he goes along with this. This is good. This leaves him open to absorb an attack. Gohan and Goten then stand together, back to back, then flinging out a finger in front of them, each launching a Makanko Sapo. The two beams swirl together, heading right towards Moro. Again, he still acts scared, but he's actually confident here. He'll absorb that attack and gain so much power that he can't be stopped. It's not like Vegeta and Raditz can come close to him to attack because otherwise, they might Hakai Goku or Piccolo. But he's fine here. He can't be defeated. He welcomes the attack. At the last second, he opens his mouth. But the beam suddenly flashes into a purple color. Vegeta and Raditz might not be near him, but they can still imbue their energy with another's, passing into Gohan and Goten as they fire their attacks together. Goku and Piccolo quickly get out of the way. The beam hits Moro, penetrating right through his head as the destructive energy spreads throughout his body, finishing with a brilliant explosion, as Moro is not only defeated, but completely erased. But in his last moments, he saw something terrifying. It wasn't just the Hakai that was imbued within their attacks. Their attacks got stronger from their own energy. They transformed for a brief second. Even if he was able to absorb that power, he would have died. It would have been far too much for him. He would have been overloaded. He doesn't know exactly what he saw, but he spends his last seconds of consciousness in terror. All he knows for a fact is that he faced certain defeat in that moment. Gohan and Goten are a bit bummed out after the fight because they couldn't show their full power, but the other three Saiyans are pretty hyped up. They each got their own new strength and got to use it here. And they did get a brief glimpse of that power Gohan and Goten were using. Well, maybe some other time. Hopefully not though, because that would mean Earth's at risk. Maybe they could test it out on Beerus' planet sometime. So, following the Moro arc like I do in some of my videos, there's not going to be a Granola arc here without Frieza. It's a lot less likely without Frieza there because the Heaters and Granola won't have the same motivation. So, that leaves Superhero as the final arc essentially. But a lot of things here will be different with that arc too. Red Pharmaceuticals tries to recruit Dr. Hedo. And pretty much like normal, they try and get him to make Cell Max. Now, they never actually did see a perfect Cell, and they don't really have a clue about Cell either. But Magenta would still want an Android made, and it would be pretty similar to Cell Max anyways. For the sake of this video, it's going to have the same design as Cell Max, and the same name as Cell Max. But for the record, realistically, it probably wouldn't look the same, or be the same name. And the Android would have a ton of different data too, because it wouldn't be based on the Cell that we know, because they wouldn't know about Cell either. Not really a big deal, but just worth mentioning. Red Pharmaceuticals has been tracking Goku and crew for a while. They also had some footage of the battle against Moro, but not really too much. Although, Hedo decides to check the area where they fought. There might be something there even though it has been a few years. And much to his surprise, they actually are able to find something pretty interesting. With the Granola arc never happening, without the Heaters having the same motivations, Granola is never sent to Earth to get the data from 7-3. The whole reason they went to get him is because they wanted the info he had on Zuno. But here, 7-3 is actually left on Earth, or at least what's left of him. There's not really too much there, but there is a small chunk of him that Hedo finds. A small piece of his hand with the gem on it too. So, out of curiosity, he studies it, and he finds some great data on the fighters and everyone, including the absorbed data that 7-3 had. He's going to use this to make his new android. Also, he's going to try and use this for the gammas as well, because of course, he's going to create the gammas still. And Magenta's pretty excited. This android's probably going to end up being pretty powerful. Some time passes as Hedo works on the androids, leading us to where Superhero is supposed to start. The thing is, a lot of 7-3's data was used for Cell Max, rather than the Gammas, but Hedo tried to apply some of that data to them. Gamma 2 is sent out to find Piccolo, and he can't really find him anywhere because Piccolo of course lives on the lookout in this scenario. But there are times where he actually is on the surface, and Gamma 2 is able to find him at one point. Piccolo fakes the defeat here, and not because he can't beat Gamma 2, but because he wants to figure out who this guy is. Although, it doesn't really work too well because Gamma 2 and Gamma 1 both know that Piccolo has a higher form beyond this. So, Gamma 2 scopes out the area waiting to find Piccolo, and then he's finally able to locate him. Piccolo then showcases his full strength, and actually easily defeats Gamma 2. He did have some of the data on Piccolo, but it was from the Moro arc. Plus, adjusting the power to account for 7-3's data was easier with a bio-android like Cell Max, rather than these two who are purely mechanical. So, he actually does have a tough challenge here. It seems Hedo didn't make him strong enough to face Piccolo as he currently is. So Gamma 2 retreats, thinking he won't be able to be tracked because he doesn't have a key signature. Piccolo quickly teleports up to the lookout, and from there he focuses, looking at the area where he fought Gamma 2. He could barely see it from there, but he could see that Gamma 2's flying back to their lab, keeping track of him, and finding the Red Ribbon Army base. Gamma 2 retreated because he wanted to get help from Gamma 1, and he thinks that Hedo needs to upgrade them a little bit more. But this led Piccolo right to where the base is, so he's simply able to disguise himself with a clothes beam, and just teleports to where the Red Ribbon Army base is, infiltrating the base, getting some more info on what's going on here. So Hedo goes back to upgrading the Gammas, with Magenta pretty pissed off that they couldn't do anything, 
He thinks they should just activate Cell Max, and Hedo disagrees. But as he goes to actually upgrade the Gammas, Magenta starts to plan his own thing, going to actually activate Cell Max. Before he does so, Piccolo teleports away, first going to Gohan's house. He's busy with some work right now, but when Piccolo fills him in on the situation, he actually is up to join here. Then he goes to where Goten is. Thankfully, Goten's also available to fight too. We never really cover this, but I'd imagine that he'd become a farmer kind of like Goku, especially with Goku being gone, someone would need to watch the farm. While Gohan became a scholar, Goten kind of likes this more, so this is his job, and he's able to basically leave whenever he wants, so of course he's up to join a fight. So now that Piccolo has both the twins with him, they can go back to the Red Ribbon Army base. And immediately, before they even go there, they could sense a pretty strong power far away. As Magenta activates Cell Max, the Gammas are busy being upgraded right now, and Hedo's pretty unprepared, but he immediately knows what's happening by the time it happens. Piccolo teleports the three of them over there, as Cell Max is unleashed. Gohan's pretty surprised that this all happened out of their nose. So Cell Max would look different and have a different name, so they wouldn't even realize that it's supposed to be Cell. Even though Gohan and Goten actually were the ones to fight Cell. But they put two and two together and realized that this is some sort of bio-android similar to that. And he's clearly on some sort of mindless rampage right now. And for that reason, Piccolo obviously wants to stop this thing right away. Gohan and Goten were hoping to have some sort of substantial fight here, but they do realize they have to end this quickly too. While the two of them here do enjoy fighting, they're also pretty serious when it comes to that. And they focus on mitigating danger and ending fights quickly, rather than just having fun. Piccolo goes into his full power, with Gohan and Goten finally showcasing their new strength. Now, they've had this for a while. They could have even used it against Moro, but it would have been a little bit more risky there, especially because they didn't have that great of control on it. But they're excited to finally use it in a real battle. It's the final evolution for each of them, based on their own unique trainings. The two of them actually did unlock the beast form together. And this is kind of an extension of that. For Gohan, the change is more noticeable. It almost looked like his Super Saiyan 4 form, due to that being his unique evolution. Meanwhile, Goten's changes aren't really too apparent. His eyes change color and get an outline similar to Super Saiyan 4. Once more, he's still a bit bummed that he doesn't have his tail anymore. These two forms are their respective masteries over the beast form, with the beast form basically being the culmination of all their anger and power. Goten's channels the power of Great Ape through his wrathful form, while Gohan's channels the power of Great Ape through his Super Saiyan 4 form. This is the epitome of their strength, their final form by all means, with each showing off almost animalistic strength. And despite the different looks, they are essentially similar. It's just the way that their awaken was different. And for that reason, they each give these forms the same name. This is Primal Gohan and Primal Goten. Although, Goten calls his unique version Golden Beast, due to it getting a golden tint, and Goten wanting to differentiate it from Gohan a bit. The twins are the strongest warriors in existence. Piccolo doesn't even get a chance to fight. With them finally getting to showcase their full power, they go all out, and they end the battle pretty quickly, with Cell Max being defeated with relative ease. A little bit underwhelming for them because that battle was too short. Once again, their full strength gets snubbed. They don't get a chance to actually use it for fun. But thankfully, the Red Ribbon Army is stopped. Piccolo wonders where that one android went though. He never actually got to see Gamma 1 either. Inadvertently with Cell Max's explosion, that basically destroys the rest of the base. Thankfully Hedo's barely able to make it out alive, and while he didn't get to upgrade the Gammas, he was able to take them too. And they escape pretty much unnoticed, terrified of what just happened. With Red Pharmaceuticals also being toppled now. But following this display of power, somebody else was watching. Whis was actually showing everyone through his staff. Goku, Vegeta, and Raditz were training there off planet. And even from all the way over there, they could sense this going on. And now they want a demonstration of that power for themselves with them being summoned to Beerus' planet. They honestly don't know why they're here right now, but Goten's pretty excited when he hears that they're about to fight everybody. Honestly, Gohan's not really too sure about this, but it's gonna be fine here. They don't have to worry about any collateral damage and they could finally go all out. Goten tries to convince him too. They finally have a chance to do this. They've been waiting for so long. Plus, after that battle with Cell Max, it leaves kind of an emptiness within them. Doesn't Gohan want to fight too? Well, yeah, Goten's able to convince him and then he goes for it. But who exactly are they gonna be fighting? First, it's gonna be a 2v3 against Goku, Vegeta, and Raditz, and Raditz tells them to not hold anything back because they're definitely not. This is also an opportunity for them to show off their full power. By now they haven't gotten any new forms or anything, but Vegeta and Raditz have gotten a better control over Ultra Ego, improving the power, effectiveness, and stamina of it. As for Goku, he's actually completed Ultra Instinct by now, so this will be a good test for him too. Piccolo came along too, but he's not going to get involved in the fight. He already knows what Gohan and Goten's power is like, and this is for the Saiyans to test that strength. But he's pretty confident that they'll win here. A 3v2 begins, and pretty much immediately they could tell, this isn't really going to be fair. Not because they outnumber Gohan and Goten, but because Gohan and Goten overpower them. Right now they're only fighting their beast forms, and doing pretty well in fact. But the three other Saiyans want to see their full power. How could they force that out? And Vegeta has the perfect idea. He has been contemplating this for a while, and since he never got to do it, he felt a little bit left out. Although this time, he's going to have to leave Raditz out of it. Raditz has no clue what he's talking about, but he doesn't like it because of the fact he's going to be left out. And Vegeta's referring to fusion. Goku would agree to that, but they don't have Patara on hand. Oh, those things? We says that won't be a problem to get. Holding out a hand in front of him, 
generating two Patara out of thin air. And you know what? He even makes another pair, giving it to Gohan and Goten. Although they decide they're going to fight unfused first. Raditz guesses he's going to set this one out because he's not going to fight alongside a fusion. He knows he's going to be outpaced by everybody there. And he already had the chance to fuse with Kakarot. This will be fun to spectate though. And after all this time, Vegeta finally gets to fuse with someone. Finally being able to quell his curiosity. And the results are pretty interesting. A new fusion's born, naming himself Vegeta. The fusion of Vegeta and Kakarot. He asks the other two if they're really sure they don't want to fuse because he's not going to hold back here. Gohan and Goten say they're going to wait a bit. That's fine then. Vegito powers up to his maximum strength. Although, it's a bit strange. He tries to use Ultra Instinct and Ultra Ego, but he can't use the two of them together. They don't really work in harmony because they are pretty much polar opposites. So, he decides to start out with Ultra Ego. He can at least swap between the two of them, but just not use them together. Although, another idea he has is using Ultra Instinct with the power of Akai's. It might be a bit tough to do, but it would be easier than trying to combine the two forms. Gohan and Goten respond by showing off their full strength, with Vegito glad to finally be able to see this form. Raditz is stunned as well. He knew they had this power locked away. Ever since he saw them as kids, he knew they had insane potential like this. But this is beyond expectations, and he's saying this as a god right now. Piccolo's not too surprised because he was the one to help them train for this. During the fight, Vegito constantly swaps forms. Although Gohan and Goten are actually able to counter it pretty well. But Vegito could tell they're still holding back. So they show off more strength, but Vegito says that's not it. He doesn't care about their full power right now. He wants to see them fused. That'll be really fun. If they showcase their full strength right now as is, they'd be able to defeat Vegito. But he wants them to fuse too. Vegito knows he'll probably lose against that fusion, but it's going to be fun at least. They rarely get the opportunity for this, and it'll be a nice show for Beerus. Beerus is pretty entertained too, seeing these three fighting and realizing how far above him they are. But he votes for it too. He tells the two twins to just go ahead and fuse. He says by now the two of them should have picked up on trace amounts of godly key at least, but they don't even use it. They never even thought about using it. And in their final forms, it doesn't seem like they're using it either. He wonders how far pure mortal strength can truly go, since they don't rely on that godly key at all. And the fusion between them will be the true epitome of that power. So, they put on the Batara earrings, and once more, Han Ten makes his return. Wondering what the form will look like for him when he transforms. Although, it looks pretty similar to what Goten had. Although, there's a slightly different tint to his eyes, and he has a tail, of course. So this is basically his own unique primal form. Vegito looks on amazed, and slightly terrified. He's even trembling. To think that he's trembling of all people. Vegito, the warrior who's stronger than any of the gods of destruction. Even the two fusees that make him up. They're two of the strongest people in existence. But him especially, the fusion of those two, the one using Ultra Instinct and Ultra Ego. He's trembling at the sight of this mortal. This is going to be a ton of fun. But as you'd probably expect, Vegito doesn't really get an opportunity to fight. The two go in for a clash. And Hanten kind of has to hold back here as to not kill everyone around them. Because even the shockwave might be too powerful for that. But there's a powerful explosion as the two of them clash. With Vegito landing a punch in Ultra Instinct, with a fist in case and destructive energy. It hits Hanten directly in the face, but he's completely unfazed. But Hanten's fist connects with Vegito's face. And with this one punch, he's knocked unconscious and unfused. With Goku and Vegeta falling to the ground, as Hanten looks below smiling. You know, despite nobody being his equal, it still was worth trying out and was pretty fun. He looks over to Piccolo and Raditz who basically have their jaws on the floor. Same for Beerus too. That really was something. Goku and Vegeta regain consciousness. Vegeta's glad that he actually got to fuse, and they got to use that fusion's abilities. And even though they lost the fight, he kind of expected that. He wanted to really see the abilities of these hybrid Saiyans. And that was the best way to do so. Goku especially can't believe it because these two are his sons after all. Here he was training with Ultra Instinct, all these godly forms. And of course, Goku's powers and abilities are amazing. He loves Ultra Instinct and loves using it. But to think these two would be able to do that without any godly forms at all, it's truly special. Ever since he first started training these two, he knew they had potential like this, but to think they're at this level, to think Goku still struggles catching up with them, he's proud of them and proud of that display of their strength. But he promises them, he will catch up to them one day. And he hopes they keep working on that power. They worked hard for it, and they should work hard to maintain it too. And they agree. They couldn't have gotten this far without their great teachers in life, with two of them, Piccolo and Raditz, watching right there, and their most important and prominent teacher right in front of them, Goku. But even more important than Goku, the main driving force behind their strength is each other. Even with the great teachers around them, they wouldn't have made it this far without each other. And not just in terms of physical strength and training, but in terms of their mentality too. The two brothers keep pushing each other to go further. If Gohan wasn't around Goten as a kid, or vice versa, the two of them don't know where they would have been. Sure, they probably would have been strong, but not on this level. And not just that either. With all the hardships they went through together, who knows how far they would have made it without each other. And that's the true reason behind their strength, their brotherhood. In a way, Goku can kind of relate because of Raditz. And although Goku never really thinks about it, Raditz still does kind of wonder how Bardock would react seeing them today, especially his grandsons. And these two definitely did live up to Vegeta's expectations. He always did theorize that hybrids would be like this. But who knows where they'll go from here in terms of strength. And with that explosive battle, that will be the conclusion to this series. 
So what did you guys think about the series as a whole, especially in comparison to the original? I'd love to see your guys' thoughts below. Personally, I'm very glad I got to redo this one, not just because of the improved video quality, but because I got to tell a new story here. As usual, be sure to drop a like and subscribe if you haven't already. It really does help out the channel and shows me you want to see more like this. Anyways, thank you all for watching, thanks for supporting the scenario all the way through, and I'll see you all in my next video.